Welcome to the 14th Annual Retina Symposium. I'm Jennifer Lim, the Marion Schenck Chair in Ophthalmology, Vice Chair for Diversity and Inclusion, and the Director of the Retina Service. And it's really wonderful that you can join us today for our program, Improving Clinical Outcomes. I want to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Morton Goldberg, and our class lecturer, Dr. Paul Sternberg. They are truly giants in our field, and I'm so delighted that they're with us today. I will be introducing each of them later this morning, and you'll be hearing from them personally. During this COVID-19 pandemic, I'm thankful that technology enables us to gather virtually. Who would have thought a year ago that the 14th Retina Symposium would again be virtual just like last year's meeting? I believe, however, that despite all the tribulations of the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the positive outcomes that has emerged is our deeper appreciation of family, colleagues, and friends such as all of you. During this time, the plethora of ophthalmic virtual meetings, the numerous online webinars and educational events are truly a testament to our thirst for knowledge as ophthalmologists and our need to share discoveries with one another. So my hope is that this Retina Symposium will convey new discoveries, new ideas, and new techniques that will help you in your care of retina patients today. So again, welcome, Dr. Goldberg. Welcome, Dr. Sternberg. I'd like to also welcome my invited guest speakers, Dr. Andrioli, Dr. Fauzi, Dr. Gill, Dr. Hong, Dr. Jampol, Dr. Sternberg, and Dr. Wahid. I'd also like to recognize my USC faculty speakers as shown on this slide. This course would not be possible without all of your input, sharing your expertise and your knowledge with us today, and I'm truly grateful. Please use the chat feature today to ask questions during the meeting. And also remember to complete the CME survey at the end of the meeting in order to get CME credit. You have 15 days to request your CME credit and more information can be found um, in the email that was sent yesterday. So now I, it is my true and wonderful honor to get to introduce Dr. Morton Goldberg as the inaugural UIC Symposium Guest of Honor. These are my disclosures, because we have to have disclosures for every talk, and they are that I'm a former resident, a very grateful resident, a former fellow, again, a very grateful fellow, and part of the numerous MFG fan club. So this one's for you, Mort. This will be sent to you. It's a crystal award inaugurating the you as the guest of honor of the University of Illinois Symposium. And this is being given to you in recognition of your exemplary scientific clinical, educational, and leadership contributions to the study and treatment of retinal diseases. And I will be uh, sharing uh, some slides in a few minutes, but first I just wanted to say a few things without the use of slides. So this uh, award really honors Mort's steadfast commitment to his mentorship of medical students, residents, fellows, and faculty. He is a Cheris member, not only of our retina community, but also the larger encompassing ophthalmology community, many of whom were trained or mentored by Mort. And a lot of you today are probably his mentees also. All who know Mort or know of him hold him in greatest esteem. He is a true gentleman, a true scholar, and so vested in the careers of his mentees and his faculty. Dr. Goldberg has a unique blend of intellect, humility, and compassion. He is a caring, compassionate, and committed physician as well as mentor. And he's played a pivotal role in the education of so many of our ophthalmologists and ophthalmology leaders today, including ophthalmology department heads, current and former presidents of the academy, leaders of the Retina Society, Macla Society, and the ASRS, to name a few. His impact is felt daily by all of us. Throughout the world, retina specialists apply the knowledge gleaned from the Early House Diabetic Retinopathy Symposium in the DRS, as well as use his classification scheme for sickle cell retinopathy. Genetics and pediatric specialists utilize the knowledge gleaned from his research on incontinential pigmenti, fever, now known as PFV, and adverb to name a few. At UIC, Dr. Goldberg holds a very special place in all of our hearts. He served as an ophthalmology department head for 19 years, during which he recruited a world-class faculty and established a world-class department and many of his faculty are on the call today. He also built the Leary Eye Institute. And as a resident during the Goldberg years, I finally remember how all residents strive to do their best 
and to earn Dr. Goldberg's approval. We called him Mort behind his back, but with affection. He sharpened our <clears throat> diagnostic abilities and critical thinking skills at professor's rounds, weekly grand rounds, and on our retina rotation with him. I remember how Dr. Goldberg would actually carefully examine a patient's fundus and then compare his observations with my retinal drawing, which was laid down on the patient's chest. Imagine how I felt as a resident at that time. So Dr. Goldberg inspired me as well as many others to become retina specialists, and we are most grateful. His grand rounds were dubbed locally as a Super Bowl of grand rounds by the local ophthalmologists. He shared his insight and his encyclopedic knowledge with all of us with true humility and a true fervor for teaching. He used the Socratic method in a meaningful fashion that, learned to, that led to true learning. During residency, Mort and Myrna opened their home both in Chicago and in Baltimore. And I was fortunate to be a resident and then a fellow with Mort as my chairman, both in residency and fellowship. I was therefore fortunate to get to know Myrna who is a true gem and the first lady of ophthalmology. I would like now to share some more information specifically about his career. So Dr. Morton Goldberg, <clears throat> outstanding clinician, preeminent researcher, caring mentor, friend, effective leader and educator, sage administrator. He is also a role model in his personal life as a husband to Myrna, who has a master's in social work, and as a father to Matthew Goldberg, a lawyer, and Dr. Michael Goldberg, who also has an MPH. Dr. Goldberg's education pedigree is outstanding. As expected, Harvard College, magna cum laude, Phi Beta Kappa, and AB Biology. He also earned the Detour Prize. Not sure what that was, but it must be good, as well as was a senior 16. He then went to Harvard Medical School where he received his MD cum laude, he was a layman fellow and also was part of AOA and the senior 10. Following this, he served an internship at Peter Brent Brigham Hospital, followed by Wilmer Ophthalmology Residency. He was the chief resident, no surprise, at the Wilmer Ophthalmological Institute and also at the Yale New Haven Hospital. He then served in the US public health as a Lieutenant Commander and Assistant Surgeon between 1968 and 1969. He then did a medical genetics fellowship with Dr. Victor McCusick, who is one of the fathers of genetics. Following this, and as an assistant clinical professor at Yale, he became the professor and head of ophthalmology at University of Illinois at the Ion Ear Infirmary in 1970. And we at the infirmary are truly grateful, Mort, that you came to our institution. Following this, he was recruited away, much to my chagrin, as I was going to be a third year resident, and became the director of ophthalmology at the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Eye Institute, where he became the William Holland Wilmer Professor of Ophthalmology and the ophthalmologist in chief. And I was fortunate to do my fellowship, so I again had Mort as my chairman. He is currently the Emeritus Director of the Wilmer Institute and the Joseph E. Green Professor of Ophthalmology. Mort's landmark research centers about the sickle cell retinopathy classification and clinical trials, diabetic retinopathy, including convening the Airly House meeting as well as the DRS. He also did seminal work in incontinentia pigmenti, fever, trauma, hyphema, surgery. I could go on and on. Just reviewing his CV tired me out. I mean, there's so many things. It's hard to decide what to include. He had numerous NEI grants as shown here training grants that helped build the infirmary, the diabetic retinopathy study that formed the seminal information for the treatment of diabetic retinopathy diseases, the sickle cell comprehensive center grants that also led to information about how to treat sickle cell retinopathy. Overall, however, throughout his entire career, Dr. Goldberg has been a steadfast mentor. He has mentored medical students, residents, fellows, and faculty at UIC, as well as at Johns Hopkins. He has over 590 peer reviewed papers and 10 books with mentees and colleagues. He's an admired mentor. Witness here, The Many Faces of Mort, which was put together by Kirk Paco as the host of ceremonies when he finished uh, his chairmanship at U of I and he was given a wonderful party at the time. At that time, original kids poems and original songs were actually dedicated to Mort. No surprise then that at the end of his term as chairman at Hopkins, he received this wonderful attribute to Mort and parties and tributes 
from many people at Hopkins are included in this beautiful volume that Mort shared with me. He was also a recipient of the Golden Apple Teaching Award. And this is a picture from when Dr. Goldberg was chairman at U of I many decades ago with some of my fellow residents. Dr. Goldberg is an esteemed lecturer. He has given over 48 named lectures throughout the world. And I would have wanted him to be one of our class lecturers many years ago, but at that time, Mort said he no longer traveled to give named lectures. So we're honoring you today, Mort, and getting you back by giving you the Guest of Honor Award. Uh, amongst his named lectures are the Ven Kataswami Endowment Lecture in Madurai, India, the Helen Keller Inaugural Lecture by the American Society of Ocular Trauma Specialists, the Kronfeld Lecture at U of I, the William Holland Wilmer Memorial Lecture at Hopkins, the Jackson Lecture at the Academy, the Krill and Gifford Lectures of the Chicago Ophthalmology Society. His leadership is legend. Here in Chicago, he built the Leary Building and here he is shaking hands with the Lions people, establishing the Lions of Illinois Eye Research Institute. And we at the Retina Service are grateful more as well as the researchers who use this building every single day at work. He also built the Johns Hopkins University Zanville Krieger Center and shown here is a picture of him presenting at the dedication of the Zanville Krieger Children's Eye Center in 1998. His leadership is legend. He has been president of ARVO, AUPO, Macula Society, COS, and UIC executive committees. And you can see him here with one of our presidents of the United States along with his lovely wife, Myrna. He has also been a trustee or board member of numerous organizations, FFB, FFS, and the American Diabetes Association. He's chaired numerous committees of the Academy, Arvo, Hopkins, and UIC. He also was the former editor-in-chief of the Archives of Ophthalmology. And here's his picture from when he was the inaugural editor of the archives. This is now, as you know, JAMA Ophthalmology. And as residents, we used to get brown envelopes, and inside we would find articles for us to review. So remember those days? And many of us used to look up Mort, I don't know if you knew this, we would look up every single reference because we knew that that's what Mort expected of us. He's received these numerous honors from multiple leaders in our field. Mark Cho, Tom Deutsch, Lee Jampol, Kirk Paco, Tom Deutsch again, and Theodore Zeckman. Uh, these are from an excerpt from a monograph that was put together to honor Mort when he finished his uh, tenure at UIC. And then these are pages excerpted from the tribute to Mort. And I wish we had time to read this beautiful tribute by Marco Zarbin, who is one of the chief residents and who is the chief editor of a tribute to Mort, really uh, listing down all of his accomplishments and dedicated um, to him. Again, some excerpts here defining the work that Dr. Goldberg did in terms of teaching and the highlight of the week, the Super Bowl of Grand Rounds. Along with his numerous awards include the inaugural Ida Mann Medal from Oxford University, the Arnold Patz Medal, and here he is with Dr. Arnold Patz, one of his chairmen before, uh, when he received the Patz Medal. He also received the Michelson Medal, which is a huge honor. The Gertrude Pyron Award for Outstanding Achievement in Retina Research from the ASRS, another huge award. The Lucien Howe Medal from the American Ophthalmological Society, or quote, the Honor Society, the AOS. And he is known as one of the living Johns Hopkins Mission honorees as well. He's a member of the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. And Ophthalmology Times actually named him one of the 10 greatest living ophthalmologists in 1999. And I do remember being at a meeting with you, Mort, and someone referred to this. And in your humble manner, you just said, oh, it's just some, some funny thing they gave me because I'm still alive. I had no idea what it truly was, so now I know. Um, also, he was the Mildred Weisenfeld Awardee in 2000. He was one of the outstanding scientists of the 21st century, named in 2000. International Scientist of the Year, 2002. Inaugural inductee from his high school, the Amesbury Educational Foundation Hall of Fame. And he also, for all of his philanthropy work, was given for the Love of Sight Award by the Foundation for Fighting Blindness. He is also the inaugural Roman Barnes Awardee from the National Medical Association Ophthalmology Section. And foremost, of course, is his endowed honors. He has been given an endowed professorship in ophthalmology from Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, an endowed lectureship 
by the University of Illinois on your infirmary, that's UIC, and also an endowed professorship established here also at University of Illinois and numerous honorary titles. Mort's favorite phrase is prior proper preparation prevents poor performance. So I hope today, Mort, that you will be pleased with the presentations that people have put together. And I know that you will be commenting on, on several of the presentations today. Dr. Goldberg, as I said, above all, is a wonderful husband to Myrna and a wonderful father to his two sons, Michael Goldberg, MD, MPH, Director of Neuroradiology for Allegheny Health Network and Associate Professor of Radiology at Drexel University School of Medicine. And Matthew Goldberg, a lawyer, who is the Chief Compliance Officer for ISO New England and regulates the electrical energy for all six New England states. So it's really amazing that you, Mort and Myrna have done such a wonderful job, no surprise to us of all, of, for raising such accomplished, and wonderful men and their families. Many of you probably also know that Berna has a master's in social work, but she's also very active. She's a board of advisors at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, and she's part of Baltimore Women's Giving Circle, and also a docent at the Baltimore Museum of Art. And Myrna has a message for all of us and for you as well, Mort. She thanks us for inviting her to send this message and says, first, congratulations to Mort for being the inaugural guest of honor and to Paul Sternberg for being the guest speaker. Quote, I know that being the inaugural guest of honor is an honor that delights Mort. The Ironer Infirmary was his adored home from January 1970 until June 1989. I too only have the warmest memories in spite of the often frigid temperatures of the faculty, the residents and the staff. Congratulations to you, Jenny on your stellar academic career, care of patients, and being director of the UIC Retina Symposium and of the Retina Division. Lastly, my fondest and special wishes to all the wonderful residents and faculty that I came to know and admire during our UIC years. As always, warm hugs, Myrna. Myrna, warm hugs to you as well from all of us. And so Mort, congratulations for being the inaugural guest of honor of the U of I UIC institution. I can think of no other person that I would want to bestow this honor upon but you. Thank you again for all your exemplary scientific, clinical, educational, and leadership contributions and mentorship for all of us. We are truly grateful. So <clears throat> I know Dr. Goldberg wanted to say a few words, so it, the floor is yours, Maura. Well, Jenny, I hardly know what to say. Uh, it was such an extraordinary introduction. Um, you were very kind, I think overly kind to me, uh, but thank you very much. And um, I confess that I really enjoyed listening to you. So thank you for doing that. <laughs> you deserve the, um, it. Yeah. I think the spotlight really shines on you, Jenny, uh, because I remember you at all stages of your academic education when you were really a brilliant medical student from Northwestern coming to the infirmary for a rotation. And then as a resident in the infirmary, a, a fellow at Hopkins at the Wilmer Institute, and then climbing the academic ladder to, ladder to extraordinary heights, culminating as the Marion Schenck Endowed Professor at the University of Illinois. What a tremendous honor that is. And most recently, Jenny, I had the privilege of introducing you and listening to your Paul Henkind Memorial Lecture at the annual meeting of the Macula Society. That's the most distinguished award the Macula Society uh, offers and it was brilliantly done. So um, thank you so much for all of that and congratulations on this, your 14th annual retinal symposium. What an achievement that is. Anyway, I, I do thank you for making this event possible. It, it's an overwhelming experience and I can't get over your, your introduction. I actually do feel very, very fortunate, very happy to be back at my academic home, my first academic home, the U of I and the I near infirmary. It was a very invigorating and very stimulating academic home for close to 20 years, a little over 19 years. I had this wonderful opportunity that you, you described in part 
uh, to uh, become the first uh, full-time faculty member at the University of Illinois and its Department of Ophthalmology. And then the extraordinary opportunity of appointing 100% of all the future full-time academic uh, uh, faculty members at the U of I in ophthalmology. It was a, an extraordinary time, a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, I also had the pleasure of working with Jerry Fishman and appointing the residents for an extraordinary group. And just to give you a personal anecdote of how the residency program evolved, at the time there was no match and uh, Dr. Fishman and I decided we would enter and win the competition for attracting the best residents in the country. And we worked very hard at it. Some, some people, other chairmen, for example, said we worked too hard at it. We were thought to be a bit, just a teensy weensy bit, overly aggressive at ferreting out the best candidates for residency and then negotiating rather stringently with them. Uh, in fact, uh, we were so successful uh, in all honesty that the other chairman in ophthalmology decided to create a computer matching program, which lasts to this very day. I'm not sure if there's a cause and effect relationship uh, between Jerry and I and the end of the free for all. But if so, uh, I plead guilty as charged because I was very proud of the house staff within a very few years all of the departments of ophthalmology in Chicago were chaired by alumni of the infirmary and several people around the country too. And they've had extraordinary careers and were, were remarkable people. But it was, was not all peaches and cream, uh, to tell you the truth. Um, although we were very eager to create new therapeutic avenues at the infirmary and the faculty was tremendous. They're very innovative and uh, very productive and also very collegial at the time. There was a great esprit de corps, but one of the clinical advances in 1970 and 71 was the invention by Dr. Payman of Pars-Planar Vitrectomy. He published his pars instrument, <clears throat> the Vitrophage, within a month of Bob Markerman's publication in Miami. So he really is a co-father of uh, vitrectomy, but, but there were problems. Initially, we didn't even have an operating microscope. And when we finally got one, it wasn't motorized, if you can believe all this. And there was no uh, intraocular illumination. And we used the coaxial light of the uh, slit lamp with a manually moved operating microscope. Well, as you can imagine, in, in a revolutionary technique like that, the first uh, half dozen or so cases were not successful. They were, they were pretty awful, as a matter of fact. So here's what's happened with a very well-read residents and very ethical residents who decided we were doing unethical things by doing surgical vitrectomy. And they came to me with textbooks in their hands that clearly said touching the vitreous was not only bad, it was unethical. And therefore, Dr. Goldberg, and they came as a group over 30 people, yet I think they're afraid to come alone. They said, therefore, Dr. Goldberg, we will no longer scrub with you and Dr. Payment in the operating room. Think of that. I said, you know, I'm not in the business of legislating ethics and you have to do what you have to do. So we kept working away within four or five months. The results were truly revolutionary. There was spectacular and chronic diabetic pictures hemorrhage cases, for example, went from hand motions and light perception literally to 2020 or 2030. And to their credit, the residents came back as a group, once again, and en masse uh, said, uh, okay, uh, we want to stay here for an extra year and do a vitrectomy fellowship. Wow. So the worm turned, but it was, uh, it was touch and go and a very difficult moment at the time. Anyway, what made the enterprise at the infirmary so gratifying for those two decades was that uh, there was a remarkable degree of collegiality, and camaraderie, and a great esprit de corps. Nothing, nothing seemed impossible. We were all young and enthusiastic, and uh, everything seemed possible. So seemingly, month after month, year after year, new ideas were pouring out. The publications went from zero to 125 to 150 per year annually. 
and the fact it became famous, uh, deservedly so. I'm happy to see uh, people like uh, Jerry Fishman and Lee Jampol and Motilal and Ray Chan and, lots of, and Basil Morgan, lots of other people who were colleagues of mine or residents uh, of ours at, the, at that time. Uh, the clinical environment was uh, superb and the numbers of patients uh, became uh, extraordinary. So um, those two decades were indeed uh, among the most enjoyable and invigorating of my entire professional life. And consequently, I've always maintained a very large, very warm spot in my heart for the great U of I and the Illinois Eye Infirmary. And um, it's a great department. I want to thank you and congratulate you and your colleagues in the division, Bill and others. And I want to thank Paul Chan for being so welcoming to me and doing such a great job as uh, chairman of the department and setting high standards uh, that everyone is maintaining and enhancing. But let's put the emphasis back where it belongs, namely in you, Jenny. And um, I want to congratulate you for 14 consecutive years in choosing up to the minute important topics uh, for this symposium and for choosing the world's experts in their respective areas of interest. So uh, this is uh, uh, a remarkably productive and stimulating environment. And um, I want to move right along with, if it's okay with you, Jenny, you've read enough about me and from me. And let's start with your first presentation on uh, geographic atrophy, uh, if uh, that's okay with you. And I'll conclude with the words of a famous uh, Illinois lion, the head of Illinois lionism. And uh, there's a professorship in his honor at the U of I Department of Ophthalmology. I'm referring to Mr. Charles Young, who always told us at the close of any talk, he always said, thanks a million and a million thanks. And that's my parting comment to you, Jenny. Thank you very much. Well, you are welcome where a million and a million welcomes. So without further ado, we'll go on. Thank you so much for sharing with us today and congrats again, we are truly grateful. Good morning. It's my pleasure to present this talk on what's new in geographic atrophy. These are my financial disclosures. Geographic atrophy represents the advanced form of non-neovascular AMD and is characterized by the loss of RPE, photoreceptors, and choriocapillaris. The prevalence of GA increases exponentially with age, actually quadrupling per decade beyond age 70. As the chart from Rodnicka et al. shows, the prevalence rises from 0.7% at age 70 to 11% by age 90. This is true worldwide, and the causes for geographic atrophy are multifactorial and include genetic susceptibility, oxidative stress, and environmental factors. It is believed that complement deposition and loss of complement regulation play a large role in the etiology of geographic atrophy and are therefore common targets of emerging therapies. Early on in geographic atrophy, visual acuity is normal, but functional loss is already present. And this is characterized by the presence of dense parafoveal scotomas, delayed dark adaptation, reduced contrast sensitivity, and a decrease in reading rate. In later stages of geographic atrophy, there is definitely decreased visual acuity, severe functional visual loss, and unfortunately, these findings are often bilateral. Increased levels of complement C3, C3A, CFB, and CFD are seen. <laughs> geographic atrophy is best documented not by color photographs, but rather by fundus autofluorescence and OCT. OCTA has also been recently used as shown on this slide. Fundus autofluorescence is absent in the areas of geographic atrophy and abnormalities precede the presence of visible <clears throat> geographic atrophy as shown on this example. You see the abnormal area of autofluorescence in 2001, and then the definite formation of the geographic atrophy with loss of autofluorescence by 2004. Unfortunately, there are no approved treatments for geographic atrophy. There have been prior ineffective treatments, which include visual cycle modulation, and drugs that inhibit complement, including lampolizumab targeting CFD and echolizumab targeting C5. More recently, some of the complement studies have shown effectivity, 
but with the risk of increased choroidal neovascularization. APL2, or peg cetacoplin, is a synthetic cyclic peptide conjugated to a peg that specifically binds to C3 and C3B, thus blocking all three pathways of complement activation. In the Philly Phase II study, patients are randomized to receive APL2 monthly or every other month versus sham. The primary endpoint was the change in geographic atrophy size by autofluorescence by month 12. In treatment was given every month for 12 months, followed by six months off therapy. During the six months without treatment, the previously treated eyes grew at a rate similar to the sham group. Thus, at 12 months, the reduction in geographic atrophy growth for treated compared to sham for the monthly treated eyes was 29%, and decreased to 12% at 18 months. For the patients treated every other month, the reduction in GA growth compared to sham was 20%, and this decreased to 9% by month 18. Adverse events, however, were more CNV in the APL2 treated eyes. APL2 is being further studied in the phase three Derby and Oaks trials, which are currently ongoing. These trials enroll patients into either monthly or every other month treatment versus sham for 24 months with a subsequent six month follow-up period on no treatment. Avastin captid pegol or Zymora is a selective aptamer that binds C5. It thus blocks the generation of C5A and therefore the activation of inflammasomes and also blocks C5B and therefore blocks the MAC attack complex formation. In the GATHER1 study, patients with non-foveal geographic atrophy were enrolled and received either monthly avastin captive pegol 1 mg, 2 mg, or 4 mg versus sham for 18 months. GATHER1 found a 27 to 28% rate reduction in GA growth for the 2 and 4 mg groups as compared to sham at month 6 and 12. At month 18, this difference was 30%. However, there was an increased rate of chordal neovascularization seen in the treated eyes compared to fellow eyes. The rates of CNV were 9 to 9.6% in the 2 and 4 milligram groups compared to 3.5% for the fellow eyes. Currently, the GATHER2 Phase 3 study is ongoing. In this study, patients are randomized to receive avastin captid pegol 2 mg versus sham. And this is a 12 month study of monthly treatment after which the monthly treated vastin captured pegol eyes are randomized to continue monthly or given every other month treatments. The final endpoint will be at two years. There are multiple other experimental treatments for geographic atrophy, and these include intravitreal injections as well as surgical treatments such as stem cell therapy. NGM621 is a monoclonal antibody to complement C3. This is being studied in the ongoing phase two Catalina study for geographic atrophy. Patients are treated every four or every eight weeks compared to sham, and the primary outcome is a change from baseline and the square root of geographic atrophy lesion at week 48, as measured by fundus autofluorescence. FHTR2163 is an antigen binding fragment of antibody to high temperature requirement A1 protein. HTRA1 is expressed in RPE cells. It induces disruption of Bruch's membrane and dilation of chordal blood vessels. It is seen to be increased in the perilesional area of geographic atrophy. FHTR2163 is being studied in patients with geographic atrophy without prior chordal neovascularization. In these eyes, the change from baseline as measured by fundus autofluorescence is the endpoint at week 72. Patients are randomized to receive FHTR2163 monthly or every eight weeks as compared to sham controls. Elemepratide is a mitochondrially target tetrapeptide that reduces the production of reactive oxygen species and stabilizes cardiolipin. Cardiolipin is believed to be involved in dysregulation of the electron transport chain, which therefore leads to more damage from reactive oxygen species. In the reclaim phase two study, patients are given ilimepratide 
compared to sham via self-injected subcutaneous injection to the abdomen. Patients with non-central geographic atrophy are being enrolled into this study. One should expect eosinophilia in patients within three to four weeks of receiving this drug, and this usually subsides after stopping treatment within four weeks. Stem cell therapies in phase one and phase two studies are also being tried for geographic atrophy, and these include stem cells derived either from embryonic or from adult stem cells. These can also be either autologous stem cell derived or donor derived. I will highlight the RPE patch, which is using induced pluripotent stem cells, which are derived from a patient's peripheral blood and then turned into RPE cells. These cells are then grown on a biodegradable polymer scaffold. The scaffold is then surgically implanted under the retina into the transition zone of the geographic atrophy in which the photoreceptors are believed to still be viable. The PLGA scaffold then dissolves as the RP cells create their own matrix, and this allows the photoreceptors to integrate into the RPE. This is being studied at the NEI in a phase one study. Adult RPE stem cells derived from donor eyes are also being studied in a phase one NEI study. In this study, the fresh cells are grown from culture and are cultivated until they are about four weeks old and then implanted into the patient. There is no risk of tumorigenicity, although immunosuppression is required. So what can we do to lower the risk of GA progression in 2021 in our patients? Well, we should educate our patients about the risk factors for AMD in general, recommend the ARED supplements, and now there is new information regarding the benefit of a Mediterranean diet, especially in patients with geographic atrophy. The AREDS 1 and 2 data of 13,204 eyes were recently reviewed in a 10-year follow-up study. A food frequency questionnaire was used to determine adherence to a Mediterranean diet. An alternative Mediterranean diet index or a MEDI index was calculated and compared amongst the groups. Patients who had a higher AMEDI score were associated with decreased risk of progression to late AMD and to large drusen. The hazard ratio difference, however, was greater and more highly significant for eyes with geographic atrophy than for neovascular AMD, and FISH showed a particularly strong association. The recommendation is to decrease red meat and alcohol and to increase the intake of fish, vegetables, whole fruit, whole grains, nuts, legumes, and good fats as listed here. In terms of visual rehabilitation for our patients who have already lost visual acuity from geographic atrophy, we should continue to recommend good low vision evaluation with the use of magnifiers, scanners, and closed circuit TVs as needed. The implantable miniature telescope has been FDA approved since 2010 and allows for enlargement of the central visual field image. In the studies that have been done, visual acuity improvements of three or more lines were seen in 67% of treated eyes compared to 13% of control eyes. The mean improvement in implanted eyes was 3.5 lines versus 0.8 lines in controls. And these results held true for eyes with severe GA as well as for neovascular AMD. An adverse event, however, is the development of endothelial cell loss of approximately 25% in implanted eyes. A recently developed low vision device for patients with severe visual loss is the Oculens AR system, which uses augmented reality. This system first maps the scotomas in a patient's field of vision. It then shifts the images to areas outside of the scotoma so that they become visible to the wearer. After some adaptation, the patient's brain is then tricked into ignoring the scotoma entirely. In summary, for your patients with geographic atrophy, obtain a fundus autofluorescence at baseline as well as an OCT. Recommend the use of AREDS vitamins and strongly recommend adherence to a Mediterranean diet, especially the intake of fish. Also recommend low vision referrals and devices for patients with severe visual loss. Remember to enroll your patients into clinical trials as there are exciting emerging therapies that may be of benefit for patients with geographic atrophy. Thanks for your attention.
Well, Jenny, if I could uh, start a I'd conversation like here you. with uh, members of the audience or other speakers, uh, I'd like to do that. But first, let me point out what a remarkably comprehensive review that was right up to the minute. But there is a fly in the ointment. And uh, Jenny mentioned that uh, the two complement inhibitors, the C3 inhibitor and the C5 inhibitor, both showed signs of choroidal neovascularization uh, during the treatment with the complement inhibitors. And I want to ask uh, Nadia Wahid and uh, Amani Farsi, who are both experts in OCTA, what they make of this. So, uh, are the so called non exudative CNV deleterious or are they nutritive? And what's the prognosis for them? And uh, what do we have to do in looking for them? How good is OCTA in detecting them? Nadia, do you want to begin? Uh, sure, Mort. Really important question. And I think that we're just, um, we're just starting to understand what these non-exudative CNVs or MNVs are, are actually doing. Um, you know, given the data that we have around you know, non-perfusion in the area of the geographic atrophy, but also loss of the choriocapillaris in the area surrounding geographic atrophy and, and more and more data on loss of choriocapillaris and as early on as intermediate AMD. Um, I, I think the thought is that, um, you know, these blood vessels probably develop as a result of the hypoxic response that you get, the ischemic response from the RPE cells and may well be recapitulating um, the blood flow um, and therefore the nutrition to these, um, you know, gasping RPE cells essentially. And I think there's some data that supports that. There's some smaller studies out there that have shown that, um, you know, GA uh, growth rate is, uh, is a little bit slower um, in the areas of CNV um, than it is in areas that don't have these non-exudative CNVs, right? So, um, so I think there's some early emerging data that supports this hypothesis. And of course, um, you know, it would be good to see more data there. Um, I, I do think that it that you know looking for these non-exudative um, MNDs represents an important phenotypic um, uh, subgroup of intermediate AMD because we know that um, you know the risk of, of conversion to exudation in these patients is quite high. Um, you know, uh, Rosenfeld's group has shown that, Geimer's group has shown that, um, and then several other groups I think have, um, have also validated this. Um, so I think it's an important phenotypic differentiation. And it's one of the reasons that I think um, OCD and geography becomes very useful in patients who have, um, you know, this intermediate uh, dry MD, um, you know, and have these low lying pigment epithelial detachments. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, Amani probably has a lot more to say. Amani? I completely agree with Nadia, really, that, that we're just starting to learn about these, uh, you know, subclinical CNVs and, and seeing them in places where we don't expect them and just following those patients. We don't find the risk as high as 26% as, as Rosenfeld found, but it's sort of a range depending on where you catch the patients and their progression. But it's a very interesting phenomenon, and I think there's a lot more to learn about, about these neovascularizations and how they interact with GA and how they, the two can co-survive in an eye and what to do about them in the future. I think it's going to be a very, very complicated and, and exciting area to study. What would you do about them if you were confronted with a patient with non-exudative CNV? So I, I usually just follow them a little bit closer in the beginning. So I bring them back every every month in the beginning to make sure this they're not converting. And then I give them an Amsler grid and educate them. And then I try I start to extend the follow up. I've got one patient who's now three years out from one of these lesions, and he's he's in you know the epi the 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 poster child because he's got areas of GA and areas of non-exudative uh, CNV and they're co-surviving and uh, both are sort of chipping away at each other. It's, it's a fascinating phenomenon, but I have not treated him uh, for three years. Well, my last question for the two of you uh, relates to the value of OCTA and trying to determine where the primary tissue of involvement is in CNV. Is it the choroid or the pigment epithelium? Which comes first? Yeah, this is a this is a great question. I don't I don't know that we have the handle on it yet. I think we need more longitudinal data, like like uh, Nadia is doing and others are doing, looking at the intermediate uh, AMVIs and trying to sort of follow them over time and see who changes first. 
Um, I personally don't have a, a favorite at, in this race, but maybe Nadia has a favorite. I mean, I think, you know, it's sort of a, the, 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 the two cannot survive without each other. So it's hard to figure out who starts. Yeah, my philosophy is follow the data, right? So I think we just need to look at longitudinal data and see where that takes us. Um, you know, and, and um, of course, keep in mind that the technology has its limitations as well, right? So all we're seeing is, is structure on OCD and OCDA, whether that be structure of the vasculature or structure of the, um, of the RPE. And, and there may well be functional deficits that happen a lot sooner than when we start noticing functional, um, then we start noticing structural uh, loss. So, um, you know, I, I think integrating actually some of the functional modalities in there potentially over the long term will also help kind of um, help us distinguish where all of this starts. Well, I may be wrong in this, but I'll predict for the sake of an argument, uh, uh, maybe from Lee Jampol, one of my favorite arguers, uh, that it's the choroid that is where the first disease starts in analogy to what happens with ampi which starts at the quarry, not as the name would suggest, in the pigment epithelium. Lee? Any comments? Yeah, so um, I always start a lecture on AMD by saying that we don't have a clue where the primary tissue is. And it might be the choroid, it might be the pigment epithelium. It might even be the photoreceptors or glial cells in the retina. So uh, I think we await the answer to that important question. And part of the reason why I think a lot of these treatments are failing is that we don't have an understanding of the real primary event in this disease. Yeah, I would agree, Lee, that without a target, you can't have a treatment. And, um, and, and we haven't identified what is the most meaningful target. Our, our success with, with neovascular AMD was we found a target. And, and then it was, you know, no holds barred. But until you find one, uh, we're going to continue to struggle. And, you know, th why, that's why Jenny's talk you know, just had this whole wide array of, of approaches that are, people are making uh, because uh, nothing is really definitive in terms of where we should be focusing our efforts. Actually, I have a quick question for Paul. You know, the um, lamepratide targets reactive oxygen species and mitochondria, and a lot of your research has targeted, you know, reactive oxygen species. Do you have a quick comment with regards to that approach? Well, I, I, I think that, that uh, there is some anticipated benefit. I mean, I think that that's why we think the AREDS treatment has had some effect, but I think that it may be a, a secondary effect and not a primary effect, which is why we've not been more effective in, in uh, targeting uh, ROS for, for various treatments. In other words, if you have uh, damage to the choroid, you're gonna have uh, injury uh, with oxidative stress, and then you can perhaps fighting that will help ameliorate some of the downstream effects, but it may not be addressing the primary problem, which would be uh, changes in choroidal blood flow. So I, I think, again, we're, we, we, we can, you can have some effective treatments by treating down the road impact, but the, but the truly uh, transformational change will be when we, when we find out more, more uh, primary causes of disease. Paul, are you betting any money on the anti-complement agents? I can't yeah. pronounce them, although Jenny can. Yeah, I actually, the question I was going to ask Jenny is where she's putting her money. Um, right now, I, I'm um, keeping my powder dry, as they say. Okay, Jenny, back to you. Okay, well, this has been a really exciting discussion already. Thank you so much, more Nadia, Amani, <clears throat> Lee, and Paul for a scintillating discussion. And we're going to move on now to another area, which I think is going to be have a lot of controversy and discussion, that of myopic degeneration. So I'd like now to introduce Dr. Donnie Hong. So Donnie Hong was one of our former residents um, at U of I. He was a stellar resident. Donnie Hong is now, Dr. Hong, is an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Duke National University of Singapore and a senior consultant in surgical retina at the Singapore National Eye Center, where he established a high myopia clinic. And you know, myopia is a huge problem in Asia right now. In addition, Donnie also runs a lab in ocular imaging at the Singapore Eye Research Institute and holds a joint adjunct appointment at Columbia University, where he was before he went to Singapore. 
He received his undergraduate degree at Northwestern with multiple honors with a triple major in chemistry, biology, and integrated science. He then uh, received his MD and PhD in neuroscience and biophysics from UIC, where he was awarded the top thesis award for life sciences. He was then one of our stellar residents at UIC and received the research awards in 2009 and 2010 during his residency. Uh, currently, uh, he is now in Singapore because he moved there because his wife, who is this amazing economist, uh, had to be in Singapore. So we lost Donnie in this country, but we're fortunate in order to be able to share in his continued research. So without further ado, I'd like now to share Donnie's talk uh, with us on myopic degeneration, latest breakthroughs and management. Donnie Hong. And especially Jenny for the opportunity to speak today on the latest breakthroughs and management in myopic degeneration. Specifically in this talk, I will discuss the current and upcoming clinical treatments for myopic carotid neovascularization, as well as some of the research in my lab where we attempt to preemptively treat staphyloma in degeneratively myopic eyes by identifying localized areas of scleral weakness with imaging and then fortifying the sclera with collagen crosslinking. I always like to show this diagram to patients to help convey to them that myopia is often due to excessive eye elongation, but more importantly, in myopic degeneration or pathologic myopia eyes, the eye is so elongated that the retina, RPE, choroid, and sclera thin, leading to a structural breakdown of the eye wall, allowing for localized bulging or outpouchings called staphyloma. This, of course, is worrisome since some reports state that within 30 years, 5 billion people will have myopia worldwide, with 1 billion having high myopia. For the purposes of this talk, we define high myopia as more than 25 millimeters of axial length and greater than five diopters of myopia. About one in 50 people meet this definition worldwide, but high myopia is much more prevalent in Southeast Asia, where it affects about one in 11 Singaporeans and about one out of five or one out of four college freshmen in Taiwan. Of course, this is worrisome in that high myopia holds a risk of permanent vision loss. For the purposes of this talk, we define degenerative myopia, also termed pathologic myopia, as a long eye, high myopia, with either myopic macular degeneration of diffuse atrophy or worse, which we will define in the next slide, or high myopia with the presence of a staphyloma. The MetaPM classification system is the most commonly used grading system for myopic macular degeneration, with eyes being graded either tessellated, category 1, diffuse atrophy, category 2, Patchy atrophy, category three, which contains well-circumscribed punched out lesions, or macular atrophy, category four, that contains a well-circumscribed lesion that's centered at the fovea, usually centered at either an active or quiescent carotid neovascularization. Plus signs include lacquer cracks, active or quiescent CMV. In pathologic myopia, as you know, there is scleral thinning that leads to a staphylomatous outpouching. Brian Curtin probably has still the most thorough description of staphyloma as he published in the 1970s and 80s. He described about 10 different types, five being primary and five being compound, which vary in both location and configuration. More recently, Rick Spade defined staphyloma more precisely as an outpouching of the eye that has a radius of curvature that is less than the surrounding curvature of the eye wall. Some examples of staphyloma include a peripapillary staphyloma that's centered at the nerve, or macular staphyloma centered around the fovea with the crest along the arcades, or a posterior pole staphyloma, which encompasses both the fovea and the nerve. Staphyloma tend to immediately precede or occur concurrently with myopic macular changes that can either be tractional, such as myopic foveoschisis, dome-shaped macula, or macular holes, or degenerative changes such as geographic atrophy, lacquer cracks, or carotid neovascularization. For these reasons, pathologic myopia is the primary cause of blindness in about 7% of European populations, but for 12 to 27% of Asian populations. In terms of treatment options for the degenerative form of pathologic myopia, the main manifestation is myopic carotid neovascularization. 
This affects about 1 in 10 to 1 in 20 of eyes with pathologic myopia, but with a worse prognosis reported in patients older than 40. Although historically various treatment modalities have been explored, presently anti-VEGF is the first-line therapy. This includes options such as Lucentis, Ilea, off-label Avastin, and more recently, Combercept. Phase two repair and phase three radiance studies provide evidence for the safety and efficacy of Lucentis with greater best corrected visual acuity gains versus initial treatment with PDT. The luminous and brilliant studies provided further support of the efficacy of Lucentis for myopic CNV in a real-life setting using both a visual acuity-based PRN as well as a disease activity-based PRN strategy. ILEA was shown in the phase three mirror study to have greater letter gains in the treatment arm versus the sham arm at both 24 and 48 weeks. Combercept is a novel recombinant fusion protein that has a high affinity for all VEGF isoforms, particularly VEGF A as well as placental growth factors with efficacy and safety comparable to Lucentis over a two-year period. In terms of treatment options for the tractional forms of pathologic myopia, since we know that staphyloma formation tends to precede or occur concurrently with myopic macular degenerative changes, what are the possible treatment options? For the rest of this talk, I'll briefly summarize some work that we've done with scleral collagen crosslinking using both multimodal imaging in an attempt to localize areas of scleral weakness before the formation of staphyloma to allow for preventive treatment as well as the actual cross-linking data itself. As you know, myopia is associated with rapid scleral thinning and tissue loss in both mammalian models and in humans. And specifically, there is remodeling of, of the sclera with a net decrease in scleral collagen, fibril diameter, and greater fiber bundle dissociation. As you are aware, collagen crosslinking strengthens bundles of monomers by forming intermolecular bridges. This is done either through an enzymatic pathway with lysooxidase or via a non-enzymatic pathway, such as via photooxidation with UV light and riboflavin. Scleral collagen crosslinking remains in the experimental stage with no major human trials as of yet, but there is promise in that a blockage of collagen crosslinking results in a greater level of induced myopia as well as an increased scleral thinning in animal models. UV light and riboflavin was shown to be transiently effective in rabbits, but this was technically and ergonomically difficult and subjected the eye to UVA risks, which included both death of keratocytes within the anterior two-thirds of the cornea as well as reduction of the dark adapted ERG amplitudes with apoptotic cells found within the retinal layers, even though the UVA light was applied externally to the sclera. Some work with visible safer wavelengths of light has shown the ability to stunt axial elongation in the vitreous chamber during myopia development. Moreover, cross-linking without the need of light activation using chemicals has also been shown promising. This includes our work that reveals a single injection of our compound can result in a three diopter difference in the treated right eye relative to the untreated left eye in a naturally grown guinea pig, as well as a four diopter difference in response to three weeks of myopia inducement, mainly due to changes in the vitreous chamber elongation. So in summary, scleral collagen crosslinking with visible safe wavelengths of light or with chemicals that do not require light activation avoid the ill effects of UVA light and have the potential to arrest progression to maculopathy in eyes that already have staphyloma, as well as have the potential to arrest myopia in general. In another arm of work, we are using multimodal imaging to localize focal areas of scleral weakness using MRI, using ultrasound, using polarizing spectrum OCT, as well as ophthalmodynametry as coupled with spectral domain OCT in an attempt to identify which highly myopic eyes will remain stable versus those that will go down the path toward pathology by localizing areas of scleral weakness. This will also allow for individualized, directed scleral strengthening therapies in the future. I would of course like to thank my grant funding sources, and more importantly, 
the members of my laboratory, including my postdocs, my medical students, and my technicians, as well as my co-investigators locally in Singapore, as well as my collaborators overseas. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Doc. I would like to thank the organizers, and especially for the opportunity to speak today on the latest Oops. breakthroughs in management in myopic degeneration. Thank you so much, Donnie. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, I'm just curious, when do you think this will be ready for prime time for use in human trials? So um, folks in Tokyo have actually started already, um, again, using um, the light activated versions. Um, I, I, I'm more against that just because of, of the UVA light risks, but um, they're... In Asia, it's just so very different, right? I think I've told you in the past, at Columbia, I spent four years trying to find patients with staphyloma. I found 50. In, in two years, I saw 1,400 in, in Singapore. And it's just so many patients with staphyloma that, especially in Japan and Hong Kong. So the folks in Tokyo who are really the leaders in this started a clinical trial with, I think, Santan, um, again, trying to find Again, getting light to the back of the eye is not so difficult, but uh, I'm more worried about the UVA risks when you apply that to, uh, to such a sensitive and thin area, right? Even, in, even during fellowship, I saw some staphyloma eyes that were so thin that the, uh, the sclera was transparent. So I could actually see the retroorbital fat on the indirect examination. So those eyes, I just, yeah, I really worry about, so. But Great. so for our chemicals, I hope in the next five years. Okay, so there's there's hope on the horizon. And this, yeah, this it's all about safety. <laughs> yeah, it's getting it. Uh, yeah, if if we don't use light activated versions, then if you use just a chemical, you have to make sure it goes where it's supposed to go and doesn't go elsewhere, at, like the nerve or where it uh, where you don't want to be cross cross linked. So, so Jenny, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely, Lee. So I want to ask whether atropine or light exposure have any role in preventing vision loss from myopia. <laughs> um, in a sense, right? Because again, uh, all the studies have shown that the earlier you start down the path of myopia, uh, the, the worse the endpoint will be. Uh, so again, if you start becoming myopic when you're two or three, um, then you end up very, very myopic when you're a teenager. There's one patient that I have who, who was minus 18 diopters when she was four, uh, which is insane. And she's minus 30 diopters now when she's 11. And no family history, none of her parents or siblings are myopic. Uh, and she has no, no syndromic issues, no systemic illnesses that we know of. So something's a little bit odd about that for sure. Um, in terms of um, overall approaches, of course, um, treating kids young, delaying the start of myopia is, is very important. So again, in, in Taiwan, I think they even put it as a law. Uh, in, in, in primary school and grade school, kids have to go outside. Uh, they lock the, the library, they, 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 make the, they take away the phones, the kids have to go out for recess um, during school hours just to get light exposure. So. So yeah, what would so you do for your child, Donnie? Yeah, exactly. So my, my daughter, who's four, I'm minus 11 diopters. My wife's minus 15 diopters. She's growing up in Singapore. Um, so again, we're, we're forcibly making her go outside and play uh, two hours a day. And as soon as she's um, no longer emetropic, I will start low-dose atropine immediately. And one um, last quick question. How about up close? You know, all those iPads, kids playing games yeah. up close. Do you limit that or not? What do people tell yeah. Yes, yeah, so at least for, for at home, I do definitely, right? Because it's just, I think they can use it. It's just, again, good eye hygiene is what everyone proposes. So again, if you're going to use something near close for more than 30 minutes, then take a quick 30 second break and look at something far away just to refocus. Great. Thanks for those tips. We can all apply them in the care of our patients today. Thanks for being with us, Donnie. I know it's uh, later in Singapore, uh, so we will move uh, on now. Thank you once again. So it is my uh, pleasure now to introduce our next speaker uh, who really needs no introduction. Uh, we all uh, know and love Lee Jampol and Dr. Jampol is the Lewis Feinberg Professor of Ophthalmology at Northwestern and adjunct professor at the Medical University of Vienna. So we know Lee has been involved in all the seminal clinical trials in retina. 
He is also very involved in DMC uh, committees, uh, having been part of the MPS DMC, as well as numerous others, the SST, the SCORE, and the DRCR. Uh, he also uh, is now the chair of the diabetic, was the chair of the Diabetic Retinopathy Clinical Research Network until recently, and is still very much involved in the DRCR Retina Network. And so Lee has had multiple leadership uh, positions as the president of the Macula Society, the uh, president of the AOS, trustee and vice president of ARVO, and obviously former chairman of the Department of Ophthalmology at Northwestern University. So Lee has uh, today put together a talk on what is this lesion that I see? We all know that Lee sees so many wonderful, amazing medical retina cases. So I said, why don't you put some together for us and uh, share some of the rarer ones? So without further ado, we will be uh, now seeing Lee's talk on what is this lesion that I see? Good morning, everybody. Jenny asked me to show you a series of interesting cases. They make for very interesting imaging. You may or may not see any of them again. First case is an unusual retinal vessel. 62-year-old female. She knew about this for a long time, but nothing happened until about a year before when the edema in the macula appeared. And her vision at first was 2030. Here's this very extraordinary vessel beginning off the disc, looping around. You see a funny curlicue vessel here. Fluorescein shows filling of the vessel from the right to left. You'll also notice that there's something funny on the disc here. So here's the vessel filling. And here it is draining a little bit and then leaking. That's the problem. There's the vessel on the top here, and there's the edema in the retina. OCTA shows the vessel nicely and some draining little vessels there. We think these are the draining points. Now we can read about these. They were first described by the Krill group many years ago and put into three types. This one really doesn't fit into any of those types clearly. We also have written in the past about complications that can be hemorrhaging from these vessels, exudation, ischemia, neovascularization. So at first we observed the patient and things held for a while, but then it began to get worse with increasing macular edema and the central vision began to drop. And then there was attachment of the macula, as you can see here. So a variety of things were tried, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, steroids, anti-VEGF, and nothing really worked. 5A flibiceps did nothing. So we decided to do something else. And what did we do? Well, right at that spot, I decided to do thermal laser, not the whole lesion, just the, drain, the feeder. And there's the parameters. And shortly thereafter, we noticed a cotton wool spot over the lesion. I didn't treat in that area. I treated by the disc. And the vessel dried up with some fibrosis and some little stringing residual vessels. And amazingly, the vessel was closed on, um, up here, and then the edema disappeared. And here's the OCTA showing some very fine residual vessels, as well as some draining vessels that we can see. We did a field to see what happened, and you can see a scotoma over the lesion, but also a central scotoma localized, probably due to nerve fiber layer damage from my laser. So that's the first case. Second is a maculopathy, and this is an 18-year-old, um, no really past medical history. He was told that he might have Stargardt's disease when he, a few years before. Uh, no vision loss, no night blindness, really. He's healthy otherwise. Normal exam. And here's what he has. You can see these yellow dots scattered around the fovea. Bilateral, symmetric. And amazingly, when you do OCT, you don't see anything. So actually, we think these are probably changes in the RPE, but we're not sure. You can see them on autofluorescence. Uh, fluorescein, not helpful. You really don't see anything. So the diagnosis, well, this one, unless you've seen a case, you don't know. This is called 
the benign yellow dot maculopathy. We don't know exactly how common it is. This is a newly described entity, and I had some other cases in my practice that I didn't know what it was. The pictures of, in the literature don't all look the same, but it's, some of them look like our case. And again, nothing on the OCT and some changes on the other images. And there are a whole variety of things that cause white dots or yellow dots in the retina. None of them really look like this patient. So we'll just skip through these. Those, not what the patient has. So this is a discrete entity, and we're going to examine family members, hopefully, to see if this might be hereditary. The literature is not clear on this. There are one or two cases that are suggestive of a genetic basis. Okay, the next case. 44-year-old with decreased vision for a year. Not diabetic. A1C repeatedly normal. Okay, 2020. And here's what the patient's complaining about. Vision loss in the left eye. There's a funny vascular loop up there. I don't know if that's related. But here's the problem. We have a cyst in the fovea with exudation. And when we do a fluorescein, we see a single aneurysmal structure with leakage. And again, not diabetic and nothing else. This vessel does not leak. Other eyes, normal. Well, this is called PVAC, Perifoveal Exudative Vascular Anomalous Complex. Quercus group described it. And there's a paper from New York also describing this entity. It's rare, I think. We only have one case so far. We might have seen it in the past and not known what it is. And really, nobody knows what causes this. In our case, we decided to watch it. The vision was down slightly, and it actually shrunk. So there's less cyst and le less cyst and less exudate. PVAC. Okay. The next one is an unusual case of macular schesis. Okay, 16 year old. He came with a diagnosis of sniffer. We'll come back to that in a second. But he noticed trouble in that eye when he was trying to catch a baseball. And we know that it's been there for at least four years. And he was tried by an ophthalmologist in St. Louis on dorsalamide, nothing else really, and that didn't help. And the vision has slowly gotten worse from 2025 to 2040. Again, dorsalamide didn't help. So he was sent up to Chicago. And when we look at the posterior pole, we see that the macular and the other eye is normal. In this side, there are cysts in the fovea. There's myelinated nerve fibers. There's an anomalous disc with a pit or a hole in the disc. There are very anomalous vessels here. And you can see on the imaging that there's cysts in the fovea. We'll come back to that. Fluorescein shows no leakage, so these are cysts without leakage. And the other fascinating thing is the periphery. Look at all these extra vessels something you might see with familial exudated vitreoretinopathy. But interestingly, his other eye is completely normal. So I don't think it's related to that disease. So where, where are the changes? So we're going to look at the splitting of the retina here. You can, you can see the nerve fiber layer is split as well. And if you follow the fluid back, which is what you need to do in these cases, it goes into the optic nerve. And it's hard to tell whether it connects up with the subarachnoid space or whether it connects up with the vitreous. And those are the two theories about where this fluid comes from. Okay, so here's inner retinal splitting, middle layer splitting, and going back to the nerve. There's also um, a Bergmeister papilla on the disc, so it's part of this anomaly. Okay, the other eye normal. So differential. Well, sniffer will cover optic nerve anomaly with maculopathy. That's what we think it is. And then there are a variety of other things that cause retinoschisis, none of which really resemble this patient. So here's the sniffer. It's a terrible name. Stellate non-hereditary idiopathic foveal macular retinoschisis. And some of them are bilateral, some of them are unilateral, 22 eyes. Um, I don't think these are all the same entity. I think it's a diagnosis of occlusion, and I think they just lumped these together. Some of them had peripheral splitting as well, which our case didn't. 
So here's one of the cases from the literature showing the splitting. Another case. Uh, we think this is in the range of optic nerve anomalies as part of uh, anomalous eye, including the peripheral retina. And you can have pits, you can have colobomas, you can have glaucomatous cupping, you can have morning glory anomaly. Those are all similar in that they can get fluid going into the retina and under the retina and maybe coming from the subarachnoid space or maybe coming from the vitreous and probably being pumped in there. So the management of all of these anomalies with fluid uh, consists of steroids or so uh, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and some of these other things have been tried. Uh, really, laser it works in some cases by itself. Many people go on directly to vitrectomy. At that time, they try plugging the pit with a variety of things, glue, gas, internal limiting membrane, etc. So I think that the best management for these is, if you need to do treatment, is to first try laser around the pit area and try to scar this down, so pretty intense laser. And I'm, I'm not really afraid of lasering in the papillomacular bundle like most people are, even with pretty intense spots if there's fluid over this area. And I haven't lost central vision from doing this. Uh, but many people go directly on to pars planar vitrectomy and they um, inject gas and peel the hyaluronic. And that works in many, but not all cases. Okay, next case. Um, this case, first we'll start out with the OCT. Here's a normal looking retina, and then the retina thins. And look at the internal limiting membrane here. This is the other eye, the same story. And we see this, this thinned area, but we also see all these white dots. And we believe, and others believe, that this is in the internal limiting membrane. Maybe some of you have guessed what this is already. We'll show you some other cases. So here's, here's white, whitish dots again. Not as prominent, but present in the other eye. Um, we don't see anything corresponding to the dots in the fluorescein. So this represents Alport syndrome, and this is a fascinating group of uh, patients. The first patient, 34 years old, slowly worsening vision. So you almost have to have renal problems, and they were hereditary on his mother's side, and he had lost his kidneys and had a transplant and was on dialysis. He also lost hearing, characteristic of this. And his vision was down in both eyes. He had anterior lenticonus, which I'll come back to. Second case, you can see all this myriad of dots in the internal membrane, nothing on fluorescein. Same type of funny pattern on OCT, thinning, and very intense internal limiting membrane. And you can see the thinning here, 182. Now we've described some new findings we've seen a lot of peripheral changes, salt and pepper type of stuff. Uh, the lenticonus uh, has been described before. Um, so we're talking about Alports, which is actually a heterogeneous group of diseases with abnormal basement membranes in the kidney, the cochlear, and the eye. And they all involve collagen 4, but there are different mutations, collagen 4, A5, collagen 4A3 and A4, etc. And it can be X-linked, autosomal recessive, or autosomal dominant. Most of them are X-linked, like this patient apparently was. And <clears throat> it involves the switching from embryologic types of collagen to collagens 3, 4, and 5. Okay, and you get renal involvement, hearing loss, and the eye findings. So let's just go, lenticonus is very striking in some patients. The most common manifestation of the retina is dot and flat, flat retinopathy, which are the white dots that I showed you. And they're not present at birth, they develop later in life. And they're not associated with uh, nyctalopia. We do get thinning of the retina, okay? You can get macular holes as well. Okay, my final case we'll discuss hypertensive retinopathy. Now, why such a common disease? 
because hypertensives everywhere, but real hypertensive retinopathy is not seen very often. When I was at the University of Illinois, I had an R01 grant from the Eye Institute to study hypertensive retinopathy. And I went into the medical service and I examined the patients, many of whom would never have been seen otherwise. And the findings were very striking. We don't have a chance to go through all of them, but I thought I'd pick out this representative case of hypertensive. So this is a patient who had very high blood pressure uh, for a prolonged period of time. The blood pressure is now done somewhat. He has vision loss in this eye, which actually corresponds to optic atrophy. You can see there's some optic nerve drusen, which we don't think are related. This is an ischemic optic neuropathy. But when you look carefully, you can see little pigmented spots and white spots, and we'll, we can see them on the autofluorescence. So here's the fluorescein, and the choroid fills very slowly, and there's a whole series of little branch artery occlusions. And we have these hyperpigmented spots with a pigment in the center and a ring around it. And those are very characteristic of severe hypertensive retinopathy. These are called Elshinik spots. And the artery occlusions go along with it. And we think that this patient had papilledema also, although we didn't have pictures from the acute stage. The choroid fills very slowly in patchy fashion. So choroidopathy is part of this. You can get serious detachments of the retina. He still had that, although I suspect it was more beforehand. And you, you can see these changes on the infrared image. Okay, so we have choroidal changes, we have retinal changes, and we get optic nerve swelling. And in this case, we had, an, on top of that, ischemic optic neuropathy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lee. That was great. Do we have any questions for Lee? I must uh, mention that Lee was one of our former CLUS lecturers as well and has numerous awards, which were too many to mention uh, in the limited time. Uh, so Lee, you know, I'm curious, you've named so many and found so many diseases. How do you go about doing this? Do you have like a file where you put unusual diseases and just collect them or how do you do it? Well, so uh, in, in the early days, I used to put it together all of the patients that I didn't know what they had. And let me give you an example. Uh, Paul Seaving came into my office one time and he said, you know, I have this patient that I think has ampi, but it's atypical. Could you come over and take a look at it? And it was a Friday afternoon about 5 p.m. And I said, sure. And I went over. And that actually was the first patient with multiple evanescent white dot, white dot syndrome that I recognized. And I said to Paul, um, I don't know what this is, but I have five or six cases just like it in my files, and uh, let's go ahead and put them together. And so that was the, the first description of that entity. So I think you have to have a good knowledge of other diseases, other findings. You have to have a good memory and good pattern recognition. And then uh, new things begin to appear. And when you first describe them, people say, that's not new. They, we, we saw that before. Uh, you're wrong, that's not evanescent white dot syndrome, that's AMPI, and uh, you just have to persist, and eventually people uh, sometimes, but most of the time, agree with you that it's a new entity. Okay, uh, Yannick hey, Lee, uh, has a question. Go ahead, Yannick. Thank you, Lee, that was uh, an outstanding overview. Uh, I do have one question about hypertensive retinopathy uh, and, and your review, you know, I don't routinely order fluorescein angiography in um, many of our hypertensive patients when the diagnosis is not in question. But something that I remember seeing uh, years ago as a fellow was uh, the, the wedge-shaped choroidal infarcts that people uh, have termed a Malrix sign. Uh, I'm surprised though that I, I feel like I have not in many, many years seen those sort of characteristic choroidal uh, fluorescein filling defects. Is, is that something that you see in your practice? Do you think that we don't see that as much because hypertension is now more well controlled compared to when uh, those findings were described? I just wanted to know about your experience with choroidal. So I think ischemic choroidopathy can be two main categories. One is at the choriocapillaris level which is the um, Elsnick spots that we've talked about. But when the larger vessels are involved, the posterior ciliary vessels, that's when you get the wedge-shaped infarcts. 
And we, we saw that in sickle cell disease and laser treatment of sickle cell disease. It's actually, when we go to the clinical conferences these days, very often there's a case of that due to lupus or temporal arteritis or a whole bunch of other, but those are larger vessels that are involved uh, than the LSNIC spots of hypertension. Do you still see those? I, I just, I have not seen one in years, but I also don't order fluorescence as frequently as perhaps we once did on hypertensive patients. Well, usually um, the, the, these patients develop pigmentary changes. So even if you don't get a fluorescein, you'll recognize the wedge-shaped lesions eventually. And uh, I think that there, it was a rare entity to begin with, but I think it's still just, it's still around from these various entities. Lee, do you Thanks, think there's a Oh, sorry. Lee, do you think there's a role for AI? So you feed these pictures into an AI machine and then they can kind of categorize and all come up with new diseases? Well, I'm sure AI is going to replace my brain one of these days, but, but uh, I don't. I think that AI is, is great and that it gives you the ability to look at a vast number of images and, and you can train it to look for certain things or you could do deep learning. And um, I hate to say it, but eventually it's going to replace all of us. So, with that cheery thought, we'll just, move uh, on. <laughs> well, Jenny, just one quick word. Oh, sure. Sorry, Bill. Go ahead. Oh, just uh, Lee, uh, great cases. I think we all love hysterectomy. retinas. Uh, nothing better than patients coming into our clinics that we don't quite know the answer to. It makes us really dig deeper into either finding what they have or establish a new diagnosis. So, I just want to say, great case. We really enjoyed it. And, and Bill's MOAC conference has amazing cases every year. So that's the, that's the place to go if you like this type of case. By the way, since we have time, is that going to happen, Bill? And is it, it's in the U.S., right? Is there a pandemic going on, Jimmy? I, I didn't hear. <laughs> Unless you've um, lived yeah, in a cave. <laughs> we, uh, we're, we're set to go in August uh, down in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And all indications are it's going to be in person, but it depends on what happens between now and then. Okay. If anybody wants information, just send me an email, W-M-I-E-L-E-R at U-I-C dot Great. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you, Bill. Um, so we will move on. And our, our next speaker actually is Dr. Bill Miller. So Bill is our class uh, uh, family professor of ophthalmology and vice chair for faculty affairs in our department. He is an esteemed colleague and friend of all of us, and he's also the director of the Vitro Retinal Fellowship Training, director of ocular oncology as well. Uh, so Bill is former president of Arbo. He's received the gas medal as well as numerous other awards. His interest is in tumors and ocular oncology. So we are going to go ahead and hear from him today on some ocular tumor known as ocular lymphoma. So let me go ahead and share his talk. Hi, I'm Bill Mueller. I'll be speaking on primary vitreoretinal lymphoma, diagnostic testing, treatment, and follow-up. I want to thank uh, Jenny Lim for putting the UAC Retinal Symposium together. It's nice to be part of the program. I have no financial disclosures. Primary vitreoretinal lymphoma is a subset of primary central nervous system lymphoma. It's a rare extranodal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, typically of B-cell origin, previously known as reticulum cell sarcoma and or histiocytic lymphoma. It can masquerade as a uveitis. Uh, typical features are that of vitritis with subretinal lesions. Whenever you see this in patients who are elderly, it's important to keep in mind the possibility of a diagnosis of primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. Imaging also shows quite nicely hypo-reflective material in between the RP and BRICS membrane. This once again is compatible with this diagnosis. In terms of epidemiology, this problem was more common in the 1970s to 1990s when there was a marked increase in this condition uh, due to uh, HIV. This, of course, has declined over the years, and now uh, the age-adjusted incidence of primary central nervous system lymphoma is roughly five cases per million per year, and about a quarter of patients with the central nervous system uh, disease will have concurrent primary vitreoretinal lymphoma as well. It's believed to or originate from uh, late germinal and or post-germinal central lymphoid cells. Uh, keep in mind there are other factors that contribute to this, including oncogenic transformation, hereditary predisposition, ionizing radiation, and congenital and or acquired immunodeficiency. The average age is typically 50 to 60 years. The youngest case was reported at age 11. Uh, it's a limited, there's limited information on the incidence of the disease process, though approximately 5% of new cancers are of the lymphoma type in the United States. 
majority are bilateral and most patients today are healthy rather than having HIV as we saw 20 to 30 years ago. Tissues involved include the eye and central nervous system in over half the cases, isolated central nervous system in a quarter of the cases, roughly 15% of ocular involvement, and you can have ocular, ocular CNS as well as visceral in a small number of patients as well. Keep in mind that there are other forms of lymphoma besides the B-cell origin, uh, Hodgkin's disease, mycosis fungoides, Burkitt's lymphoma, multiple myeloma, and Waldenstrom's macroglobinemia. Mycosis fungoides is T-cell origin, does not commonly involve the posterior pole, but may involve the optic nerve, and more commonly involves the external eye and adnexa, rarely seen once again in the retina. Burkitt's lymphoma reported about 60 years ago, but rarely occurs in the United States, originated in Uganda, a poorly differentiated lymphocytic lymphoma, commonly involving the orbital structures and rarely the intraocular tissues. Both myeloma and Waldenstrom's are plasma cell neoplasms capable of exhibiting a wide array of uh, systemic inocular findings and typically we'll see features of um, hyperviscosity and even features indic indicative of a vein occlusion. Now we aren't going to talk about these, and these are going to concentrate more on the B cell origin that of primary vitreoretinal lymphoma. Symptoms really include either being asymptomatic or floaters from vitritis. Most patients have bilateral features, but yet most patients are relatively uh, asymptomatic or just have mild vitritis. Antisegment manifestations are quite diffuse and nonspecific, including inflammation, hyphema, hypopion, iris nodules, cratic precipitates, nevascularization. Posteriorly, we see vitreous cells, and the hallmark is that of uh, subretinal and or coriretinal infiltrates, which typically are the hallmark of this disease process. We see these multiple solid uh, RPE masses, felt to be pathognomonic, yellowish white in color. They may enlarge, may become confluent, they may even disappear, and they may extend into the subretinal and the vitreous, subretinal space and vitreous cavity as well. Here's an example of a lesion that has uh, partially regressed, leaving behind some moderate pigment modeling and clumping. For example, the periphery is showing spontaneous changes in patients not yet treated for lymphoma. Evolution of a macular lesion becoming more prominent in the central image and then regressing spontaneously. So keep in mind these lesions can fluctuate quite extensively throughout the course of a disease process, even without treatment. Other manifestations that are less common include optic neuropathy, even artery occlusions, Exhibits retinal attachments, macular edema, uh, perivasculitis, and vitreous hemorrhage. These are all, once again, less common, but can be part of the lymphoma spectrum. OCT is very helpful. Uh, Carol Shields has nicely described various patterns that we see on OCT, that of placid, rippled, and or seasick. Once again, these features are compatible with the diagnosis, but nothing that is pathognomonic per se. This occurs due to the subrenal tumors oftentimes localized between the RPE and Brooks membrane. Ripple patterns seen quite nicely here on the OCTs and the so-called seasick or undulating pattern here noted on a couple of OCTs as well. In terms of pathology, we see a large pleomorphic cells with scant cytoplasm. The nuclei can be round, oval, or indented. Conspicuous nuclear membranes, prominent eccentrically located nucleoli, and these ones can are mainly derived from the B lymphocyte cells and less commonly from the T cells. When the retina is involved, you may see perivascular tumor infiltrates. There can be diffuse uveal involvement. The tumor scan is often located between the RP and Brooks membrane. Vitreous is very commonly involved, and of course, there may be spontaneous coriretinal atrophy and or scarring may occur as well. Establishing a diagnosis can be challenging because it requires basically a tissue confirmation. The average delay from symptoms to documentation of the diagnosis oftentimes exceeds a one-year time frame. And the key point is to always maintain a high index of suspicion in patients with inflammation of the vitreous cavity, someone elderly in age, and the presence of subretinal infiltrates. We get a specimen. The hallmark, of course, is cytopathology. We try to get a, a fairly large size specimen. We look at all the material in the micro cassette. It's important to keep in mind that small gauge vitrectomy surgery does not disrupt the cell architecture and try to deliver the specimen to the cytopathologist within an hour or so, so there's no degradation of the material. In addition to cytopathology, we look at immunohistochemistry. Uh, in terms of the leukocytes, various markers, CD45, for B cells, CD20, CD79A, and PAX5, and for T cells, <coughs> CD45R0, and macrophages, CD68. 
We also obtained the PCR gene rearrangement studies, post cytometry to detect clonal B and or T cells, and look at the IL-10 to IL-6 ratio. If this is elevated, it suggests the presence of a B cell lymphoma. Sometimes we have to get full thickness retinal uh, tissue via a biopsy. This, of course, is a generous biopsy here uh, where a large section of tissue was removed for analysis under the microscope. Most times we do this in a transvitreal fashion. Another patient here with a biopsy acutely on the left, healing on the right under silicone oil. Silicone was removed six months later. Diagnosis was confirmed that of the large cell lymphoma. Difference of diagnosis is quite uh, ranging. Antrosegment wise, one scan relatively diffuse in terms of melanomas, granulomas, infiltrates, metastatic iris lesions. And posteriorly, there are a number of entities that affect the choroid, including metastatic choroidal tumors, melanomas, hemangiomas, disseminated choroiditis, CMV retinitis. Entities that involve retina, uh, viral or fungal retinitis, toxoplasmosis, tuberculosis, uh, multifocal choroiditis, even syphilitic choroiditis are all in the differential diagnosis. How do we treat? Well, when disease is limited to the eye, local treatment is, is feasible. Intravitreal methotrexate given one to two times weekly, intravitreally over a four week time span, or rituximab given weekly for four weeks. In bilateral cases, the chemotherapy oftentimes is combined with external beam radiotherapy, 25 to 40 gray in fractionated doses. When there's ocular and CNS involvement, oftentimes the patient receives whole brain radiotherapy. If there is proven CNS involvement, this may be combined with intravenous and or occasional intrathecal chemotherapy as well. Examples of a patient here post intravitreal methotrexate. You see the resolution of the lesions, resolution of the inflammation on the right hand slide. No example of a patient post treatment with the lesions now being totally atrophic. Prognosis has become much more favorable over the years. A majority of patients with a primary vitreoretinal lymphoma develop CNS disease and patients now have survival in excess oftentimes of a couple of years. Uh, patients who are younger have high performance status at the time of the diagnosis, having more favorable prognosis. So to summarize, it, the primary vitreoretinal lymphoma is an insidious diagnosis with numerous presenting features may require a year or so to establish the diagnosis, and tissue is almost always involved in the necessity to establish the diagnosis. Hallmark features are subretinal choroidal infiltrates with vitritis. In terms of di making the diagnosis, cytopathology, PCR, immunohistochemistry, full cytometry all play a role in establishing the diagnosis. Treatment is with intravitreal chemotherapy, that of methotrexate, rituximab, occasionally combined with external beam and or whole brain radiotherapy and prognosis is improving as time has gone by, now exceeding two to five years of survival. I want to thank Dr. Lim once again for allowing me to partake in the symposium, and I'll see you all a bit later when I have a second presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Bill, for that comprehensive review on ocular lymphoma. I think we all see these patients in our practices, and they're very difficult to diagnose. Uh, very often, they come to us later in the disease course, so Bill, you know, if you saw somebody with, you know, some white spots, Lee obviously is a white dot expert, but let's say you saw somebody with white spots, some, some inflammatory okay. cells, what would push you to think more lymphoma as opposed to a white dot or, you know, an inflammatory uveitis? How do you manage this, this type of patient? Well, certainly it's, you know, a lot of factors, generally it's stage of the patient, uh, pattern of the abnormalities, uh, duration of the features. Um, I mean, always in the differential diagnosis is lymphoma because this just isn't the disease of 60 year olds or older. We see it you know, younger as well, but it's, it's hard to give an absolute other than just always maintain an, an a high index, looking for the features I described out of the try to set up subretinal infiltrates, kind of the so-called more classic features. And what would push you then to do a biopsy? Cause I had a patient who was 39 who had ocular lymphoma. It's really an odd, odd age to have it so young. Yeah, you know, oftentimes, you know, the patient, uh, once they're worked up for the usual things, uh, tuberculosis, syphilis, et cetera, and if corticosteroids are, are not contraindicated, oftentimes they'll have a course of therapy. If they temporarily respond or don't respond, that's going to push me more toward obtaining tissue for confirmation of diagnosis. Could I ask uh, you, Bill, uh, how you know when to stop treating? In other words, what's the end point? I ask that because uh, I think there's a very serious disease and often lethal and the five-year survival rate is only about 30%. Or conversely, the death rate is 70% overall. So I think it's a very, very serious disease. And 
I've been able to find no consensus in the literature about how to treat which drugs and mostly for how long, and also how assiduous you are in trying to rule in or rule out central nervous system lymphoma. At the same time, you're trying to make a diagnosis of uh, intraocular lymphoma. Yeah, Mort, you're absolutely correct. I mean, it, it is a very insidious process, not only within the eye, but within the central nervous system as well. Endpoints are challenging. Um, if you look at recommendations for treatment, say at our center versus other centers, whether it's rituximab or methotrexate, in general, it's kind of a four-week time frame, but there's differences quite vastly around the country. Uh, you know, we're looking from our standpoint, of course, to have the disease process become quiet within the eye. We're coordinating activities with our oncologists, but you're absolutely correct. Um, improvements have been made, but we're far from getting the definitive protocols and definitive endpoints. And it's just, it's going to take more time. What, what do you start with, Bill? How often do you add steroids or external beam radiation to, um, say, methotrexate intravitrally? with or without a rituximab intravitrally. I mean, the, the choices are very large and I, I personally don't know how, which to choose from. I guess personally, I, I've gone more with methotrexate. Uh, that's what I've been more uh, accustomed to using. Trexamab seems to work quite well. I'll add in steroids usually after a couple of doses of either of those agents. Um, but this one, again, is all done in conjunction with what's happening systemically as well, because if they have central nervous system involvement, then some form of adjunctive radiotherapy is certainly indicated as well. And, and just one other point I want to make too, just one more thing too, is that it's interesting because oftentimes I'll see a patient that has documented central nervous system lymphoma. They come in, they've got classic features of intraocular involvement. Can we treat we shouldn't, I mean, basically we should get tissue from inside the attic and from that as well. Uh, there's a chance of course of opportunistic infections, things like that. So whether it's uh, speaking to our oncologists about adding in radiation, they won't do it unless they have confirmation of tissue from within the eye as well, at least at our center. Right, and I think it's important to point out too that regular systemic surveillance is necessary and that that can happen at any point. Um, well, indefinitely, yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, so we'll move on now to our next uh, guest lecturer. And I'm really happy to announce the uh, class speaker for this year. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Sternberg as a 2021 class lecturer. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sternberg is the shoe-in for this uh, lecturer this year. He was also our lecturer last year, but due to the pandemic, we thought we would delay till this year and have Paul speak with us in person. But alas, we're virtual again. Uh, so Paul, it's great to have you here with us virtually. This lecture, the Kless lecture, is named for our UIC benefactor, Gerhard Kless, who funded many of the aspects of our retina service and many of the endeavors at the UIC Department of Ophthalmology. I selected Paul, as the class lecturer based on his outstanding contributions to our field. Paul has a wonderful combination of academic and administrative abilities that have led to his great success in his career. He has achieved academic success known for his groundbreaking work on the role of oxidative stress and AMD for which he has had uh, R01 funding for many years. He is an accomplished retinal surgeon, a respected and recognized educator, a leader in the academy, very active also in advocacy. He's a wonderful mentor to many and has received mentorship awards, and he's also a wonderful administrator. And I owe my first job actually to Paul Sternberg, uh, who was the Retina Service Director at Emory University when I finished my fellowship at Hopkins. And uh, Paul actually came to watch me operate when I was a fellow operating with Julia Haller. And then when I went to interview at Emory, he came with Gloria and his two kids, one of whom was just a baby, Zach was a baby at the time, and picked me up at the airport and met me at the gate, introduced me to the Atlanta as a city and, and to people in Atlanta. And little did I know that would be the start of so many wonderful years of friendship with Paul and Gloria and so many dinners at their home also as a faculty member. So as a you know, a former, uh, resident, former uh, colleague of Paul, I really was able to witness his great leadership, his great surgical abilities, and his ability to finesse all aspects of academic life. And at times, I remember Paul um, always encouraging me and saying that, yes, Jenny, you really can have it all. And so I'd like now to uh, share with you 
some aspects of Paul's academic career. So let me share my slides of that with you here. Give me one minute. If you guys, if somebody could please mute uh, their um, computer, that'd be awesome. Thanks. So Paul Sternberg, the 2021 class lecturer. Paul is an astute clinician, an honored researcher, a recognized mentor and educator, an effective leader and administrator, a wonderful colleague and friend, and a great husband to Gloria Sternberg and father to Matt and Zach. Paul Sternberg's education is stellar. He went to Harvard College, and no surprise, was magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. He then went to the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine and graduated with honors. This was followed by his internship at the University of Chicago and then a residency at the Johns Hopkins Wilmer Ophthalmological Institute. He was then a fellow at the Duke Retina Center and then chief resident at Wilmer. He became the chief of retina at the Emory Eye Center and was a Thomas M. Aubert Professor of Ophthalmology. He was at Emory for many, many years. And as I said, I was fortunate to work beside and with Paul during my first job as a faculty member. He then became chairman of ophthalmology at Vanderbilt when he was recruited away in 2003. And he rapidly rose through the ranks at Vanderbilt to become the associate dean for clinical affairs and the chief medical officer by 2009. He then became the chief patient experience officer in 2014. And as all of us know our experience with Epic, Paul was charged with the Epic rollout for all of Vanderbilt Medical Center. And I will say, Paul, Gloria told me that she has never seen you so tired in your entire career uh, as that time when you were in charge of the Epic rollout. That says a lot considering you're a retina surgeon. Uh, Paul also has an amazing research background. He has done groundbreaking work in the pathogenesis of AMD research, having R01 funding for decades. He has been awarded the Macula Society Gas Medal, Arnold Pats Medal, and the Paul Henkind Award for his work. He is part of the NIH study section and has over 300 plus peer reviewed papers and 30 book chapters. Paul is also a leader. I witnessed that when I was in Atlanta. He, is, he was the president of the Georgia Society of Ophthalmology. He has also been the president of the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the president of the Macula Society, the president of the AUPO, and the chair of the board of directors for the Arvo Foundation. He also created the AAO Leader Development program, which is a very successful program in creating the leadership for the academy. He's received the Lou Wasserman Award of Merit from Research to Prevent Blindness, as well as the AAO Lifetime Achievement Award. I previously mentioned the Mass Macula Society Gas Medal, Arnold Pats Medal, and Henkind Award. He also received the Brown Humanitarian Award, the Summer Prize from the Eye Care Foundation, the Heat Ophthalmic Foundation Award, and has always been best doc or top doc recognition. Paul's a very valued mentor and friend. And we see here a picture with Janice Law, one of his colleagues at Vanderbilt, whom he has recruited and mentored. And he received from her, from the American Academy of Ophthalmology Young Physicians Group, the Energize Eyes Award for his mentorship. He has also been involved in the HEAD mentoring program. And I've worked on that program with him and he's wonderful at that program as a mentor. He is also and foremost, the husband to Gloria, who is a wonderful person. And together they work at the Cheekwood Botanical Garden. They have multiple philanthropies, including the Museum of Art in Nashville and the leadership for Nashville itself. He is currently the chairman of the board for the Cheekwood Botanical Gardens. You may not know this, but Paul and his family are very much into art and have many benefactor uh, responsibilities for the art world, including the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago that his parents have been involved with. In their home, Paul and Gloria have pretty amazing art. And so I, I learned a bit about art when I got to know Paul and Gloria and uh, spent many hours in their home when I lived in Atlanta. He is also father to Matthew and Zach. And you see here a picture of Zach to Gloria's right. And you see his other son, Matt, with his fiance, Lizzie, to Paul's uh, left. So Paul, it's really quite an honor to have you as our class lecturer in 2021. Congratulations and thank you for everything that you've done, not only for me, but for all your mentees and all your colleagues uh, in the field. Well, good morning. 
Uh, it's really a privilege for me to be speaking to you. Uh, unfortunately, I'm, I'm not in Chicago. I, I'm uh, here in my home uh, in, in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, but it's a, a tremendous privilege to be giving the Gerhard Kless Endowed Lecture. And I want to start by uh, thanking Dr. Lim for inviting me. I've, I've known uh, uh, Jenny for, for four decades, and uh, I had the opportunity to offer her her first professional job uh, back at Emory. And uh, from the start, it was clear that she had a, a brilliant career ahead of herself. Just a wonderful combination of, of talent and commitment and, uh, and collegiality. And watching her career evolve, both personally and professionally, has been as satisfying as anything that I've had uh, during, during my time in academic ophthalmology. So congratulations to Jenny on all of your success. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. I also want to take a minute and, uh, and uh, thank uh, Dr. Morton Goldberg, who's the guest of honor at this meeting. Uh, Dr. Goldberg uh, was someone I actually met uh, the summer before medical school. He, at that time, was the, the director of the Illinois Eye and Ear Infirmary. I was about to uh, embark on my medical career, and my father was a general ophthalmologist in Chicago, knew Dr. Goldberg, and asked him to see if he could find a summer job for me. And in what, in reflection, was really an extraordinary morning, he spent several hours with me, touring me through the infirmary, introducing me to the various scientists, and giving me the opportunity to pick the lab in which I'd work. Uh, that summer was uh, really memorable. It launched my lifelong interest in vision research. And uh, in addition to working with uh, Dr. Edward Coatley, I, I met David Apple and, and uh, Jerry Fishman and uh, Golan Payman and just so many amazing uh, clinician scientists really uh, uh, a great experience. And, and for the decades afterwards, Dr. Goldberg has, has stayed in touch. Although we've never been in the same department, worked in the same institution, uh, he's always served as a mentor and, and a uh, valued role model for me. And uh, his career speaks for itself. And the opportunity to give this lecture when uh, he's the guest of honor is very meaningful for me. So congratulations, Mark, to you as well. I'm going to use this opportunity to do, do a little bit of reflection. I've already started uh, with that and talking about my uh, lifelong relationships with, with Dr. Lynn, with Dr. Goldberg. And today I'm going to talk about anti-VEGF therapy, this transformational innovation discovery that has really changed how we practice retina. I want to start by saying that I have no relevant financial disclosures. I do serve on the DRCR.net uh, Data and Safety Monitoring Committee, so there are clinical trials uh, that come across my desk, but none of them specifically at this time relating to anti-VEGF treatment for wet AMD. And of course, uh, no discussion of anti-VEGF therapy can take place without some discussion of off-label use of bevacizumab. So over the next... Uh, 30 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about how uh, treatment for neovascular AMD has evolved uh, and specifically talk about the discovery of and uh, introduction into use of anti-VEGF agents. And then talk about some of the key controversies. Some of them existed out of the gate uh, back uh, in, in the 2005 to 2010 period when we were starting to I'll learn about the use of these agents and others that persist and uh, where we stand in some of these critical controversies. And then I'll end with a brief discussion of uh, what's on the horizon. What, are the, what, what can we look forward to uh, in terms of how we treat patients with neovascular AMD over the coming few years? So the VEGF discovery journey is one that percolated along very slowly and then accelerated very quickly. Uh, back in the 40s and 50s, uh, Professor Isaac Michelson proposed the concept that there was a, dis a fusible factor, what he called factor X, that may be responsible not only for uh, normal vascular development, uh, but pathological uh, vascular growth, uh, neovascularization. And this concept was actually taken up by Judah Folkman uh, in the 70s uh, as, as a potential 
source for the development of neovascularization associated with cancer. And he actually called it tumor angiogenesis factor, or TAF. And it was in the 1970s that Arnold Patz at the Wilmer Eye Institute looked at that work by Judah Folkman and speculated that perhaps there was a similar factor in the retina that stimulated neovascularization in diabetes. And when I was a medical student at University of Chicago, I read about that work, found it very interesting, and, and spent uh, several rotations and summers in Baltimore working uh, in the Pats lab, uh, and, and as well with, as with Bert Glazer and Dan Finkelstein and others, uh, to explore uh, where we were in, in that journey. That, however, it really didn't move forward dramatically. Uh, there was some uh, exploration of, of whether VEGF existed in the retina, but it was really hard uh, to, to identify it uh, until 1989 when Napoleon Ferrara and his colleagues at Genentech were successful at isolating and cloning uh, VEGF. Once they had done that, then we could, more, in, in a more uh, determined and directed way, look to see if it played a role. And, and beginning with some work by Ann Hennigan and then others, uh, VEGF was reported to be in the retina and uh, subsequently demonstrated to be elevated in the vitreous in uh, diabetic retinopathy. And then in 1996, it was uh, localized via immunohistochemistry uh, to be in coronal vascular membranes in patients with wet age-related macular degeneration. Once VEGF had been uh, identified and cloned, uh, work was uh, initiated at Genentech uh, to develop uh, some sort of uh, uh, chemotherapy, uh, medication, drug that would block VEGF and, and be successful at treating cancer was the initial goal, and it was in 2004 that the first humanized VEGF antibody received FDA approval for the treatment of metastatic colorectal cancer. And then it wasn't soon thereafter uh, that uh, agents were developed by Genentech uh, to treat uh, wet neovascular AMD, and, and then the rest we'll talk about in the next few minutes. Now, when I trained uh, in the 80s, the treatment of neovascular AMD was laser photocoagulation. And this uh, slide from a, a paper in the 1980s uh, shows the results of the first uh, laser treatment study, uh, the macular photocoagulation study, the first randomized clinical trial, where patients with extrafoveal coronal neovascularization were randomly assigned uh, to laser or, or observation. And, and you can see that the cumulative proportion of eyes with an event with significant vision loss was much higher in the dotted line, those patients with observation, than in the solid line, those with laser. And in fact, this 24-month study was stopped early because it became obvious that laser was significantly better and that not doing laser treatment could be harmful uh, to patients. However, it was also identified that the recurrence uh, in, in these patients was very high. And you can see that, that at two years, 50% of the patients actually had a recurrence after the laser, and that recurrence was almost always on the foveal side and would lead to substantial loss of vision. So even though laser was much more effective in observation, the number of patients that retained good central vision was quite small. And it's kind of interesting, when you look at this slide, it says Argon SMDS, that stands for senile macular degeneration study. That was before we kind of became politically correct and uh, referred to it as AMD, or age-related macular degeneration. The destructive effects of thermal laser co coagulation really stimulated uh, clinician scientists and scientists across the world to look for alternative treatments. And the first one that was developed that seemed to be pre better than laser was a photodynamic therapy a uh, process whereby a photoactive agent was injected intravenously uh, and then activated uh, by a uh, low-intensity light in the macula, and it would change its chemical composition and be effective at sealing leakage. This was called vertiporfin, and in the TAP study, the treatment of age-related macular degeneration with photodynamic therapy, 
you can see that the uh, benefit of uh, vertiporfin, the percent of patients with substantial vision loss was significantly less than those treated with placebo. And it's interesting to note that because laser was really not viewed to be very effective, the control group was placebo and not laser. Remember, though, that this is the percentage of patients that have significant loss of vision, and I'll kind of put that in the back of your mind as we walk through these other studies. Immediately, PDT replaced laser as the primary treatment for neocular AMD. And it wasn't until the first uh, anti-VEGF agent uh, was introduced that uh, PDT started to fall out of favor. That was an agent called macogen. It was a pegylated uh, agent that uh, blocked uh, VEGF. It was injected intravitreally. Um, and you can see in this study when macogen was uh, in, given versus sham, the percentage of patients, or actually in this one, the mean vision loss was substantially less uh, with macogen and the sham. And again, it's important to note that we're talking about vision loss. So uh, patients uh, lost 13 letters with sham, and they lost seven letters uh, with uh, macogen in the predominantly classic group. And you can see similar benefits to macogen. And almost overnight, macogen replaced photodynamic therapy as a treatment. But the percentage of patients that actually had vision improvement or even retention of their current vision, even with macogen, was strikingly small. The search for a better agent ended. And it wasn't until 2006, with the introduction of ranibizumab, uh, that uh, it was demonstrated the benefit of this anti-VEGF agent uh, in both preserving vision and promoting uh, the uh, improvement in vision that uh, we saw uh, a advance uh, in patients' quality of life from treatment of wet macular degeneration. This was really the monumental change. And you can see in the slide on the left that the patients treated with photodynamic therapy over a year had 10 letters lost in vision, two lines, whereas the patients treated with ranibizumab had, uh, on average, a gain of 10 letters. So four lines difference between the two treatments, really substantial. Uh, again, another study uh, that, was, uh, that showed uh, with this, another group of patients when it was compared to sham injection, uh, a, a similar difference, a 20-letter difference between uh, treatment with ranibizumab and, and the other arm of the study. So here we have this great benefit, something that really, for decades before, just had not been seen as even possible. And almost overnight, uh, the preference for treatment of, of AMD turned around from photodynamic therapy uh, to a short period of using photodynamic therapy augmented with steroids to VEGF. Uh, Two-thirds of investigators treating a juxtaphobial neovascular membrane uh, with PDT uh, to two-thirds using anti-VEGF, and, and that number uh, just continued uh, to accelerate. This slide shows the dramatic increase in the number of intravitreal injections performed in Medicare beneficiaries, going from the early 2000s of very few, and of course being treated for endophthalmitis and other conditions, to hundreds of thousands, uh, to even millions of patients. Um, you can see that, that now we're over 3 million patients a year receiving intravitreal injections, a, a striking change in how we treat this disease. Before I talk about some of the controversies, I do want to just mention uh, a little bit of, uh, of, of interesting history, which is uh, the ranibizumab versus bevacizumab uh, controversy, and we'll talk about that a little bit more down the road in this talk. But it's important to note that uh, the ranibizumab trial, the trials for, uh, showed uh, results that were so dramatic that the investigators in the trial knew that the drug was efficacious. It didn't have to break the code 
to know that this new drug uh, was better than PDT, was better than Macogen, was better than sham. And when the results came out, uh, it was no surprise to the investigators. But there was a delay between the uh, knowledge of the benefit and the FDA approval. It's not like these days with the vaccines where between the time of FDA approval and the, the time of release is, is a day or two. These were months, uh, close to a year before a drug would become commercially available after FDA approval. And during that period of time, Phil Rosenthal, Phil Rosenfeld down at uh, Baskin Palmer had the idea to try um, bevacizumab, uh, Avastin, for the treatment of, uh, of wet macular degeneration. First, using it intravenously, which was how it was used to treat colon cancer, and seeing some benefit uh, working with his pharmacy to identify the proper dose and injecting it intravitreally. And there was actually a meeting uh, at, at a, uh, a resort in, in Montana where uh, Phil showed his uh, results, and uh, they were so dramatic that we got on the plane and all started calling our patients to come in and receive uh, Avastin injections uh, until uh, the FDA approval was received uh, for Lucentis. And uh, the controversy, uh, of course, uh, still exists as to what should be your first line drug for the treatment of what AMD, this is even almost 15 years later, uh, bevacizumab or ranibizumab. Well, as you, can, as you heard earlier, we, we were doing over 3 million injections a year, and uh, one of the concerns was post-injection endophthalmitis, which is a real event. We all know that, fortunately. It's infrequent, but if you're doing thousands of injections a year, you're going to see it, and are there ways to... When we first started, uh, the guidelines were that uh, patients, uh, physicians, uh, may administer post-injection antibiotics at their own discretion, uh, not longer than 72 hours because of concerns that uh, there might be resi drug resistance that develop by uh, uh, what drug uh, was used. The uh, patient, some physicians would use pre-treatment antibiotics, others post-treatment, some both. But it was not until several years later that it was determined that the use of post-injection topical antibiotic drops does not reduce the risk of endophthalmitis and, in fact, may be associated with a trend towards a higher incidence because of the promotion of the emergence of resistant um, bacteria. And so we, we do use uh, 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 an iodine solution to sterilize the conjunctiva. Uh, and our risk of endophthalmitis still exists, but it's very low. And uh, fortunately, uh, this has not become a significant issue uh, for us moving forward. Now, one of the concerns, though, was that uh, as we were using Avastin or Bevacizumab, uh, it had to be compounded. Uh, Genentech uh, chose not to make Bevacizumab avail commercially available for intravitreal injection. They still haven't. And so we were either compounding it ourselves or using compounding pharmacies. And there unfortunately had been some episodes of endophthalmitis outbreaks due to some deficiencies in the compounding procedure leading to micro microbial contamination of a lot of the Bevacizumab. And uh, uh, the Good news is that uh, as a result of, of better standards, better control, we have not seen these clusters of endophthalmitis. And uh, a recent study, well, five years ago, by, by Vanderbeek demonstrated that uh, the risk for endophthalmitis is no higher with Avastin and uh, that there may actually be a lower endophthalmitis risk. I, I think that's a, uh, I'm not sure we can make that statement, but certainly there doesn't appear to be a higher risk of endophthalmitis using Avastin. So, so we now are comfortable using Avastin or Lucentis or other agents for the treatment of endophthalmitis. We've developed for the treatment of, of wet AMD, uh, knowing that our risk of endophthalmitis is very small. Our methods uh, for doing the treatment uh, are 
uh, fairly straightforward. Uh, in reflection, we started, we were capping and gowning and gloving and masking, and, and now we're not cavalier, but we're very disciplined in how we provide the injections and infection. Uncommon. Another concern were systemic side effects. You know, these anti-VEGF agents uh, do get absorbed systemically. And was there a risk that the systemic levels of an anti-VEGF agent uh, could have an impact uh, on uh, systemic health of patients? Particular concern was whether Avastin, uh, which was a uh, uh, antibody to the entire VEGF molecule versus uh, Lucentis, uh, a antibody to a, a portion, and, and therefore less light, theoretically less likely to cause systemic side effects. And uh, we did find that uh, the risk, uh, the CAT study, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, as interpreted by Genentech, uh, they concluded in, in 2011 that the findings from the CAT study add to an emerging body of evidence that suggests that the risk of systemic adverse events may be higher with Avastin than with Lucentis. And of course, Genentech very much wanted to promote the use of, of ranibizumab of Lucentis, which was their agent developed specifically for uh, wet AMD, and, and they still are. Uh, very committed to promoting it, its use. Avastin uh, does not create uh, very much revenue or, or profit uh, for that publicly traded company. However, after a number of years and many, many uh, studies, uh, the preponderance of evidence concludes that there's no difference in the risk of acute MI, uh, uh, cerebral vascular disease, uh, bleeding, hospitalization, or any other systemic side effects with the use of intravitreal bevacizumab, Avastin, ranibizumab, <coughs> Lucentis, or a flibercept, ILEA, during routine clinical practice. So I think we are comfortable uh, stating that there is uh, not any a significant risk in the, uh, from a systemic perspective in which agent we're going to choose. I've alluded to the fact that there's a significant difference in cost. Uh, as we know, uh, um, Avastin uh, is, is uh, compounded, and so you can make a number of unit doses from one vial that has been developed for the treatment, uh, intravenous treatment for carcinoma, as opposed to uh, Lucentis, uh, which is unit dosed specifically for uh, for neovascular MD or for, for intravitreal treatment for a number of, of retinal conditions. And the cost uh, can be dramatically seen in this slide, but Cizumab costs approximately $60 uh, when repackaged at compounding pharmacies. Ranibizumab, depending on whether you use the 0.3 or the 0.5 milligram dose, is between $1,200 and $2,000, and a flebercept is uh, $1,800. And of course, uh, the uh, two on the right are single dose for the eye. The one on the left is uh, for intravenous dose dosage and then repurposed uh, into multiple unit doses. And if you look at the cost currently to uh, society um, with wet AMD treatment for three years, 10 injections annually, 15 letters of vision improvement, there's a tremendous benefit to society and to the patient. Substantial benefit. But there's a substantial cost. The annual Medicare expenditure for Lucentis and ILEA is $4 billion, with a $10,000 average annual spend per beneficiary. That's obviously substantially less if you're using the vast if you look at the Medicare total spending for the top five drugs, you can see that Lucentis and ILEA uh, are uh, more, uh, cost Medicare more than Remicade and Nulesta and Rituxan 
they are right at the top of Part B spending. And it's interesting also to see that when ILEA was introduced, that uh, the uh, use of, uh, of that drug almost immediately surpassed uh, Lucentis with uh, the hope that you would be able to reduce the number of injections by using ILEA. That, that was kind of the, the, uh, the hope that it would be the case. And I also think that because Genentech, this is my own personal opinion, because Genentech had been so resistant to making a Avastin available that the retina community, uh, a certain percentage of them, were looking for an alternative, a single dose alternative to Lucentis. And so for those who were uncomfortable using Avastin because of concerns about compounding or availability of compounding, they switched their loyalty from Lucentis to ILEA. So what agent do you, do you select for your initial treatment of the three? The most recent, ILEA, with uh, potentially uh, the ability to have a lo longer interval or reduce the number of injections. Uh, the traditional gold standard, which was Lucentis uh, or uh, Avastin, uh, which you have to compound, um, but has substantially uh, less cost. Well, it's not a mystery to anyone in, in, in the audience that the efficacy of ranibizumab and bevacizumab uh, was studied in one of the best and, and uh, uh, most notable uh, clinical trials, the CAT trial, comparison of AMD treatment trial, where patients were randomly assigned to ranibizumab and bevacizumab and uh, there was demonstrated to be lack of inferiority. Basically, that the effect at, at one year, at two years, uh, was comparable between the two agents. And we've already said that safety concerns uh, were comparable as well, and that that's been corroborated. So what agent is the first line? And we're fortunate that the ASRS does a survey each year to explore uh, the uh, preferences, the, the, the uh, how retinal specialists treat patients. And uh, one of the more recent studies showed that about two thirds of retina specialists in the United States uh, use bevacizumab as their primary, their first line anti VEGF agent for wet AMD. And then they're kind of equally split between a flea receptor and ranibizumab. That, that's the survey. And internationally interesting, it's a little more evenly split. There's a lot less uh, bevacizumab being used internationally because it's, it's more difficult to compound the agent. Uh, and it's easier for them to get uh, a flea receptor and ranibizumab for safe unit dose usage. It also is less expensive internationally uh, than it is in the United States. The concept of step therapy began to emerge in the last few years, which is this the idea that you would initiate treatment uh, with bevacizumab, and then uh, over time, you could switch to another agent if the patient didn't respond uh, to the Avastin. And this was as a result of Medicare seeing the amount of spending, as I mentioned before, with ILEA and Lucentis. It was their effort, uh, since there were clinical trials demonstrating they're comparable, to try to reduce the cost of care uh, that was being not just in eye care, but in health care. Again, you can see that these eye agents are outstripping treatments with many other agents for other systemic conditions. But there certainly was sentiment that this was dictating to the physician how they should practice. And uh, two years ago, the Academy released a statement that they strongly recommend that CMS reverse its decision to allow step therapy and that they work with patients, physicians, and others to develop other solutions that will ensure 
that Medicare beneficiaries uh, get timely access to the clinical treatments they need. In other words, they were uh, opposing the idea that you would mandate the use of bevacizumab as your first-line treatment for what Well, several years ago at, at our institution, we decided that, you know, we have 11 retina specialists and, and many of us had different approaches. We thought it would really make sense as much as possible for us to standardize our treatment for wet AMD. So we huddled in a conference room for an afternoon and, and beat each other up till we came to consensus. And our consensus was step therapy. And we, made, we agreed as a retina service that all patients who were newly diagnosed with neovascular AMD would begin treatment with four injections of bevacizumab at four week intervals, and then move to treat and extend. Meaning that if they had responded, uh, we would lengthen the interval between injections. We agreed with a definition of failure, and failure would be that there was either loss of three lines of vision or there was continued leakage and bleeding. And if that were the case, we would have the option of switching the patient to either ranibizumab, Lucentis, or a flebercept, ILEA. So again, here's our algorithm on the left-hand portion of the slide. Everyone starts with bevacizumab if there's treatment success. We continue with the bevacizumab. If there's failure, we have the option uh, to switch agents. And when we went back several years later and looked at how, what percentage of patients uh, were switched, it was strikingly small. In fact, we had 84% of patients successfully treated with bevacizumab control of their neovascular AMD at 12 months, and only 5% were switched to an alternative treatment. Quite honestly, we were surprised at this result ourselves. And when a study was done, not by us, I believe it was University of Michigan, to look at what would be the benefit in savings if patients received Avastin versus uh, the other agents for wet AMD, in just the Medicare fee-for-service patients, there was an estimated savings of $17 billion, a huge savings. So knowing that you can be successful in treating patients with uh, ranibizumab at least as a first, excuse me, bevacizumab at least as a first line treatment, what, what could be some uh, motivations or, or, or changes we could make that might promote greater use of Avast? And we simply say, reimburse it more. Uh, if you increase the reimbursement so that you have the same margin the same profit to the practice, the same ability to cover your overhead with bevacizumab than you would with ranibizumab. You would double the reimbursement from the 60s to 120s. You know, this would result in half a billion dollars of savings a year for Medicare. And of course, the patients who are responsible for 20%, they would save $120 million. So this is a really uh, relatively straightforward solution. And we certainly hope that it will be considered uh, by seniors. Moving forward, there are, are other controversies that continue in the anti-VEGF world. Um, there is definitely uh, evidence that uh, industry support of ranibizumab and aflibercept use uh, promote a higher likelihood of their use. Uh, whether it's that these, some of the higher uh, volume retina specialists are consultants to these companies, or whether they participate in a rebate program. But interestingly, when you look at the number of ranibizumab injections given in the United States, 3% of, of ophthalmologists account for over 30% of the ranibizumab injections. In other words, the use of ranibizumab is concentrated in a small number of practices. And it's because uh, if you use a lot of Lucentis, you qualify for a rebate program, meaning that they, re 
they, they give you a payback. It's, it's, it's not officially a kickback, but it certainly sounds like one. You get a reduced cost. And if that amount is 3% or 5% on a $2,000 drug, that means we're talking about somewhere between $60 and $100 uh, for uh, every injection. And if you're a practice that's giving thousands of injections a year, suddenly, you know, that becomes a lot of money, right? You know, if your practice, if, if you're getting $100 uh, per injection, you're giving 3,000 injections a year, that's $300,000 of profit. So you can see why there is a financial incentive to be using Lucentis, because you're at best breaking even with the use of Bevacizumab. You certainly aren't generating any substantial margin uh, with that use. And in fact, um, moving forward, the uh, Lucentis rebate program uh, continues to be under scrutiny uh, by the FDA. And Regeneron, which makes uh, ILEA, uh, is facing uh, some legal action for, potentially for false. So let's finish by talking about the future uh, in the treatment of neovascular AMD. Uh, there are a number of new agents that uh, either have been uh, approved or are in the pipeline. Prolocizumab or BOVU has been approved. Uh, it's an agent uh, that uh, has a even smaller risk of three lines of vision loss. And it is one where it appears that you may be able to extend the interval between injections compared to the other three agents. Unfortunately, it had a 4% rate of intraocular inflammation. And in some cases, patients uh, had fairly significant inflammation. And this has really complicated widespread acceptance of this agent in our world. And I, I, I don't think it has made uh, a, a significant impact in drug selection among retina specialists. Now, uh, these other two agents, uh, one of them, verisimab, is an agent for both VEGFA and angiopoietin-2. And it, study design is injections possibly at uh, three-month intervals rather than one-month intervals. And, and that is being studied. Uh, Abisapar uh, looks at another target, uh, the DARPIN. Uh, and, and it uh, has uh, moved forward. But again, this one has also has a significant problem with intraocular inflammation. And I'm not sure uh, it's likely uh, to move forward. And then the, with, with the absence of any new agents really emerging as exciting alternatives to the existing ones, uh, the opportunity to reduce the frequency of injections uh, has evolved as, as a significant priority. And uh, there are a number of studies looking at ways to sustain the delivery of, of existing agents that would allow both the physician and the patient not to have to come in as often. There's the ranibizumab port delivery system, uh, which is moving forward in, in uh, the FDA process. It's a permanent, reusable, surgically placed office-filled drug reservoir. And in their study, 98% of the patients could go six months or more between treatments. And then there's studies looking to see if gene therapy could be a way where you could kind of create factories inside the eye uh, to, uh, to promote the, the, the uh, release of anti-VEGF agents uh, and their studies uh, where uh, gene therapy is being administered. And then finally, there is uh, other targets uh, beyond the three we talked about in the prior slide uh, that are potentially going to be uh, of benefit down the road. So as we reflect on more than 15 years of anti-VEGF therapy and, in fact, reflect on, on dec even decades of uh, patients receiving treatment for wet AMD, um, there has been tremendous advances. 
And even with the controversies, our patients are seeing better and seeing better for a longer period of time. The approval of the first VEGF inhibitor in 2004, that was Macogen, ushered in a new era. And the vision benefits that we saw with Lucentis and then uh, Avastin and then ILEA have led uh, to billions of dollars in both patient and societal benefit. Myself and, and my group at Vanderbilt feel strongly that there are great opportunities to reduce cost uh, by uh, using uh, bevacizumab more aggressively, and that we can do this without compromising patient care, and that we are concerned that the incentives to use a more expensive drug are compromising some decision-making uh, by some of our colleagues across the country. And lo looking forward, uh, we certainly want to continue to look for new targets for better treatments, uh, increased durability that will reduce the, the burden of treatment, as well as better defined treatment endpoints for patients with wet AMD. So again, I want to thank Jenny Lim uh, for this wonderful invitation to give this meaningful lecture, the opportunity to come to Illinois Ioneer, where I literally started my, my career uh, is very meaningful, and, and to have uh, Mark Goldberg as the guest of honor, uh, who introduced me to vision research, uh, uh, is over the top. Thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you so much, Paul. That was a tour de force of anti-VEGF therapy over the past 15 years. Uh, you know, the study that you did at Vanderbilt is really quite intriguing to have 84% have such a great outcome. I'm curious for the other 16%, were you able to see what characteristics uh, they had at baseline? So maybe to inform the step care decision from the start, is that, was that possible? I think it's possible, we've not done it, uh, but, it but it certainly is, is, is possible and probably something we should look at. I think it's important to point out that our definition of failure was pretty broad. You know, if you'll notice, it, we, we, uh, it's, it's three lines. So many of us will not tolerate three lines of loss before we, we change agents. Um, but we felt that, uh, we, we, that was, you were allowed to change earlier, but very few people did. People really kind of would stick with it and found actually that, that if you waited longer uh, than, than, than stuck with the Avast and the patients would respond. There was a significant number that had delayed response. And some of the patients, some of the reports that have shown that switching agents results in a benefit uh, you may have seen the same benefit if you just stuck with your first line treatment. Uh, and even in the initial studies, they showed that there was uh, about 20% of patients that did not respond with the first uh, four injections, but did respond subsequently. Right, right. Very intriguing work. And hopefully, you know, we'll start taking that up. I think that's a very sort of thoughtful way to initiate step care therapy, um, as opposed to just a blanket statement that the government was trying to put out. Well, we did it on our own and, uh, right, right. and, and uh, kind of prior to the government imposing it on us. I always feel better if, if it's my idea and not theirs. Right. It was That's a very good idea. Very good idea. Um, Paul, that was a really wise, comprehensive and honest description of what happened over the past several decades. So thank you very, very much. I do want to revisit the issue of uh, systemic toxicity of anti-VEGF just for a moment. I mean, most people think now after the PEER and the Mareda trials and maybe the CAT trial as well, that uh, it's no longer a serious issue to worry about uh, a strokes of myocardial infarctions after injections of uh, anti-VEGF agents. But just three weeks ago, a uh, potential uh, blockbuster of an article appeared in the journal I, EYE, the official journal of the Royal College of Ophthalmologists in the United Kingdom. And I'll, I'll just read you the final conclusion uh, and see what you think about it. Uh, these, these doctors, primarily from Taiwan, studied close to 4,000 patients in the active treatment group and 13,000 patients in a control group. And just to quote their final conclusion sentence, it says, we found an increased mortality risk of two and a half times two and a half times increased mortality when uh, patients had intravenous intravitreal injections of anti-VEGFs and who had a prior MI and or stroke. 
in comparison with uh, patients who also had uh, neovascular AMD, uh, also with a prior stroke or uh, AMD, but without exposure to the anti-VEGFs. And so they concluded uh, that uh, the previous studies were flawed, the PEER study and the MARINA study, because they specifically excluded patients who had prior MIs and prior strokes. There's no way to compare the two groups. Uh, there are some flaws in this paper. It's, it's wholly retrospective and the breakdown of which anti-VEGFs were used or the dosages are not reported. So uh, there are some doubts about it, but nonetheless, this worrisome issue of post-injection MI and uh, stroke has now reared, reared its ugly head yet again. I wonder what you think about that. Well, it's always, as, as you've taught us, it's always hard to comment on an article that you haven't read and uh, you, you, you gotta be, be hesitant to, to, uh, to overreact. I, I think that we are dealing with an elderly population. Uh, there are risks uh, in that population. There are some people that feel that AMD may have some systemic disease components. And uh, so uh, I'm not surprised that there's a risk of, of MI in patients with neovascular AMD. What I don't know is whether the treatment has anything to do with the adverse events that they experience. So, so more, I'd like to comment. So I think that uh, that study, I presume, was not a, a randomized trial. It was retrospective. Exactly. Right. And there have been meta-analyses of huge numbers of patients with randomized trials that have not shown uh, any definite evidence of systemic disease. Now, you're right that many of those trials exclude patients with prior heart attacks and strokes. So the only way you're gonna establish that is a randomized trial of patients that have had prior heart attacks and strokes, and that's not likely to be performed. So. Well, I agree with both of you. I also think that if you talk to most of our patients who had a history of uh, prior MI or strokes and ask them whether they are willing to take the risk, uh, the small risk by, uh, uh, of having it exacerbated, uh, but have the opportunity to preserve their vision, um, the vast majority of them will say proceed with anti-VEGF treatment. Well, it does indicate that a careful informed consent is always useful. And yeah. uh, in this particular case, maybe even more than the usual. Yeah. I, I think that's correct. You know, Paul, the problem hits close to home. On Tuesday, a patient came in having had a mild MI two days earlier with a stent placement. He wanted treatment. I wouldn't do it. Yeah, that's, that's just too acute. Yeah. Hey, quick question for you. Give, give us your, you talked about the, you know, kind of the kickbacks for using a drug frequently. Unethical? Um, you know, I, 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 I hate to, um, be, to, to be judgmental. I would say that, that it's something that we are uncomfortable doing and, yeah. um, and, and we've made that decision. Um, but I, I don't think it's appropriate for, I, I will point out my concerns and let others decide whether, whether it's appropriate or not. I would like to, I would like to get back to the, um, selection bias that happens because in studies, because most of us, not only are they not eligible for a lot of the trials, but in clinical care, uh, we pause, just like uh, Bill mentioned, we pause when there's someone who's had an acute MI. We usually wait a couple of months. The overwhelming majority of these patients are then uh, maintained on their anticoagulation. So I think that it's very hard to look at the Medicare data and say there is no effect. I would say that the way we currently use it and the way we select our patients in whom we are going to treat and how we treat them shows that we're probably doing a pretty good job. I don't. I think the conclusion that there is no systemic um, adverse effect is um, a little bit overreaching. Um, that's one point I want to make. And then another point I would like to ask is, you know, in all of the studies, um, they've shown that the bevacizumab does not dry out the lesion or slow the growth. There's this slow creep of growth of the neovascularization. And we're now going on patients. I have been patients that have patients who have been treated since some of the original Anchor and Marina trials who are active, who live alone, who can read, whose brain is still functioning. And the benefit of maintaining the highest quality vision for the longest time is very clear. Now, it's a harder thing to show in a prospective controlled randomized trial in two years, 
But if you look at the overwhelming majority of patients who can see well, I think we all understand the benefit of, the, of, of that for these patients. So I, I have to say, I am not willing to accept failure in the treatment trial where there is three lines of vision that is lost that is usually permanent loss of vision. So I, I think this is a really hard call for everyone. And, um, and when we are looking at the cost of what these medications are to Medicare and how, how hard it is for practices and physicians and, and people to maintain using these, I mean, it's the cost of the medicine is one thing. The cost of doing all of these procedures is phenomenal. And, you know, and it doesn't really go to the physician. It goes elsewhere. And we're the ones doing all the hard work. But I, I do think that maintenance of vision and preservation of vision has to be uh, take a, a priority. And I use very little Avastin because I can often get my patients farther out than six or eight weeks, you know, or two, six or eight weeks and maintain their vision and maintain lack of growth of the neovascularization. So I think it's difficult with what we have, but I think, I think if we look at what we've done and how many patients we are seeing who can still see, they're all paying taxes, they're all paying insurance premiums, they're all making a boatload of money for the, for the whole world. So there are a lot of things, a lot of ways to look at it. And I hope we can keep that in mind. So I want to make one comment about step therapy that Paul is well familiar with. Paul is on the Data Monitoring Committee of the RCR Retina Network, and we're doing a study for diabetic macular edema, which is testing step therapy with bevacizumab uh, versus aflibicept. And uh, that study is quite far along, and we're going to have some data for DME where the patients started with bevacizumab that are not doing well and then are put on aflibicept catch up to the ones that started on aflibicept. So that's really gonna answer it for DME, I think. It'll so certainly give us some answers, absolutely. I'm curious, Paul, what percent at the end of the study actually lost 15 or more letters compared to baseline? Do you, do yeah, you know? I, I'd have to look, but uh, I, I think it was a, a relatively small number. But the, the challenge is that even no matter what treatment you're using, I mean, Alice is absolutely right. We have patients that we've been treating for 10 and 15 years that are doing fabulous. But we also have a lot of patients that have developed geographic atrophy uh, after, after years of treatment, regardless of what agent they've been receiving. And um, when we talk about what would be the best treatment for them to receive, uh, virtually every study has shown the best treatment is to continue monthly injections, regardless of the agent. That treat and extend uh, comprom does compromise uh, patients' visual function. I I've yet to see a study it doesn't show that. Now, giving everyone monthly treatments ad in, you know, until they die is not tenable for us or for the patient, but um, that is the best treatment. You know, I think having home OCT and doing a truly personalized treatment interval so that you treat right when it starts, like if you could do daily OCT is gonna be the answer. And I think in some of the furosemab studies, the PTI dosing scheme or interval, if you will, will actually help inform that as well. Absolutely. Well, thank you all for such a thoughtful discussion. And thank you, Paul, for a fantastic class lecture and for stimulating all of this discussion that emanated from it. Well, uh, I, did, really... I didn't get the chance uh, because it was recorded to thank you for your introduction. So I do uh, want to, it was really lovely and, and, and very much appreciated. And uh, we've known each other a long time. And, and, as, and as, as Mort said, uh, it, it's been a privilege to watch, watch your career evolve uh, as well. Well, thank you, Paul. And, you know, all of us can't succeed without all of you who've gone before us. So we stand on, on your shoulders and we, we, we have kind us. of a nice sequence here with the three of us. Uh, yeah, it's pretty amazing. The, the ties that are all interwoven. Uh, so with that, I'd like to say we're going to take a short break, a 10 minute break, and we'll hear from some of our sponsors. So we will move on now in our symposium um, and we're going to go forward into some other retinal vascular diseases. And I will be giving the next talk, which is management of diabetic retinopathy, new results from clinical trials. It's my pleasure to present this talk on management of diabetic retinopathy as guided by recent results from clinical trials. These are my financial disclosures. Today, I will address four questions that have been answered by recent diabetic retinopathy clinical trial results. 
these questions are one, should I treat DME in eyes with good visual acuity with an anti-VEGF drug? Two, how effective is an anti-VEGF drug for prevention of progression of high-risk non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy? Three, is an anti-VEGF drug or vitrectomy better for eyes with diabetic vitreous hemorrhage? And four, is there any new drug with a longer duration of action for treatment of DME? Let's take the first question. Should I treat DME in eyes with good visual acuity with an anti-VEGF? The DRCR Retina Network Protocol V answered this question. In Protocol V, eyes with center-involved diabetic macular edema on optical coherence tomography were enrolled. Patients had to have a visual acuity score of 20, 25 or better and confirmed at two visits 28 days apart prior to enrollment. In Protocol V, patients were then randomized to one of three groups, prompt anti-VEGF therapy, prompt laser with deferral of anti-VEGF therapy, or observation with deferral of anti-VEGF therapy. The primary outcome was the proportion of eyes that lost five or more letters of vision at two years. Of note, however, was that if the visual acuity decreased by 10 letters at any visit or five to nine letters at two consecutive visits, that eye was then treated with anti-VEGF therapy. Protocol V found that all three management strategies resulted in mean visual acuities of 2020 at year two. That is, the mean changes in visual acuity and central subfield thickness were not significantly different amongst the three groups. The majority of eyes treated with initial laser, 75%, and those treated with observation, 66%, did not receive a flibrocept treatment during the two years. A subgroup analysis looked at these eyes with very good visual acuity that were in the observation group. The subgroup found that it was more likely for these eyes to have anti-VEGF treatment initiated if the baseline CST in the study eye was greater than average, or if that eye had more severe diabetic retinopathy, or if there was recent or planned treatment for DME in the non-study eye. Having each of these characteristics approximately doubled the likelihood for the need for anti-VEGF initiation. Let's turn now to the second question. How effective is anti-VEGF therapy for preventing progression of high-risk NPDR? This question was answered in the Panorama study. DRCR Retina Network Protocol W has also looked at this question, but those results are embargoed until the ARVO meeting this year. We know from the DRS and the ETDRS that a diabetic retinopathy severity score is correlated with the risk of developing high-risk proliferative diabetic retinopathy. As shown here, as the level of DRSS increases, the risk for high-risk PDR also increases. And this is true at one, three, and five years. We have seen from the RIDE and RISE study, as well as the DRCR protocol I study, that ranibizumab treatment for DME is associated with regression of DR severity levels. This was shown in RIDE and RISE at month 24, and the DRCR showed two-step and three-step improvements in the DR levels at five years. A flibercept has also been shown to be associated with regression of diabetic retinopathy severity levels when used for the treatment of DME. In Vista and Vivid at week 100, two-step and three-step improvements in the DRSS were seen for eyes treated with a flibercept more often than eyes treated with laser. Panorama is a phase three double mass randomized study which looked at the efficacy and safety of using intravitreal aflibercept in patients with moderate to severe NPDR. These eyes were randomized to sham or one of two aflibercept groups, two milligrams Q16 after loading or two milligrams Q8 in year one going to PRN in year two. The primary endpoint at week 24 was the proportion of patients who improved two or more steps on the DRSS in the aflibercept groups combined as compared to the sham group. At week 52, there was a primary endpoint which compared the proportion of patients who improved two or more steps on the DRSS in each of the aflibercept groups compared to sham. And all of these eyes were followed through week 100. In Panorama, the total number of treatments for the two Q16 were eight out of a total of nine, and for the two milligram Q8 going to PRN were 10 out of a total of 15. 
In Panorama, the proportion of patients who achieved a two or more step improvement from baseline at the primary endpoint of week 24 was greater for the flibercept combined groups as compared to the sham groups. That is 55 to 63% for the flibercept arms compared to 6% for the sham arm. At the primary endpoint comparing each of the flibercept groups to sham, we see that in the two milligram Q16 group, 65% achieved this endpoint compared to 15% in the sham group. For the two milligram Q8 going to PRN, 79.9% achieved this versus 15% in the sham group. The improvements held at year two for the majority of eyes treated with the flibercept as compared to the sham group. The secondary endpoints in Panorama were the development of vision threatening complications or center involved DME. Thus, it looked at the protective effect of the use of anti-VEGF in these eyes with moderate to severe NPDR. The rates of VTC or center involved DME were markedly lower in the flibercept arms, 17.9% and 20.5% as compared to the sham arm in which these occurred at 57.7%. Looking specifically at VTCs, that is the development of proliferative diabetic retinopathy or anterosegment neovascularization, we see these occurred in 6.9 and 9.1% of the flibercept arms as compared to 30.6% in the sham arm. For the development of center-involved DME, these occurred in 11.3 and 14.4% of the flibercept arms as compared to 38.4% of the sham arms. Thus, the vision-threatening complications and center-involved DME in the treated groups were markedly reduced compared to sham. Let's look now at the question, is anti-VEGF or vitrectomy better for the initial treatment of eyes with diabetic vitreous hemorrhage? This was answered by the DRCR Retina Network Protocol AB. In Protocol AB, 206 eyes with proliferative diabetic retinopathy and vitreous hemorrhage were randomized to either initial anti-VEGF injections or vitrectomy with PRP. Visual acuity was required to be 2032 or worse. Eyes that had center-involved DME, macular-involving TRD, neovascular glaucoma, regmatized retinal detachment, or fibrosis were excluded. The primary outcome was the mean visual acuity score at week 24. In protocol AB, for eyes randomized to vitrectomy with PRP, anti-VEGF was allowed preoperatively and intraoperatively. Postoperatively, after four weeks, anti-VEGF was allowed monthly for up to two treatments if there was recurrent vitreous hemorrhage present. For the aflibercept arms, a flibercept was given at baseline and monthly for a total of three treatments until week 16. If there was no longer vitreous hemorrhage, at week 16, deferral of the flibercept was allowed, or if vitreous hemorrhage was still present, vitrectomy was allowed. In protocol AB, we see at week 24 that the visual acuity outcomes were similar between the initial flibercept arms and the vitrectomy with PRP arm. The mean visual acuity letter score remained relatively similar for the two groups out to week 104. The secondary outcomes were also similar between the two groups. Based on protocol AB, we can conclude that the mean visual acuity is similar at weeks 24 and also at two years, regardless of the initial treatment. In the vitrectomy group, eyes had faster clearance of the vitreous hemorrhage and a reduced likelihood of developing recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. There is also a greater resolution of neovascularization and a lower rate for the need of vitrectomy for TRD. For the flibercept groups, less frequent treatment for center-involved DME was required, and two out of three eyes avoided the need for vitrectomy. Let's turn now to the last question. That is, is there any new treatment with a longer duration of action for treatment of DME? The phase three, year one Yosemite and Rhine studies give us an answer to this question. The use of ferisumab, which is a bispecific antibody against angiopoietin-2 and VEGF, showed that there was a longer duration of action with ferisumab that achieves similar results to a flibercept. In the Yosemite and Ryan protocols, patients were randomized to one of two groups of ferisumab or to a flibercept two milligrams Q8 weeks. The ferisumab groups consisted of ferisumab six milligrams Q8 weeks 
or furosemib six milligrams in a personalized dosing interval. Both of these required a loading dose. The primary endpoint was the change in baseline best corrected visual acuity that was averaged over weeks 48, 52, and 56 for each of the three groups. These patients are being followed to week 100. In Yosemite and Rhine, you can see that the curves for furosemib are very similar to the curves for a flibercept. The visual acuity results were similar between all three groups. These good visual acuity results comparable to a flibercept were seen with furosemib being dosed at longer durations. 70% or more of eyes were able to achieve a Q12 week dosing interval at week 52. Between 52.8 and 51% of eyes were able to achieve a Q16 week dosing interval in the personalized dosing interval. So we have seen based on these recent clinical trials results that treatment for eyes with good visual acuity with an anti-VEGF is not necessary. Rather close observation can result in similar good visual acuity endpoints. We've also seen that anti-VEGF therapy is effective for the prevention of progression for high-risk non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, as well as for the prevention of center-involved DME and vision-threatening complications. We've also seen that either anti-VEGF therapy or vitrectomy can be used for the initial treatment of diabetic vitreous hemorrhage with similar outcomes at the end of 24 weeks and two years. Lastly, we've seen that furosemab has a longer duration of action, but can still achieve similar improvements in visual acuity as a flibercept. So I think that the future is bright for the treatment of our patients with diabetic retinopathy, and I thank you for your attention. So are there any questions? So Jenny, I'd just like to make a comment that in the Panorama study, you pointed out that the DRSS scale improved and that diabetic um, proliferative disease and DME would last, but there was no benefit to visual acuity at two years. Correct. So the patient sees with their vision at the last time I checked, and we need to have evidence that it's a visual benefit to do the prophylactic study. Totally agreed, Lee. And I think, you know, the idea that if you could drive back the level of DRSS, perhaps in those patients, then you might avoid some of the complications further down the line that could lead to visual loss. But you're absolutely right. At what cost economically, at what cost in terms of risk, you know, do we go ahead and do prophylactic treatment for diabetic retinopathy patients? So we still have to wait. And I think longer term follow-up will tell us how often do you need to treat, how durable is the treatment, and will it have an effect on visual acuity? And perhaps uh, protocol uh, w will give us those results when the results are released. So protocol W should be published this week. Oh, cool. Because my I wrote a commentary. So my very, commentary very similar to a panorama study, but that will have four-year outcomes, which we're looking at the vision at four years, which is important. Absolutely. Great. Okay. So we'll move on. And I would like now to introduce our next speaker, who is one of my former residents, uh, Dr. Michael Andrioli. So uh, Michael was, is in practice at the Wheaton Eye Clinic, and he specializes in diseases of the retina and has also done a fellowship for ocular uh, tumors. He's very interested in ocular oncology. He graduated magna cum laude from Boston University's combined seven-year program, and uh, he did his residency at UIC. He was one of our chief residents and did an outstanding job. So I've asked uh, Michael to speak to us today on retinal vein occlusions. So here- Welcome everybody. This is Mike Andrioli. I'd like to thank UIC and Dr. Lim for organizing this meeting every year and for the invitation to speak. My topic is retinal vein occlusions management in 2021. I have no financial disclosures. I will touch upon imaging, management, and the future. I will start with imaging. OCT has guided our management of retinal vein occlusions for many years now. As we learn more about some of these specific findings, it helps to elucidate the disease process. This study out of Duke demonstrated that disorganization of the retinal inner layers, 
also known as DRILL, was associated with worse visual acuity at six months and beyond in follow-up, likely due to ischemia to the inner retina. Another imaging modality that has proven useful in the setting of RVO management is ultra-wide field fluorescein angiography. This study out of more fields compared peripheral to posterior pole non-perfusion in central retinal vein occlusions as seen on ultra-wide field FA. They demonstrated that posterior pole non-perfusion greater than 10 disc areas was a key risk factor for the development of neovascularization. This finding suggests that although we see apparent peripheral non-perfusion on these fluorescein angiograms, we don't always understand the significance in the setting of these patients. Advances in OCT angiography have given us yet another modality to examine perfusion in these patients. This paper out of France compared ultra-wide field fluorescein angiography with wide field OCTA. They demonstrated that non-perfusion on ultra-wide field FA correlated with wide field OCTA. Traditional teaching regarding the pathophysiology of a retinal vein occlusion suggests that thrombus formation near the lamina cribrosa for a central retinal vein occlusion or an AV crossing point in a branch retinal vein occlusion has now been corroborated somewhat by 3D reconstruction of OCT angiography. This photo essay out of UC Davis shows a beautiful 3D reconstruction of the origin point for a BRVO patient. They were able to show the underside of the vein, which furthers our understanding of the relationship between the artery and the vein in the development of a retinal vein occlusion. Changing focus to management now, many of us are aware of the historic trials regarding macular edema that have shaped how we treat patients. The BVOS trial showed the visual benefit for laser in the setting of BRVO. The Geneva study showed benefit of steroid for RVO patients. And at this point, there have been numerous anti-VEGF studies. The Bervolt study showed benefit with bevacizumab. Bravo, Cruz, and Horizon showed benefit with ranibizumab. And Vibrant showed benefit with aflibercept. We've been learning more about the diffuse effects on the retina through our therapies. The PERMEATE study examined two retinal vascular disease indices, the panretinal leakage and panretinal ischemic indices, to see how patients do during the course of a flebercept treatment. The panretinal leakage improved during the course of a flebercept treatment, whereas the panretinal ischemia trended toward worsening over time. At this point, it's hard to say whether that was a treatment effect or the natural course of the disease. While most of the current focus is on anti-VEGF injections for macular edema in the setting of RVO, some are still asking, is there a role for macular laser in these patients? The two-year results of the BRIDER study showed that in patients receiving routine ranibizumab, there was no added benefit for macular laser in terms of functional outcomes or injection burden. After seeing patients with significant non-perfusion as well as recalcitrant macular edema, it is only natural to question whether the peripheral non-perfusion is playing a role in the persistence of the macular edema. Therefore, the targeted retinal photocoagulation idea was born in which ultra-wide field angiography is used to find areas of non-perfusion and a targeted sector PRP type laser is performed. While the concept itself is quite smart, it has been a bit difficult to interpret the results of studies examining this method. There have been multiple studies which have demonstrated benefit in terms of reducing macular edema or injection frequency. However, it's difficult to ignore the results of the RELATE trial and the WAVE trial, both of which have been very well-designed studies that showed no benefit over ranibizumab injections alone. I would imagine most retina specialists have at least a handful of patients with persistent macular edema despite aggressive anti-VEGF injections who then went on to respond nicely to steroid injections. And the question is, is there still a major role for steroid in the setting of retinal vein occlusion management? Admittedly, the data set for steroid use in the setting of RVO macular edema is not nearly as extensive as the anti-VEGF data set. 
There is a study entitled a 12-month multi-center parallel group comparison of dexamethasone intravitreal implant versus ranibizumab in branch torrential vein occlusion. This parallel study design reflected the European dosing of dexamethasone implant, and they were able to inject patients at day one, month five, and month 10 or 11. And the ranibizumab arm had monthly injections through month five and then were treated as needed. As you might expect, there's a higher rate of ocular hypertension in cataracts with the steroid arm, but there was also lesser visual recovery with the dexamethasone implant. One obvious benefit in the steroid arm was lesser need for injections, but that's also the main criticism I have of the study is those patients were possibly underdosed in the dexamethasone implant arm at least in my personal experience, um, the dexamethasone implant works pretty well for three to four months or so. Here are a couple quick real world cases. The first is a 53 year old male with a central retinal vein occlusion and severe macular edema. Three injections of bevacizumab improved the macular edema, but he still had severe edema through the fovea. I performed in a flebercept injection, he had a dramatic improvement. The second case is a 73-year-old male with a central retinal vein occlusion. His edema was more moderate, but he was very, very symptomatic with the foveal changes. After five bevacizumab injections, I offered a flebercept or triamcinolone. Given he had a stroke history, he elected to proceed with triamcinolone injection, which worked miracles for his macular edema, but his pressure increased to 65. Fortunately, he's done well with drops alone. So what does the future hold for retinal vein occlusion management? Clinicaltrials.gov has numerous studies listed. There are several new anti-VEGF or steroid formulations, as well as some experimental drugs being examined. The Raptor study is comparing brolocizumab versus a flebercept, Farisumab, which acts upon ANG2 and VEGF-A pathways is being examined. Superchoroidal steroid adjuvant therapy is being analyzed as well. There's been some repurposing of existing treatment modalities. The EVRS study showed some benefits to vitrectomy with ILM peel in patients with macular edema. Laser induced chorioretinal anastomosis seems to show some early promising results as well. Subthreshold laser has been used for nearly every macular disease, but also for retinal vein occlusion. Two somewhat commonplace medications, topical dorzolamide and oral minocycline have been tested as well. Hyperbaric oxygen is being studied as it is for seemingly every retinal vascular condition. Perhaps the most interesting one on the list is stem cell therapy with the use of intravitreal autologous CD34 positive stem cells. So in summary, anti-VEGF remains the mainstay of retinal vein occlusion treatment. There appears to be limited utility for laser in RVO-associated macular edema. There are emerging roles for ultra-wide field fluorescein angiography and wide field OCT angiography. And stay tuned for new medication classes and delivery systems and possible stem cell therapy. Here are my references, and thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thanks so much, Michael, uh, for that very nice summary of how you treat vein occlusions. Uh, out of curiosity, when you see a patient who has uh, DME and you treat them with anti-VEGF, when do you switch over? When do you start considering you know, uh, an Osrodex implant? Are you asking for DME or vein occlusions or both? Vein occlusions. Vein occlusions. Um, I don't have a set rule for it personally. Um, I base it a fair amount on the patient's preference as well. So I will usually go at least four to six anti-VEGF, and then we'll have the discussion if they're still having persistent CME. Um, I find that some patients really don't want the, to switch over when you discuss the risk profile, and others are getting frustrated with some of the, the distortion, the central vision. And those are the patients that, in my experience, tend to, to at least consider steroid a little bit sooner in the treatment regimen. Great, thank you. Mike, uh, could I ask you about uh, two disease states? 
can see how you would approach them. First is NVI, and the second is NVE. What, what do you use in your first treatment for those two conditions in vein occlusion? Um, typically, a uh, fluorescein angiogram will somewhat help guide my treatment there. If I do feel that there's extensive peripheral non-perfusion in the setting of neovascularization, I'm sometimes more apt to go to a PRP laser. Um, whereas if I don't see a lot of that and I'm, I'm seeing some neovascularization, especially in the setting of macular edema, then I tend to go with anti-VEGF injections more predominantly. But if there's no macular edema and uh, there's either NVI or NVE, then what do you do? Um, often those are patients that I'll consider still uh, PRP laser for. Good, thanks. Mike, great talk. Um, sometimes, you know, we get a really robust response just after one or two injections and um, even with florid retinal edema and the edema subsides. So do you carry on and uh, continue with the, you know, the monthly injections of the first six months as was done in the Bravo and Cruz trials, or will you sort of, you know, implement a, you know, a modified treat and extend at that point? Yeah, that's a good question. I tend to be more conservative with injections than a lot of people. So I look for any reason to stop injections whenever I can. So I tend to start with somewhat of a treat and extend protocol, but I'm pretty uh, apt to switch over to PRN if they're doing well. So I find, at least in my experience, patients prefer to switch over earlier to a PRN if you think it's reasonable for them. I think in diseases that aren't uh, scarring, um, I think it's fine to have a little bit of recurrence of CME and try to figure out the, uh, the correct regimen for that patient. I'm a little bit less apt to do that in the setting of a CNV. Great, thank you, Michael. We'll move on now to our next speaker who I'm pleased to um, introduce, Dr. Pooja Bhatt. Pooja Bhatt is one of my colleagues at University of Illinois, and she is the co-director of the Uvieta Service and the Associate Residency Program Director. She's an assistant professor of ophthalmology in our program and a valued member of our group. She specializes in uveitis, having trained at Boston, in Boston, with Dr. Jacobiak also in pathology and Dr. Foster in uveitis. And she also trained with Dr. Debbie Goldstein at Northwestern for uveitis. So I asked Pooja today to share with us some of her pearls in the treatments of patients who have uveitis and how to distinguish them. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Pooja Bhatt, and I will be speaking on infectious and inflammatory masquerades. Masquerade syndromes are a group of disorders that simulate a non-infectious uveitis. They have an apparent clinical picture of immune inflammation, but have a non-immune mediated underlying cause and may be poorly responsive to corticosteroid treatment. When thinking of infections that can masquerade as immune inflammation, some of the conditions to consider are TB serpiginous choroiditis, QT bacterium acnes and ophthalmitis, hepatitis B associated polyarthritis nodosa, Whipple's disease, and other infections such as necrotizing herpetic retinopathies, masquerading as Bechet's disease, toxochoriasis, toxoplasmosis, masquerading as a non-infectious intermediate and posterior uveitis, particularly when the granuloma or patch of retinitis may be over the pl pars plana and is overlooked, and syphilitic uveitis that can masquerade as anterior, intermediate, or posterior uveitis. When considering immune or inflammatory masquerades, one can classify them as neoplastic, which include primary vitruvent retinal lymphomas, metastases, leukemias, retinoblastomas, and juvenile xanthogranulomas, and non-neoplastic, which includes drug-induced inflammation, intraocular foreign bodies, and inherited retinal diseases. The cornerstone of evaluating any patient with uveitis is a good history and thorough review of systems using the Sun Working Group descriptors of uveitis to define the onset, duration, and course of inflammation and then using the naming and meshing technique as described by Smith and Nozick to come up with a differential diagnosis. In this technique, one defines the problem, names the clinical diagnosis, and compares with existing known uveitis patterns to come up with a differential diagnosis. 
and finally utilizing a Bayesian approach to laboratory testing. Essentially thinking about the utility of a lab test based on the sensitivity and specificity of the test and the pretest likelihood that the disease the test is intended to identify might be present in that particular patient. So what are some of the general suspicious features one might encounter in a masquerade syndrome? Unilaterality could be the initial tip off, large anomalous bridging KP that are not restricted to Arles triangle, high intraocular pressure at presentation, which could represent a viral trabeculitis, large vitreal cells, significant vitreal haze, and absence of cystoid macular edema with persistent inflammation despite steroids, and lumpy, bumpy tumor hypopia. Some specific features to consider for certain masquerade syndromes are satellite serpiginoid lesions and vitritis in TB serpiginous, chalky white or crystalline deposits on the IOL bag complex or a plaque on the posterior capsule for QT bacterium endophthalmitis, and environmental factors such as patients living in viral endemic areas when presenting with signs and symptoms of polyarthritis nodosa. In terms of additional testing, it is very important to narrow down the differential for that particular patient and order appropriate testing which will be helpful in managing the patient. Thinking of a specific test, if one is concerned about TB, considering a PPD test which casts a wider net and can be positive in patients with atypical mycobacteria, as against a quantiferon gold, which is specific for MTB, is important. Also, in certain instances, thinking of ocular fluid testing rather than serum testing, such as in toxoplasmosis, uh, toxoplasma antibodies in serum could represent exposure, but not necessarily active disease, is also important. For ocular fluid testing, considering where appropriate, gram stain, culture, cytokine analysis, flow cytometry, and PCR testing is helpful. A special mention of drug-induced uveitis. The newer medications now available to treat previously untreatable conditions such as advanced metastatic cutaneous melanomas have resulted in unintended ocular inflammatory diseases, especially immune checkpoint inhibitors such as ipilimumab, BRAF, MEK inhibitors. Both can cause anterior posterior uveitis and panuveitis and BKH like syndromes and also considering other agents implicated in causing uveitis, such as anti-TNF agents, anti-VEGF agents, and several others. Naranjo et al. have proposed criteria to establish causation between medication and an adverse reaction along with weighted scores, and this could be helpful in diagnosing a drug-induced uveitis. Higher the score, the more likely that there is a causal relationship between the medication and uveitis. Weighted scores of 9 to 13 are defined as definite and the remainder are defined as probable, possible, or doubtful. Moving on to a case uh, of a 34-year-old female with one week history of blurred vision, flashes, floaters that was referred to UIC for evaluation. Her country of origin was Guatemala. She had no past ocular history and her review of systems was significant only for a headache, but otherwise was unremarkable. She had significant past medical history of stage 3 cutaneous melanoma diagnosed in early 2020 status post excision. She was on MEK inhibitors to reduce, risk, uh, recur to reduce recurrence risk. And her most recent PET CT and MRI brain mid-2020 was negative for metastases. She presented with counting fingers vision in each eye, a normal intraocular pressure, an anterior segment exam on steroid drops four times a day in each eye for about a week had revealed small KP, one plus cell, and iris nodules. Her uh, fundus exam revealed hyperemic discs in both eyes and multifocal serous retinal detachments in both eyes. She also underwent a fluorescein angiogram which revealed early pinpoint hyperfluorescence late pooling in each eye as well as uptake of the dye by both optic nerve heads. Her uh, ICG showed areas of hypocyanescence in, in areas of fluid with stippled 
hypercyanescence in both eyes and her OCT revealed subretinal fluid within the fovea with dome-shaped exudative retinal detachments in each eye and presence of subretinal septa in both eyes. We were concerned about autoimmune Vokoyanagi Harada disease or a drug-induced VKH in this patient. We ordered blood work in anticipation of starting oral prednisone. We also called her oncologist and discussed stopping MEK inhibitors, which the oncologist was on board for. And if the, the plan was that if she recurred, her melanoma recurred, that she would start immunotherapy. We started her on one milligram per kilo of prednisone with taper. We saw initial improvement with reduction in her subretinal fluid within one week and her vision improved to 2200 and 2050. However, at week two, a worsening was noted and unbeknownst to us, the patient had continued her MEK inhibitors. Uh, we then gave her explicit instructions to stop the medications, which she did. The patient then continued to improve with oral prednisone, which was slowly tapered over four months, and there was complete resorption of her subretinal fluid and her vision returned to 20-25 in each eye. This is her right eye and left eye showing complete resorption of subretinal fluid um, along with her OCT of the right eye and the left eye, again showing that the fluid was completely resolved. So in conclusion, Uveitis masquerade syndromes are a group of ocular conditions that mimic chronic intraocular inflammation. They include infections, neoplastic, non-neoplastic processes, as well as drug-induced reactions. And high level of suspicion along with appropriate laboratory testing is necessary for correct diagnosis. Great. Thank you so much, Pooja. Uh, Pooja, yeah, I'm so sorry for the hushed voice. I didn't realize I had my headphones on and no, no worries. We could hear you. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, you know, your patient had features of VKH, but also had a reaction to the MEC. So she had a double, double, if you will, double diagnosis. Was that? Yes. I mean, initially she certainly fits the criteria for sort of typical autoimmune VKH, her ancestry, her age. Um, but she was also on the MEC inhibitors, uh, so we treated this, we actually started this, uh, treating it as an immune VKH, uh, but we did think about drug induced and we wanted her to stop the medicine, but the fact that she continued and she worsened sort of gave us a clue. And if you look at those, I mean, she didn't fit the ex full criteria. If you look at the scores, uh, the Naranjo et al scores, she didn't, uh, she probably lies in the probable category, but once she stopped the MEK inhibitors and continued with the prednisone, the fluid went away. So we were caught, we are calling this drug induced uh, based on that. But do you need the steroids then if it's really MEK induced? Do you actually, you don't, because shouldn't so, it go away? Well, there was a lot of fluid there. So I think probably we won't, we wouldn't know we, because we put her on the prednisone, but ideally if this was just plain drug induced, it should have gone away with just stopping the medication. However, I think if you look at the reports on drug-induced, uh, you know, uveitis, folks will treat with steroid. They will stop the drug and treat with steroid. So, Pooja, uh, we're seeing more and more cases of uh, uveitis of various sorts associated with checkpoint inhibitors. There's a large number of patients on those classes of drugs. And my question is, is the uh, ocular phenotype uh, the same for all checkpoint inhibitors, or does each drug have a characteristic different clinical manifestation? Uh, it seems like if the, the, there's a, a review that's just come out, uh, I think by uh, Emmett Cunningham, it's a very comprehensive review. And uh, really, if you look at the, you know, he, he's kind of grouped them together. Um, and most of them it, it isn't a particular agent. It's just a group that causes uh, you know, posterior uveitis, pan uveitis. Uh, so really no specific, and there wasn't a specific patient that had more propensity to develop it. So really hard to predict which patient may develop this type of reaction. So Pooja, your diagnosis here was MEK inhibitor induced. Is that, is that it? Is, is, I think we started out thinking that this was immune, 
um, and that uh, we stopped the MEK inhibitor because of the association. But I think the, the fact that she initially got better on high dose prednisone and then she worsened and we couldn't explain why the fluid got worse, the vision got worse. Um, and then we uh, kind of delved in deeper and realized that she was still on the medication. Um, and we thought maybe that was kind of a quasi clue why she had worsened uh, and we stopped it. So I think at the end of the case, we did think that, that this was drug induced. So it's interesting that the MEK inhibitors more commonly produce vitelliform type of lesions, a little bit different than your patient. And in those patients, you can usually continue the MEK inhibitor and it goes away by itself over time. Oh. Um, so that's a little bit different than the type of, you had some vascillary detachments there as well, not just the regular retinal detachment. Right. Great. Thank you so much, Pooja, for sharing that uh, case with us and for your wonderful talk. Thank you for the discussion. We'll move on now to our next speaker, who is uh, my colleague, Dr. Robert Hyde. Rob is also one of our former residents, our star residents at University of Illinois. He is assistant professor of ophthalmology and is our inherited retinal disease specialist. He received his BS from Yale with honors, followed by an MD and PhD at Case Western Reserve, where his thesis actually earned the Doctoral Excellence Award in Neurosciences. He did his ophthalmology at UIC and then went to Kellogg where he trained for retinal degenerative diseases and hereditary retinal disease. And so it's my pleasure today to welcome my new colleague and esteemed uh, friend, Dr. Robert Hyde, who will speak on how do I manage hereditary retinal degeneration patients. Good afternoon, and thank you for your attention today. My name is Rob Hyde. I'm a faculty member of the UIC Retina Service, and today I'd like to discuss with you how I manage hereditary retinal degenerations. Given the short format, I would like to frame this really just as a discussion of several core concepts in the management of patients with presumed inherited diseases. Many thanks to Dr. Lim for the opportunity to speak today. I have no relevant financial disclosures. So when we talk about inherited retinal diseases, we are talking about a very diverse and heterogeneous group of retinal disorders, some with systemic features and others without, some that present very early in life with poor vision and some that may affect people later in life and so on. This variety and overall rarity of these disorders can make just diagnosis and management of these patients. With a suspected inherited retinal disease, it has been my experience that abiding by three core concepts has been critical not only to obtaining the correct and timely diagnosis, but ultimately to providing the best care for the patient. So let's take the example of a patient presenting with a bullseye maculopathy. Here we can think of an extensive differential diagnosis from the presentation alone in various broad categories of pathology. This could represent a cone, comb rod, or macular dystrophy, either typical or as part of a systemic disease such as neuronal ceroid lipofusinosis, toxicity from med medications such as hydroxychloroquine, vitamin or nutritional deficiencies, and so forth. We could use a similar approach to a patient presenting with a peripheral pigmentary retinopathy as well. To distinguish among these possibilities, the first thing we do is no different from what you do. We start asking questions. And that brings me to my first concept, just know your strengths. Any physician should be able to take a relevant history. And although I know I sound probably like an old medical school professor from your first year physical diagnosis class saying this, Time and again, it has been critical to establishing the correct diagnosis. After obtaining a thorough history, I obtained multimodal imaging and perimetry. And here I'd like to emphasize the importance of autofluorescence. Finally, I utilize the full suite of electrophysiology testing we have available at UIC, as well as, of course, genetic testing. So clearly, when we think about a retinal disease with a genetic basis, we have to be equipped with the knowledge of challenges in a genetic diagnosis. This involves a team approach with genetic counselors and coordination with diagnostic services that can assist in testing. <clears throat> As an example, consider the following patient who presented to our clinic. This was an 18-year-old man with stable but blurry vision for several years and no known family history of eye disease. Fundoscopically, there were asymmetric, prominent, pigmented chorioretinal scars around the retinal vessel arcade, which were hypo-autofluorescent and corresponded to peripheral scotomas on perimetry. Interestingly, on OCT, we see that there was associated macular stesis, 
The differential diagnosis for this entity includes pigmented perivenous choriretinal atrophy, given the perivascular pigmentation and fairly preserved central vision. However, enhanced S-cone syndrome can also present with pigmentary retinopathy and macular stesis as well, but those patients typically complain of nyctalopia, which our patient denied. Finally, X-linked retinoschesis could be considered, but typically we do not see such pigmentation, and an extensive pedi pedigree did not reveal a history of affected males in the family. But with electroretinography, we were able to demonstrate that in fact there was interretinal dysfunction as evidenced by a reduced B to A wave ratio and reduced cone flicker responses, which are classic features of X-linked retinoschesis, which was confirmed with genetic testing demonstrating a pathogenic variant in retinoschesin, or RS1. Our next patient also demonstrates how careful utilization of ancillary testing can establish the correct diagnosis and treatment plan. This is a 41-year-old woman with no family history of eye disease who presented with worsening vision in the left eye. She had previously been treated as a, possible, as a patient with a uh, possible choroidal neovascular membrane with multiple anti-VEGF intravitreal injections in the left eye with improvement. Fundoscopically, there were yellow macular lesions in both eyes, more prominent in the left than in the right, which were hyper-autofluorescent and hypo-autofluorescent, respectively. On OCT, we see subtle increased hyperreflectivity in the right eye and a lobular drusenoid hyperreflective elevation in the left. There is no associated subretinal fluid. A prior fluorescein angiogram from two years ago was reviewed, which showed early hypofluorescence with increased hyperfluorescence in the late frame in the left eye and late hyperfluorescence in the right. This finding in the left eye had raised the concern for a choroidal neovascular membrane and led to treatment with anti-VEGF. However, in the absence of subretinal fluid, this FA pattern could also represent staining. And if we return to our fundus autofluorescence, note that the fluorescein hyperfluorescence corresponds exactly with the hyperautofluorescence in the left eye, as is seen in lipofusin-rich lesions that stain. This constellation of findings has been described previously in PRPH2-associated macular dystrophy. As this paper shows, clinically there are vitelliform lesions which stain on fluorescein angiography, but which may be hyper-autofluorescent or hypo-autofluorescent. When the lesion is confined to the outer retina, as it was in our patient's left eye and in this patient's right eye, it is hypoautofluorescent, but when there is inner retinal involvement, the lesions are hyperautofluorescent. This is PRPH2 associated macular dystrophy without a choroidal neovascular membrane. In general, this can be a difficult entity to diagnose and manage, as number one, these patients can develop CNVMs, and two, typically the yield of genetic testing is low in these patients. However, this patient did undergo genetic testing, which was confirmatory for PRPH2, which was responsible for many forms of inherited retinal disease, including what has been described morphologically as adult onset foveovitelliform macular dystrophy. The second concept that guides man management decisions is obviously related to the first, know your weaknesses. No test is perfect, of course, and we must be vigilant in our diagnostic wor workup as there are many challenges ordering <clears throat> What if I were to tell you that this patient was in fact 60 years old with 2040 vision? And so we may not be so sure of that diagnosis. Other entities, for example, pattern dystrophy can present in a similar fashion. And what to make of these other fundus findings? <clears throat> we can conclude that they're all macular dystrophies, but how do we understand the underlying genetic diagnosis? In fact, these are actually all examples of ABCA4 associated macular dystrophy. So in addition to recognizing our weaknesses in diagnosis due to the principle of variable expressivity, we must also recognize the limitations of the various genetic testing strategies that are commercially available. This next case illustrates. This was a four-year-old girl that was brought to our attention because she had been sitting too close to the TV for the last six months. The anterior segment was unremarkable and vision was decreased at 20 over 125 in both eyes. Fundoscopy disclosed diffuse peripheral pigmentation. 
Her medical history was notable for microcephaly and intrauterine growth retardation, but she had a normal postnatal development without intellectual impairment. We were able to capture a quick OCT through the right eye only, which showed paraphobial outer retinal atrophy concerning for rod cone dystrophy. We can consider the diagnosis of a pigmentary retinopathy in a four-year-old, which includes infectious and inflammatory etiologies in addition to various forms of inherited retinal disease, including non-syndromic retinitis pigmentosa, early childhood onset retinal dystrophy, and so on. And so we would consider further investigation with imaging, ERG, and genetic testing. But this patient had much of that done previously as part of a workup for microcephaly, including MRI, blood work, and genetic testing, with the exception of an ERG. So is there anything that we can add here to the story? Well, with regard to an ERG, the patient's family had, under, had already undergone much anxiety from having to do an MRI under anesthesia, and so was reluctant to do any further sedation. And what's the point in doing genetic testing when it's already been done? Well, when genetic testing is ordered by geneticists as part of a syndromic workup, in this case microcephaly, the first line diagnostic test is a chromosomal microarray, which surveys the entire genome but is not targeted to any specific disease. Thus, many genetic conditions, and in particular those that can cause a retinal dystrophy, can be used. And actually, we can do an ERG in clinic in a small child using a handheld system with skin electrodes. It has its limitations, but as long as a child can sit long enough for an OCT, then it is possible to obtain useful information about the rod and cone pathways. And in this patient, we found that there was uh, panretinal dysfunction consistent with rod cone dystrophy. And with that added information, we can narrow our differential to a specific genetic mutation in the gene KIF11, which had previously been shown to cause the phenotype of congenital microcephaly and rod cone dystrophy. However, when considering ordering testing for an inherited retinal disease, we also have to regard the fact that not all genetic testing panels for dystrophies are the same. There is a large list of commercial laboratories available which offer inherited retinal dystrophy testing. However, on the left is a list of genes covered by one commercially available service, and you'll note that KIF11 is not included on that panel. However, on a different panel, uh, KIF is included. This patient did, in fact, have a pathogenic variant in KIF11. Several categories of needs that my patients have presented me with. As you can imagine, the patient who presents for the, for the first time with a new diagnosis of an IRD is likely full of questions and uncertainty. That patient with a known diagnosis of an IRD who has concerns about losing something, such as a driver's license, needs far more attention devoted to that concern. On the other hand, the adult patient who has been, been blind for many years may need far less attention devoted to their visual concerns and may, for example, want to know more about genetic testing and the risk to family members. And <clears throat> the patient who presents with RP and CME, who is seen frequently to monitor responses to therapies, presents yet another need. And finally, there is the patient that is desperately looking to you for all of the information on clinical trials for which they may be eligible. And of course, we recognize that none of these categories is exclusive to each other. For the patient presenting with a new diagnosis of an IRD, I obtain a detailed history complete with a family history and pedigree, baseline ERG, visual fields, and fundus imaging, and I discuss genetic testing with every patient. I then discuss the genetic basis of their retinal disease and the natural history as appropriate, including a function of their, including a discussion of the current status of clinical, clinical trials. I then focus on the patient's functional visual limitations, which vary between the adult and pediatric population and genetic counseling. Thankfully, information on the current status of clinical trials is readily available at clinicaltrials.gov, and genetic testing and counseling are available through the Foundation Fighting Blindness's My Retina Tracker program. This is provided at no cost to the patient, and the insurance company is not billed for the testing and counseling. Finally, I make certain that all of my patients are aware of the resources to them through a low vision specialist, such as our partners at the Chicago Lighthouse. These services are invaluable to our patients at any point in the disease process in order to maximize their functional abilities and maintain their quality of life. And with that, I will conclude my talk. So, th so those are the main concepts I use to manage a patient uh, with an inherited retinal disease. I thank you for your attention, and I thank uh, Dr. McEnany, Dr. Park, and Dr. Jayasundra for their uh, mentorship throughout this process. Thank you.
Thank you so much, uh, Rob. That was a great summary and an excellent uh, way to approach hereditary retinal diseases. I see Jerry Fishman on the call. Jerry, any comments? Can, can you hear me? Yes, okay. loud and clear. Okay. Well, I, there's certainly been a revolution in terms of how we can manage, diagnose, and uh, hopefully more and more treat patients with these inherited retinal diseases. So I think you were, uh, Rob was wise to uh, underpin the importance of genetic screening. I think from a practical point of view is what uh, Rob and I and others uh, face with uh, are uh, patients uh, who come in and have been over-tested and uh, particularly in the electroretinogram. So one question, uh, Rob, I would ask you, uh, uh, what uh, is your strategy if, for example, uh, in a patient with retinitis pigmentosa um, that's newly diagnosed, patients and referring physicians would want to know, do you do an electroretinogram? When do you do a retinogram? When don't you need an electroretinogram? Let's first uh, relate it to retinitis pigmentosa because uh, on a relative scale, we have a lot of the, particularly those patients that we see. So what is uh, your way of hand, handling that? And I guess part two is uh, what are the cases uh, who uh, ultimately may have Stargardt disease but come in with just a few sprinkles uh, of uh, uh, small white spots. But let's do, deal with the ERG because that is abused a lot. Thank you, Dr. Fishman. I, I apologize for the audio and the transitions on some of those slides. I think it cut off one of the most important parts of my talk, which was to mention that the third concept in my management of these patients is know what your patient needs. And that is directly a quote from, from you, Dr. Fishman. So, um, but to, and, uh, so to answer your question though, um, a patient with a new presumed diagnosis of RP certainly does not need an ERG in my opinion, um, uh, especially when the pretest probability uh, that the ERG will be flat uh, is, is, is quite high in a patient with a high degree of peripheral constriction on their visual field. So I use the visual field as a measurement uh, to help me uh, guide uh, whether the patient would benefit from an ERG. Certainly if they've had uh, genetic testing done prior, that's already consistent with RP. Um, I think that an ERG may or may not have some baseline utility in, in, in terms of understanding the overall prognosis, but generally I, I, I follow the genetic testing uh, more so. Um, the place for an ERG, um, I, I find a little bit more for, for uh, utility in an ERG testing um, in when there's uncertainty about, is it a con, cone rod dystrophy or rod cone dystrophy to distinguish between these two, or is it a purely cone response? Um, I've had several patients that, uh, you know, there's so much variability in these conditions. The genetic testing would show that they should only have a cone rod uh, pathway uh, disorder, but in fact, it was purely cone. And we only picked that up from the ERG. Uh, and then finally, I think the, you know, safety, uh, the risk of a corneal abrasion with the Burien Allen uh, electrodes, which are commonly, have commonly been used for many years, um, is mitigated by the use of DTL electrodes, uh, which are made of a thin mylar fiber that goes against the cornea and uh, are much better tolerated uh, by patients. I always ask my patients, how did that go uh, when they had an ERG? And, and I find that um, it is in general much more comfortable for them without uh, mm -hmm. reducing uh, our diagnostic capabilities. Uh, your next question about uh, ABCA4 associated retinopathy or Stargard disease, I think that I have been shocked by number of patients who have just the most subtle findings, maybe only on an OCT. In fact, I saw a patient yesterday whose only finding was subfoveal atrophy uh, without flex or white dots uh, and who's a homozygous ABCA4 uh, carrier. Uh, so I find the value of genetic testing there is uh, tremendously helpful um, in establishing the diagnosis. 
Okay. The uh, one thing that I think needs to be emphasized is that the ERG, while an objective test, has can have a substantial variability. And so if you're going to follow an RP patient with an ERG, uh, you may mislead yourself and the patient because easily, and I'm quoting the data from uh, my work uh, with uh, uh, other individuals, that it can easily vary by 25% and sometimes even more. Uh, so you have to be very careful in interpreting the ERG for monitoring patients. And for Stargard uh, patients, uh, certainly again, you've underpinned the issue of the genetics, but uh, in, in terms of the testing procedures, I find infrared autofluorescence uh, as uh, very helpful in terms of monitoring the course uh, of the disease. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. I, I love autofluorescence. I, I found that it has been uh, very important in terms of following patients um, as it is much easier to co-register images than it is to uh, uh, parse out variability between ERG testing. Rob and Jerry, I'm curious for your RP patients. You know, we've seen in past studies that vitamin E causes a loss of some of the electrical response in the ERG, but perhaps vitamin A is helpful. Do you recommend vitamin A or do you not? I, I, Dr. Fishman, would you like to take that? Go ahead. You go ahead. I, I'm wary of prescribing uh, or giving advice on any vitamin supplements. I, I just recommend my patients have a, a balanced diet. Uh, if they have star guard disease, I uh, counsel them to avoid uh, uh, excess vitamin A. Thank you. How about uh, the light issue? Do you caution them to wear a sunglass? And uh, if so, uh, what wavelengths are most important to filter out in Stargard patients? I, I do recommend patients, um, you know, avoid direct sunlight or wear a hat or uh, or sunglasses when they're when they're outdoors, typically for uh, because of UV uh, light. But I um, I don't do it consistently. <laughs> So I have a question for both uh, both of you about uh, light and autofluorescence. So I know Dr. Fishman says he prefers the near infrared autofluorescence, um, and and I find that the blue light uh, in general, the, the the blue autofluorescence can be super um, sort of risky in my opinion. So do you tell them to try to get a green autofluorescence? Is that any better, or do you just stick with the near infrared to avoid? The issues with the light. Well, well um, Sam Jacobson's group has uh, modified uh, the, um, the otherwise standard blue light uh, measurement, which uh, you can still get the fine resolution. But uh, I just think, yes, from the safety point of view, potentially uh, unha unhampered by evidence, but still. Uh, meaningful. Uh, I, I use the uh, infrared, and um, it, it just seems counterintuitive if we're going to recommend uh, particularly blue light in terms of sunglasses. You want to filter that out because uh, that's uh, uh, where the pigment epithelium absorbs uh, maximally. And then here we then do this test at the bright blue light. Okay, it's a short uh, exposure, but it seems internally inconsistent. So I, uh, there have been enough studies using measuring lipofusin versus the, the pigment uh, epithelium, but uh, infrared, as I say, uh, is a good sensitive way of monitoring and uh, it uh, obviates uh, it not having problems with safety. Thank you so much, Rob and Jerry, for sharing your sage advice that we can take back to the clinics uh, to take care of our retinal degeneration patients. Thank you so much. It was wonderful. We'll move on now to our next speaker, um, who is Dr. Manjot Gill. Manjot was educated with her MD in uh, Canada and then uh, did her residency in the United States at Northwestern 
uh, and then went ahead and did a medical fellowship at Northwestern with Lee Jampol and a surgical fellowship at Mass Eye and Ear. Uh, she then uh, became a faculty at Northwestern where she is active in the faculty Senate and in the Feinberg Academy of Medical Educators. Uh, so let me show you a picture of Manjot having some slight technical difficulties here. There we go, there's Manjot. And I've asked Manjot to speak on lattice degeneration. What do I really need to do? Good morning. I'd like to thank Dr. Lim for the invitation to speak here today. The title of my talk is Lattice Degeneration. What do I really need to do? I'd like to acknowledge Kaysen Cooler for helping me put together this presentation. I have no relevant financial disclosures. Lattice degeneration is a common peripheral vitreoretinal condition that we all see in our clinics every day. It is defined as an abnormal thinning of the peripheral retina with overlying vitreous liquefaction and firm vitreoretinal adhesions at its margin. It is of importance because it can predispose to an increased incidence of retinal tears and detachment. When retinal defects occur with lattice, they are of two types, round holes and horseshoe tears, and we'll discuss this in much more detail later in the talk. Lattice is common and can be found in 6 to 8% of the general population, with a prevalence of up to one-third in myopes. It is typically asymptomatic. If patients do present with symptoms, it is usually due to an associated retinal tear or detachment, and the diagnosis is usually made on a dilated fundus exam with or without imaging. What are some of the clinical features of lattice? It is important to note that despite the name, lattice lines are not required to make the diagnosis. Lattice should really be considered for any lesion whose borders demonstrate an abrupt and discrete irregularity of the otherwise smooth retinal surface, as defined by Bayer in his seminal paper in 1979. Also, the appearance of lattice is usually variable and can present with different morphologies, even in the same patient. Some of the common clinical features of lattice are listed here, including pigmentation, thinning of the retina, and branching white lines. Most of the lattice lesions we think of are ovoid, with the long axis running parallel to the aura, as shown in this photo. Wide field imaging can be very helpful to detect and document lattice, as shown in these images. This photograph demonstrates an area of typical lattice degeneration with retinal thinning characterized by a color change. There are also pigment clumps and cross-hatching of sclerotic vessels. This is an example of lattice lines with hyperpigmentation. Here's an example of lattice with depigmentation. This is an example of snail track degeneration, which is generally acknowledged to be a form of lattice degeneration. Here you'll notice the frosted yellowish white flecks. There's a specific clinical variant of lattice, that is perivascular lattice, which occurs in a radial configuration typically adjacent to retinal vessels. This is important as it is associated with a much higher risk of retinal detachment than compared to circumferential lattice. Here's a color photo demonstrating perivascular lattice, which we'll discuss in more detail later. There are several theories about the etiology of lattice, including anastomosis of embryonic vasculature, localized retinal ischemia, to developmental anomalies of the internal limiting membrane. But whatever the etiology, the histologic studies of lattice degeneration are very consistent, demonstrating retinal thinning, vitreous liquefaction, and tight adhesions at the margins of the lattice lesion, as shown in this cross-sectional view on the right. There are a few other conditions that may appear similar to lattice to consider in the differential diagnosis. They're listed here and include cobblestone degeneration, retinoschisis, atrophic retinal holes, chorioretinal scarring, and congenital hypertrophy of the RPE, and finally white without pressure. So who is really at risk for lattice degeneration? We've already seen there's a higher prevalence in myopia compared to the general population, and there's also increased incidence in connective tissue disorders such as Marfan syndrome, as well as in the hereditary vitreoretinopathies of Stickler syndrome. Patients with Marfan syndrome are known to have excessive lattice degeneration, 
with detachment seen in up to 25% of patients. Rigorous screening and follow-up is crucial for these patients. As mentioned earlier, there is a special form of radial perivascular lattice that is typically seen more posteriorly and carries a higher risk of retinal detachment than compared to circumferential lattice. It can be incidental or associated with Stickler syndrome. This is a reminder of what perivascular lattice looks like. A few words about the inherited vitreoretinopathies. These are congenital abnormalities of the vitreous with severe degeneration, early onset cataracts, and predisposition to retinal detachment. The most common to consider is Stickler syndrome, which is autosomal dominant and characterized by progressive radial perivascular lattice-like degeneration. Retinal detachment is estimated to occur in up to two-thirds of these patients, and prophylactic treatment should be considered early in life. This is a patient with Stickler syndrome and extensive radial lattice degeneration. So ultimately, the biggest risk associated with lattice degeneration is that of retinal detachment. It is estimated that 20 to 30% of patients with retinal detachments have evidence of lattice, but it should be noted that studies measuring the converse, in other words, the risk of a retinal detachment developing in a patient with lattice degeneration, have shown a fairly low overall risk ranging from 0.3 to 0.7%. So how do these detachments associated with lattice degeneration occur? It is due to one of two mechanisms. The first is an atrophic retinal hole where there's progressive thinning with a cuff of subretinal fluid developing from an overlying pocket of liquefied vitreous. It's estimated that the overall risk of retinal detachment in a patient with lattice associated with an atrophic hole is very small at less than 0.3%. This is a patient with four atrophic holes surrounded by a subclinical retinal detachment, which has remained stable for over 30 years. The second and more common mechanism of retinal detachment is due to tears, usually following a posterior vitreous detachment. It's important to note, however, that not all tears occur adjacent to a lattice lesion, which suggests that these eyes may be at a generalized increased risk of retinal tears overall. The overall risk, however, of retinal tear occurring adjacent to a lattice lesion is still very low at 1% incidence after 10 years in Byer's study. Here's a schematic depiction of how tractional tears form, beginning with firm vitreoretinal adhesion at the borders of lattice, followed by vitreous separation that leads to a tractional tear. This is a color photograph depicting a large tractional tear associated with the retinal detachment. It is reassuring that the overall prognosis for patients with lattice is generally favorable, as most patients will have stable or very slowly progressive lesions. This was demonstrated again by Bayer in a natural history study of 423 eyes who were followed for an average of nearly 11 years. He reported an incidence of atrophic holes in about one-third of eyes, with 6.7% of these eyes having subclinical retinal detachments. He also found an incidence of tractional retinal tears in 1.9% of patients. So what can you tell patients with lattice about their retinal detachment risk? First, overall, they are at very low risk for retinal detachment. In Bayer's study, he found subclinical retinal detachment in 6.7% of eyes with atrophic holes, and over the course of follow-up, only 16 of the 423 eyes followed developed a new subclinical retinal detachment, indicating that patients with lattice are at very low risk for progression to clinical retinal detachment. Furthermore, a clinical retinal detachment was seen in only 3 out of the 423 eyes, an incidence of less than 1%. It is important to emphasize that the greatest risk for retinal attachment in eyes with lattice degeneration is the same as in all other eyes, at the time of or soon after the diagnosis of PVD. So what then are the guidelines for treatment? In making the decision to treat, the risks of treatment have to be weighed against the possible benefit of reducing the rate of retinal detachment. A Cochrane review in 2014 showed that no randomized clinical trials have, done, have been done to support the treatment of asymptomatic lattice degeneration. As such, there is no indication for solely prophylactic treatment of lattice in the absence of symptoms, holes, tears, or detachments. Also, a major limitation of prophylactic therapy is that the cause of breaks that lead to retinal detachment during a PVD occur in areas that appear normal prior to the PVD, and these accounted for half the tears in Bayer's study. 
It is therefore important to educate patients on symptoms of PVD and retinal detachment, as well as emphasizing the need for regular follow-up exams. To be specific then, atrophic round holes within lattice lesions that are accompanied by minimal subretinal fluid and no PVD do not require treatment. For subclinical retinal detachments, prophylactic treatment should be considered when the detachments become symptomatic or show signs of progression. And younger myopic patients with lattice degeneration with holes should be followed regularly to monitor for subclinical retinal detachments that may slowly enlarge. Because a detachment occurs in eyes with lattice when a PVD induces a horseshoe tear, these tears should be treated with laser demarcation. Here's an example of laser surrounding lattice on the left and surrounding lattice with a horseshoe tear on the right. What do we do with fellow eyes of those with retinal detachment? In patients with lattice and history of retinal detachment, the fellow eye has 2 to 5% incidence of detachment over 7 years. So if the fellow eye has a PVD and there's no break, then no prophylactic treatment is required. If there is a tractional tear, the risk of detachment in the fellow eye has been reported to be up to 17% and treatment is appropriate. No guidelines currently exist, however, for the management of a fellow eye without a PVD. And all of this is reflected here in this chart from the preferred practice guidelines for management of retinal lesions. So when weighing the risks and benefits of treatment, other risk factors for retinal detachment should be considered, including high myopia, recent cataract surgery, and a personal family history of retinal detachment. One of the scenarios that comes up often is what to do in the setting of cataract surgery. In one study, eyes with lattice degeneration and postoperative PVD showed a higher incidence of post-surgical retinal detachment of 21% compared to eyes without lattice degeneration at less than 1%. So the development of postoperative PVD in eyes with lattice should be considered an important risk factor for the development of retinal detachment following cataract surgery, and these patients should be counseled appropriately. There is, however, no level one evidence to support prophylactic laser to lattice degeneration prior to anterior segment surgery. Instead, these patients should be evaluated by a retina specialist prior to surgery. In summary then, one would treat expanding subclinical retinal detachments and horseshoe retinal tears with lattice degeneration. You would follow closely atrophic retinal holes in eyes with lattice degeneration, and there's no consensus about treating fellow eyes with lattice that do not have a PVD. Here are a list of my references. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Manjot, for that excellent review of lattice degeneration. I do want to make one correction. I think I said that Manjot went to Northwestern for residency. No, she did a residency at University of Alberta in Canada and her fellowship at Northwestern in Medical Retina. Uh, thanks again, uh, Manjot. Thanks, uh, Jenny. Can I ask uh, uh, Manjot a question or two? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I thought it was a very well reasoned uh, presentation. Uh, but he, he, the point I wanted to make relates to Stickler syndrome. Uh, several geneticists in the Midwest have pointed out that although Stickler syndrome is considered a rare disease, it may be the commonest, the commonest cause of regmentogenous retinal detachment in the upper Midwest, where Chicago is, of course. And my experience with Stickler syndrome has been that uh, one can uh, get uh, slightly misled when looking at all the patches of lattice particularly because they're unusual and, as you pointed out, radially uh, oriented. But as a, in addition, they often have isolated dialyses of individual aura bays, one aura bay or several aura bays. So it's very important to do careful scleral depression, uh, regardless of the presence or absence of the number of lattice degeneration at the equator. The aura serrata is at risk of causing major retinal detachments. And there's been several studies uh, suggesting strongly that uh, those types of problems, that is dialyses of various aura bays and aura teeth, are a shoot on site uh, issue in which one should do prophylactic cryotherapy or laser therapy if one can get peripheral enough with a laser. And I think that's probably wise, uh, wise because of the very high rate of rigmatogenous retinal detachments in those patients. I actually have one question as well. Um, 
And it, it relates to snail track regeneration, which I've never understood. And I wonder, Majata, if you can tell us if their clinical course and prognosis of snail track is identical to traditional lattice uh, or not. Um, you know, I really didn't find too much in the literature that really differentiated it. Um, it's basically, they just consider this to be a clinical variant um, of the presentation of lattice degeneration. So I think it just really gets lumped together with, um, with garden variety, kind of what we consider, you know, lattice with the lattice lines in, uh, in all of the natural history studies. So there really wasn't anything that I came across specifically that... Um, that delineated whether it has a different course or should be treated differently than um, standard lattice degeneration. So I remember um, Mark when we were residents for the high myopes and you know when we were concerned about sticklers that you would always recommend we put a glove on and then you know check for a cleft in the palate. Can you elaborate for the people watching today? Well, you've got a great memory. It, it's a very easy uh, trick that helps in the diagnosis. I've actually seen several patients who were presenting with retinal detachment or extensive lattice, and they were not known to have Stickler syndrome. A Stickler syndrome is characterized by mid-face hypoplasia as well as joint arthro uh, degeneration throughout the body. But the issue here is with the face, and there's often a uh, cleft palate. Well, if you can open the mouth of your patient and look in with the light of your index ophthalmoscope, you can usually see a cleft palate. But uh, what you're pointing out, Jenny, is that several patients have a submucous cleft in the palate that is not visible. And the only way to pick it up, as you said, is to put on a rubber glove and put your forefinger along the edge of the hard palate, or soft palate, sorry, and see if you can feel a... Uh, uh, a, a subclinical or submucous cleft in the palate. It's a very easy thing to do. It's a great way to detect undiagnosed Stickler syndrome, which changes the prognosis for the detachment and changes the prognosis for the general health of the patient. I, I think the other point about the lattice and these Stickler's patients is that it's not felt to be congenital, but um, can progress during early childhood. So. Um, so these kids should be examined at very frequent intervals, and then treatment really should be happening very early in life, you know, as early as age two. Great. Thank you so much for sharing those pearls with us, Manjad and Mort. Uh, we'll move on now to a break. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a good break. Uh, we're going to be moving on now to our next speaker, Dr. Nadia Wahid from Tufts University. Nadia Wahid is a, an associate professor of ophthalmology at the Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston, where she's the director of the Retina Research Fellowship at the New England Eye Center. She is also the director of the Boston Image Reading Center. She has not only an MD, but also a master's in public health. She graduated from Aga Khan University, uh, summa cum laude, and then went uh, to medical school there as well, where she graduated with honors. She was then a resident at Mass Eye and Ear as well as a fellow, and then was on faculty at the Cleveland Clinic until she was recruited to Tufts University. She is one of the foremost experts in ocular imaging, especially OCT and OCTA. And uh, Nadia has been awarded the Max Society Young Investigator Award for all of her research in this area. So it's really my pleasure to welcome you, Nadia, today to speak on how do I use OCTA in my retina practice. Good afternoon. Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking you for inviting me um, here again. Uh, this is one of the most fun meetings um, that I that I attend, and um, just really nice that it's still happening in the virtual format this year. Um, and I will speak to you today about how I use OCT and geography in my clinical practice. Here are my financial disclosures. The relevant ones are marked in yellow and include OptiView, Heidelberg, NIDEC, and Zeiss. So OCD angiography is a non-invasive way of performing retinal angiography. It takes about three to four seconds per eye and is really made possible because of the higher speed and resolution of the newer generation OCT machines. 
So you acquire successive uh, OCT scans of the same area uh, of the retina. Uh, and really the only thing that should change between these uh, successive scans is blood flowing through the back of the eye. Now you can't see this with your eye, but when you do advanced computational analysis, looking for differences between these two scans, and if you map them out over here, the red pixels represent areas of blood flow. And you can do this in successive B-scans and generate a vascular map of the back of the eye. Now some of the characteristics of OCT and geography images that make them uniquely suited for uh, their purposes in clinic are that they're depth resolved. Um, and so you can separate out the different layers of vasculature. They're extremely high resolution compared to traditional uh, dye-based angiography. And you can see that over here, which enables you to visualize and quantify changes in the microvasculature. OCT angiography images are also registered to the structural OCT scans from which they're derived. So in this patient, for example, you can see that this vascular structure on the ANFAS uh, OCT angiography image seems to be related to this blood flow underlying the pigment epithelial detachment. So pretty much all of the commercial device manufacturers at this point have OCT angiography integrated within their platforms. Most are spectral domain devices with a few swept source available commercially. The advantage of the swept source uh, devices are that they are better at visualizing macular neovascularization uh, and faster, so easier to obtain wider fields of view, but of course the compromise is a much higher cost. So let's go over the various different disease modalities in which I find OCT and geography useful in my clinic. And, and the first one uh, that I'm going to speak about today is, um, is diabetic retinopathy. Studies on OCD and geography show that changes uh, in the microvasculature are identifiable early on in the disease um, and get progressively worse as the disease progresses. And these include both enlargement of the foveolar vascular zone as well as development of areas of ischemia. So while traditional diabetic retinopathy grading uh, lumps people into relatively large buckets, the ability to visualize vascular changes on OCD and geography, as you can see in this patient uh, over time, enlarging foveal vascular zone and increasing ischemia means that you can get more granularity with regard to disease progression in these patients. So OCD and geography is really useful in the diagnosis of macular ischemia. Uh, here's a patient of mine, 38 year old with type two diabetes. So this patient's macular edema was treated with anti-VEGF therapy and he got better, but his vision um, topped up at about 2040. And as you can see really nicely in the OCD and geography, he has very significant macular ischemia that is limiting his visual acuity. So OCT and geography is also invaluable in identifying areas of retinal neovascularization in patients uh, with proliferative diabetic retinopathy and in delineating and measuring and following up these areas. Uh, so for example, in this patient with NVD and NVE, you can see regression after treatment with anti-VEGF. I also find wide field OCT and geography incredibly valuable in screening some of my diabetic patients um, and in looking for small areas of ischemia, IRMA, and neovascularization that may otherwise be missed on, a, on just a routine eye exam. In other retinal vascular diseases, OCD and geography is invaluable in making the diagnosis as well as identifying the level of retinal ischemia. Here is a patient, for example, with a branch retinal artery occlusion where you can see uh, the loss of uh, the retinal vasculature. And another patient with a branch retinal vein occlusion where you can see both the ischemia as well as the tortuous vessels at the margins of the BRBO. But OCTA is perhaps most useful in the diagnosis and follow-up of patients with macular neovascularization. So let's look at some interesting cases. Here's a 47-year-old woman with a known macular scar who comes in complaining of metamorphopsia. And while her fluorescein is somewhat equivocal with regard to leakage, when you look at her OCTA, it's quite clear that she does have macular neovascularization. Here's another case, a patient with a history of central serous choroidopathy with a low-lying pigment epithelial detachment on examination, the fluorescein is equivocal, but the OCT angiography very clearly shows flow signal underlying the pigment epithelial detachment and the ANFAS OCTA uh, delineates the area of macular neovascularization. 
You can also use OCTA to monitor response to treatment. Uh, MNVs will generally shrink uh, in response to anti-VEGF in advance of resolution of subretinal fluid. Here's another interesting case. A 31-year-old patient of mine with the diagnosis of central serous choroidopathy in the left eye, uh, diagnosed for the first time, uh, was followed up for three months with no improvement. And you can see here on the OCT that there is subretinal fluid with a little uh, bump in his retinal pigment epithelium. Fluorescein angiography is equivocal for leakage, but very suspicious. And the OCT angiography is confirmatory with flow signal underneath the pigment epithelial detachment and visualization of uh, the macular neovascularization on the ANFAS image. And after treatment with bevacizumab, you can see a reduction in flow through the vessels of the neovascularization. So here's an interesting case. This uh, woman came in for a second opinion after being diagnosed uh, with macular neovascularization in this asymptomatic right eye. Um, what you can see over here is this characteristic draping of the ILM and a subsidence of the outer retinal layers. Her OCTA is very characteristic for macular telangiectasis. So you see uh, that the vessels are pulled over onto one side and you see a subsidence of the vessels uh, from the inner and mid retina into the outer retinal layer. This is not uh, macular neovascularization, but is very characteristic for MACTEL. So here's another uh, case. It's a 48 year old man with a history of uh, central serous diagnosed six months ago and a visual acuity of 2030 in the in the right eye you see that this patient has a little hot spot uh, just superior to the to the fovea this patient was followed up over time uh, and uh, still continued to have subretinal fluid uh, he was given uh, some oral spironolactone and, and followed up uh, two months later and and the subretinal fluid persisted now, we did an OCTA, and as you can see on the OCTA over here, uh, it was actually identified that he had a small area of uh, macular neovascularization. This patient was then treated with anti-VEGF agents, and as you can see, 30 days post the anti-VEGF, uh, the subretinal fluid resolved uh, completely. Okay, so here's another interesting case, and this is a case of non-exudative neovascularization. So it's a 58-year-old Asian man, followed for dry macular degeneration, uh, no visual complaints. As you can see on the OCT scan, this patient appears to have these shallow elevations of the RPE. These have been subsequently called the sire sign, shallow irregular RPE elevations by Robin Geimer's group, and they're very suspicious for non-exudative uh, macular neovascularization. And of course, on OCT and geography, uh, you, do, you see that area of macular neovascularization underlying the RPE detachment. This is important because as described by uh, the Rosenfeld group, the risk of conversion uh, to exudative MNV over the course of the next one to two years is actually quite high in these patients. Okay, so this is a patient we're following for dry MD. On fluorescein and geography, nothing but staining of her drusen. However, OCD angiography shows a non-exudative macular neovascularization, appears to stay stable over time. A year and a half later, a suspicion of a small satellite lesion over here, and then you can see this patient becomes exudative and develops subretinal fluid. So now that I've shown you how valuable OCTA can be, how do you adjust it in clinic? And well-trained technicians and good process delineation are absolutely key. So to summarize, OCTA is a multidimensional imaging modality that's very useful in the diagnosis and follow-up of a variety of retinal vascular disease, especially diabetic retinopathy. But it's absolutely, I think at this point, indispensable in uh, patients with macular degeneration and in the diagnosis of macular neovascularization. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Nadia, for that wonderful talk on OCTA. It was really, really great. Um, I have a question to start it off. When you're seeing a patient, say with CNBM suspected in AMD, do you jump to the OCTA? And if that is confirmatory, then no longer do a fluorescein angiogram? Um, pretty much, uh, Jenny. I think um, I, I think we were mostly moving towards fluorescein becoming just difficult to do anyhow. So at this point, we do an OCT and an OCTA. 
um, you know, and look at the OCT and geographic images. And, and as long as the OCT, OCT are confirmatory, I then don't get um, fluorescein anymore. Great. I've been starting to do that as well. And, and I, you know, I loved your images too, where you show the NVD beautifully on the OCTA. We've done that as well um, at UIC. Yeah. And I, I think you probably, I don't know what your experience has been, but I just find that sometimes, um, you know, with NVD or even with CNV, you can just see it more clearly than if you're just looking in and you can document it and kind of follow it up over time, which I find is, is really useful. Yes. Nadia, I, I want to add a disease to your list where OCTA is invaluable. And then I want to say something critical about it. But uh, this was a case we recently published where there was a large uh, yellowish, some possibly calcified lesion, like a mulberry in the optic nerve head. And we couldn't tell by ophthalmoscopy or fluorescein whether this was a, a hematomatous malformation, an astrocytoma or giant drusen of the disc. And the OCTA clearly showed that the mass was uh, heavily vascularized, which would not have been expected in just giant drusen. So good for OCTA. But I have to admit that I personally have a lot of trouble interpreting the, uh, the deep vascular slabs in the sensory retina and also the corio capillaries. And, um, because of all the uh, artifacts with projection artifacts and signal strength issues and so on, and my own inability to recognize the patterns of ischemia that I'd like to be able to recognize, I wonder if you think that artificial intelligence may be the way to go in interpreting OCTA images. So that's a, that's a great question, right? Because um, I, I agree, same as you, I think that interpreting the deep capillary flexes is, is especially challenging because of all the projection artifacts that um, you, know, you get as well as the signal strength issues. I, I think it's more difficult in spectral domain than it is in sweat source. And then the deeper you go, the more difficult it becomes. Um, and and you know, people have used various kinds of um, artifact removal softwares, but what they do is they, over remove the artifacts and then you have black streaks on the on the OCTA image instead of um, you know instead of really being able to see the vasculature and I think it especially becomes a problem when you're trying to quantify um, these vasculatures to follow these diseases up over time and, and maybe do some of the you know studies and correlate to some of the you know beautiful histopathologic work that's been published um, so so I do think that um, or just like you were saying that um, you know, potentially machine learning AI will, will be a pathway forward. Because um, I think people have tried um, just regular software so to try to remove um, these artifacts. And it's quite challenging, right? Because they vary quite a bit over um, the, you know, the image and depending on signal strength and, and um, you know, uh, op media opacities uh, versus um, something like machine learning could probably do a, a pretty good job at adjusting for all of those point to point on the image. So, um, Joelle, I know is here. Joelle, get to it. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, machine, uh, machine learning has a lot of promise, but uh, it's very interesting because um, we had this discussion regarding OCTA, and one of the things to tackle is that there's a huge variability in the image quality in of OCTA, and some thought are like it's very premature still in, in putting uh, OCTA as inputs in the algorithm, but I see the point of how to use AI to improve on the quality and kind of delineate the biomarkers that we really are interested in looking at. So That's another question for you, Nadia, if you had to advise somebody on which machine to buy today, uh, what would it be both for private practice and for an academic institution? Which, which machine will give you, for example, uh, the biggest or the widest image of the fundus? So I think, um, you know, which machine to buy is a difficult question because just um, just like you said, um, you know, the, their capabilities vary uh, and the cost varies as well. So, um, you know, if you're looking for the biggest and widest image, then you probably want to go with a, with a swap source platform because it enables you to image wider over shorter periods of time. Um, how many millimeters is that? So I think the commercial devices right now are doing at least 15 by 15 um, by, you know, on swept source, and that's two acquisitions um, uh, stitched together. They're also doing, you know, five 12 by 12 acquisitions stitched together. So that kind of gives you about a, you know, I think a 22 millimeter or so across and a 22 millimeter vertically. 
uh, which is actually, I think, reasonably good because the resolution is so high that you're able to start seeing some of the, you know, non-perfusion, et cetera, that you would want to see. But, but I also think that some of the um, spectral domain devices have been very innovative around being able to, um, again, montage images um, together um, to be able to generate those wider fields of view, right? So, um, I mean, I think competition is such a great thing um, that it's out there that all of these device companies are competing with each other to get the best, brightest images and using software enhancements and machine learning enhancements um, that you could choose a machine today and then, you know, three months down the road, find that another machine is, device has come up with a better algorithm to get wider fields of view. I think it's, it's really hard. They're all, they're all up there, I think. So, so Jenny, I'd like to introduce more of a note of skepticism here. So when we go to the meetings, we see all these beautiful images and they're magnificent and we think I'm going to get the machine and I'm going to get images just like that. And um, for DRCR, we've incorporated OCTA in all of our recent studies. But, but when we looked at the quality of the images, taking into account the things that Mort Goldberg just mentioned, but particularly signal strength, um, very many of the images are not usable for the clinical trials or to assess progression. Um, the second point of skepticism is, uh, um, Nadia, forgive me this, for, forgive me for this, but in most of your cases, I could tell the information that you discern from the OCTA, from the B-scan OCT, uh, or other factors that I could see in the pictures, and I really didn't need OCTA to, to make the diagnosis on some of your cases. So I think, uh, as we pointed out in the future, it's going to be more and more useful but I don't think it's essential now for the practice of um, retina at this moment. So, okay. So maybe about I, all, Nadia. <laughs> I do agree that OCT is probably the most um, transformative imaging modality that we've had, right? So if I had to choose between doing an OCT versus doing an OCTA, I do a structural OCD every single time, right? But I think it can be really useful for a confirmatory where you're, you're looking at, you know, like a low-lying um, pigment epithelial detachment and you're thinking, is there neovascularization in there? I see the features, it should be there, right? Um, and, and then you do an OCTA and, that, and, it, and it's there and you see it, right? So like fluorescein angiography, which quite honestly for the longest time has just been confirmatory and not really diagnostic. You can see everything pretty much outside of, you know, um, or infer most things outside of perhaps early ischemia in an OCT and never really need to do a fluorescein except to look at the periphery. Um, but for macular lesions, you don't really need to do very much of a fluorescein. I think OCTA is very similar. It's confirmatory, but rarely, um, the you know, rarely in isolation with it cinch the diagnosis for, for in a clinical setting. And probably the swap source that you work with has just such better resolution. I mean, you know, you get much better images than we can get with a regular commercial, regular OCTA for the most part. For probably. sure. And the segmentation algorithms are also a huge issue, right? I mean, yes. the segmentation is all over the place. The, the signal strength piece has, you know, issues. Uh, I mean, I think OCTA right now is where time domain uh, OCT was. Um, you know, many years ago, um, Lee, and, you know, a few years down the road, um, you know, as the devices become more and more sophisticated and the software as an AI, as Mort was mentioning, gets applied to us, we'll, we'll start getting, you know, we'll start perceiving of it as, as indispensable. I think it's, you know, it's not, as you know, it's not completely there yet. Yeah, so even in papers submitted for publication that I get to review, there often are artifacts that are misinterpreted um, and, Sometimes those go through and get into prestigious journals saying things that, that are not true. So. For sure. We'll wait to see what the future brings us, improved machines, improved resolution, and perhaps AI brought to OCTA. Thank you so much, Nadia Lee Mort, for all this exciting discussion. Uh, we're going to move on now to um, our next speaker who's Dr. Amani Fauzi. Amani has her fellow in the operating room right now. So we're gonna, that's why we're doing the schedule a little bit um, different from what's listed. Uh, so it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Amani Fauzi as the next speaker. Amani was one of my fellows at USC, one of my best fellows ever. Uh, she is a vitreoretinal surgeon and clinician scientist and the Cyrus Tang and Lee Jampol Professor of Ophthalmology at Northwestern uh, Feinberg School of Medicine. She sees patients, but she also does a lot of NIH-funded research and I believe has an R01 and is a co-PI and another R01. 
And she's been recognized for her imaging work. She also received the Maxwell Society Young Investigator Award and um, is very much known for her work on OCT, OCTA, AO, and other imaging modalities. And she serves on editorial boards of numerous scientific journals in this capacity of her expertise. So let me now pull up Amani's talk here. Good afternoon. Today, I'd like to share with you our results in studying the retina in Alzheimer's disease. And I'd like to thank Jenny and the group for inviting me to participate in this meeting. So these are my disclosures, which have no relevance to this topic. So our current understanding of, of the progression of Alzheimer's disease is that by the time the patients manifest the dementia of, con of Alzheimer's with severe cognitive de decline and failure of uh, function of daily life, they have been already for years accumulating these uh, deposits, these uh, pathologic markers of Alzheimer's disease that are uh, am amyloid related and tau related. And it's not until um, the manifestation of dementia that we are able to diagnose them. So the field has moved towards a more preclinical diagnostic state, finding these biomarkers early using non-invasive imaging to identify them, as well as identifying clinical high-risk characteristics. One of those uh, high-risk clinical states is amnestic MCI, where subjects have uh, some level of loss of memory that is very specific for Alzheimer's. And then earlier on than that, people are accumulating these biomarkers in their brains uh, and are completely asymptomatic. And in my view, the retina imaging belongs in this area here where we could detect or help detect these patients early before dementia onset. So the final and definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's is only made of at, uh, at autopsy by documenting these plaques and tangles. However, preclinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's is made by amyloid label PET scanning, which is an invasive and very tedious process leading to the image interpretation by a specialized individual or by using CSF biopsy and uh, assaying for amyloid and tau in the CSF. Both of these uh, form the current state of preclinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's. So what do we know about Alzheimer's effects on the retina? So when uh, studies were done in uh, donor uh, patients who donated their brains after death and, and when the eyes were examined, there was significant neuroretinal degeneration, uh, optic nerve axon degeneration, and loss of the macular ganglion cells in these eyes. And this is work that was done at USC by Hinton and Blanks in the 80s and 90s. When uh, people looked for amyloid deposits in the retina, it took a while to find them, but most recently the, the group in uh, cedar sinai found that there are retinal amyloid plaque depositions in, in these individuals with uh, Alzheimer's dementia, so end-stage Alzheimer's. The retina also has gliosis, proliferation, hypertrophy of the macro and microglia, and this was shown by Blanks in uh, 1996. And there's also some imaging that has been done in this area. So using OCT in advanced uh, patients with Alzheimer's dementia, the nerve fiber layer uh, thickness was uh, shown to be decreased. There was loss of retinal ganglion cells. And the group uh, uh, in Cedar sinai has also shown possibly amyloid plaque deposition using curcumin labeling in vivo. However, these have not been yet validated by other, group, other groups. And vascular alterations in the form of decreased blood flow, increased tortuosity has been, have been shown in uh, using Doppler imaging and other color fundus photography. But how about the presymptomatic population, the population that I've told you is now the target for uh, increased uh, vigilance to try to, to identify the disease early. And so these are patients who have evidence of amyloid plaque by imaging, but are not yet symptomatic to the point. So using OCT, there's been a whole lot of research in this population. And unfortunately it's been very controversial. So as some studies found a decrease 
thickness of the nerve fiber layer in these individuals. Others have found no difference. And in our hands, we found that the retina was actually slightly thicker. The nerve fiber layer was slightly thicker in these early preclinical Alzheimer's. We have some ideas why that may be, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Amyloid plaque deposition in the retina has not, to my knowledge, been shown in this preclinical population. The idea that retinal gliosis can be a marker of Alzheimer's is uh, somewhat new, and, and I'll show you some of our data. And we hypothesize that that's the reason why the nerve fiber layer may actually be thickened in these early stages. And finally, I'll show you our results uh, with OCT angiography regarding the vascular alterations in Alzheimer's. So in this um, vascular study, we looked at 16 subjects with amnestic MCI, which is this high risk uh, enriched population that is generally thought to have a 40% risk of progression to Alzheimer's over three years. And we recruited 16 age matched controls from the Alzheimer's disease uh, research consortium at Northwestern. And these subjects were matched with age, gender and race. Uh, to each other. We performed OCTA imaging of the macula and the disc, and then we analyzed this data looking for vascular density and adjusted flow index, a surrogate marker for blood flow in the macula and optic nerve. And we looked at this uh, ring, the parafovial vessel density, and we focused on the superficial retinal vessels that are in tight uh, contact with the ganglion cells and the astrocytes, as we thought these would be the layer most likely affected. And we also looked around the optic nerve in the superficial layer. And what we found was that these early uh, uh, impairment subjects has significantly decreased parafovial macular vessel density and flow in the inner retina, as we had hypothesized, and that the cognitive impairment in these subjects was significantly correlated with the vascular density. So this excited us about using OCTA potentially as a biomarker uh, for uh, early disease onset in this population. Next, we wanted to look at gliosis. As I told you, we found that the retinal nerve fiber layer may actually be thickened in individuals with early stages of uh, preclinical Alzheimer's. And we hypothesized that that may be re related to reactive astrogliosis in the inner retina. This is a very important hallmark for Alzheimer's in the brain. As you can see here in green, this is an amyloid plaque and it's tightly surrounded by these red astrocytes that are reactive and in, in, in engulfing or su surrounding this amyloid plaque. And this is a very active and highly regulated process in the brain, and very tightly regulated. And as amyloid plaques increase, astrogliosis increased. So in the retina, we have a way to look at the inner retinal astrogliosis, and that is by adaptive optics scanning laser ophthalmoscopy. This study from uh, the Joe Carroll group had looked at a wide variety of uh, patients with retinal disease and found that there is reactive gliosis, these cellular um, growths on the surface of the retina in a wide variety of, ret of retinal and neurologic disease. So our purpose here was to examine the inner retina of these subjects with early um, preclinical stages or presymptomatic stages of Alzheimer's and correlate them to the degree of their vascular. So using adaptive optics in our population, we again recruited a similarly matched, uh, age matched in the, uh, population of controls and performed uh, ad adaptive optics imaging on the cognitively impaired population and the controls. And again, these were gender, race, and age matched. And this is an example of what we see in the inner retina in a healthy individual. You could see here a retinal blood vessel with the retinal nerve fiber layer bundles overlying it in a very organized and clear fashion. You could see individual bundles radially oriented in a very regular fashion. And then these images were montaged and they were masked and graded by two individuals who were masked to the diagnosis. And they looked for alterations on the surface of the retina, counted them, measured them, and compared them to the relevant uh, OCT locations. 
And this is the most interesting finding here. These are uh, what we call granular membranes on adaptive optics. As you can see, they're tightly adhering to the retinal blood vessels, which is where we accept, expect uh, astrocytes to be located as well. So they're uh, growing on the surface of the retina, obscuring the retinal nerve fiber layer bundles and growing in a tangential fashion. And we find them to be hyperreflective structures over 50 microns in dimensions. They look like a clustered uh, sand uh, surface and they may have satellite features uh, as shown here in the blue arrow. And so we measured them, quantified them. And then when we tried to see if, if we can also see them on OCT, we found that they could be very subtle. Uh, there are these areas of thickening of the inner retinal layer, some of them on the surface of the retina or in relationship to the hyaloid that could be seen, but they are super subtle and not as easily detected on OCT. And these, thickenings and gliotic changes are what we hypothesize uh, are the cause for not being able to find a decrease uh, in the nerve fiber layer in these early stage disease states. And so here's the quantitative data. When we looked at the nerve fiber layer, uh, as expected, there was no difference between a healthy and, a, and an affected individual with no statistical difference as we had shown before. And then when we looked at the granular membranes, we found that the number and area of these membranes were much higher and significantly higher in, in cognitively impaired individuals. We found that there was a very strong effect size for the uh, number and size of these membranes in the cognitively impaired individuals. And we compared the number and area to the cognitive cognitive performance, which is uh, on this uh, Montreal Cognitive Assessment Scale. And we found there was a negative correlation. So the more membranes, the lower the cognitive performance, showing a very moderately strong correlation between uh, these membranes and the cognitive performance. So in summary, this, these results show that these are there are these hyperreflective granular membranes that can be visualized better on adaptive optics. They're larger in number and greater in area in cognitively impaired subjects. And they may be associated with worse cognitive performance. We hypothesize these membranes are a manifestation of astrogliosis on the retinal surface. And they can potentially mask the underlying loss of nerve fiber layer and thinning in these individuals of early cognitive impairment. Next, um, I'll summarize the, the blood flow studies. And here we found that the superficial capillary density in the optic nerve and in the macula are impaired more significantly in the macula in these individuals. And that there was, again, a strong correlation between the vessel density and cognitive impairments. So overall, our results are very indicative of, uh, of an effect on the retina in these early individuals and excite us about future studies. And with that, I'll thank you for your attention. And I'll thank uh, my main collaborator, Dr. Sandy Weintraub at the uh, Alzheimer's Disease uh, Research Group at Northwestern. Mm -hmm. Thank you again for your attention. And thanks to Jenny and the group at uh, UIC for inviting me. Thank you so much, Imani. That was fascinating work that you presented to us. You know, I was curious that you showed that the FAZ and the parafoveal density was decreased in the eyes uh, or were decreased in the eyes that had Alzheimer's. Do you think that sort of goes along with the multi-infarct nature in some of the cases of Alzheimer's or are these not related to vascular? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, in our data set, we did not have uh, amyloid PET scans. So I think if we had had those, I'd have a stronger uh, a, a stronger response, but basically it's, it's very hard, you know, any vascular disease will cause a decrease in the, in the vascular layers of the retina. And we tried very hard to exclude uh, clinical retinal disease and glaucoma and, and those things that we can actually uh, uh, sort of ascertain ourselves, but we did not have a brain uh, PET scan to see if the amyloid load really uh, could correlate with these findings. That would be the next step. We were gearing up to do it, and then the pandemic sort of uh, mm. postponed everything. 
But what about looking for direct clinical pathologic correlation? These are old, sick people, and their eyes should become available. Ah, that's <laughs> And I've been uh, I've been lobbying our group here at Northwest, and I think they're much uh, much um, it's much easier for them to ask for brain donations than to ask for eye donations. And I've been lobbying them to try to begin to ask for for the eyes along with the brains, but it, it hasn't happened yet. I've been no no one will say no to you. I'm sure of that. <laughs> you can be very convincing. Thank but here, here's another question for you on the blood flow studies. Yes. Do you see? Uh, differential features between the blood flow abnormalities in Parkinson's disease versus those in Alzheimer's disease? And if so, what are they? That's a great question. We have not looked at Parkinson's disease uh, yet, uh, or, or you know, we hadn't thought about Parkinson's disease, but there's so many overlapping features with, with Parkinson's and Lowy body disease and uh, other dementias. So it's, it's a very interesting area for us to look at, but we haven't started yet. I mean, there's so much going on in the neurology world. And I think we have to catch up and start looking at these diseases and try to make the retina sort of a feature in the, in the, in the evaluation of these patients. That's well, one final question about uh, Alzheimer's. You, you probably know that Sharon Fekrat at Duke has published an interesting paper with OCTA and, and claims that um, there is a specific finding in Alzheimer's disease patients, which is uh, diminution of the vascular bed in the choroid in the subfoveal location. And I wonder whether you've made similar observations. So because of all the things that you talked about with the signal strength and the artifacts and the, and the decreased intensity and the uh, signal decay in the choroid, we have not looked at the choroid. We're afraid that we might pick up an artifact in that area. Uh, I, I, I would... I would um, but would thinning of the choroid be an artifact? Um, I, I think they should. Is it blood flow or, or actual uh, thinning of the core? Thinning of the choroid under the macula. Oh, oh, oh. Then, then that would not be an artifact for sure. That would be a very interesting finding if it were to, if, if it could be validated. But I also worry that it could be an age related thing. So it's very hard in those patients if you have a, an older population, unless you go very deep and try to match them. So let's say, you know, you're, if, if your control group had a, uh, an Asian population that was thicker in thickness or something like that, if they weren't totally matched to, to race and, and background, I, I worry about looking at the core because we know that there are racial and, and gender biases in the core that may be there un, undetected. And time of day. And yeah, and drinking and, 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 and coffee and being hydrated. I mean, the choroid can vary so much. Thank you both for that great discussion. Uh, yeah, still indulge me. I know we're late on time, but I, I do want to, I have to tell you the story, Imani, because when I was a resident, Dr. Goldberg had this family of adverb patients and he coined the term, you know, autosomal dominant vitro, what is it? Vitro retinopathy, adverb. And so he had this patient who agreed to donate his eyes when he passed away. So as residents, we had to carry this pager whenever we were on call. And for residents on the call, yes, we took in-house call in those days and it was busy. So if you were the first year resident, you carried that pager around. And if that patient passed, it was your job, you know, to somehow or other, we had to get the eyes, right? Right, more That was, that yeah, was our job. Absolutely. And yeah, and it happened. It actually happened. You got your eyes. So, Amani, it can be done, and you can get your residents to carry a pager for you. I, I don't think that can both would approve of that. <laughs> I mean, you know, you'd be surprised for research. Some patients, you know, would, would do it. You know, we've had eyes donated to us with AMD. But anyway, just as an aside. With ACGME rules and how the world is changing, it might be a political problem in our department. <laughs> But you just have to pay somebody to carry the paper. That's the difference nowadays. That's probably much better to do. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Jenny, Thank you. can I Sorry? add two, yes, yeah. two, two, two stunner pearls? Our, our last month, uh, uh, now's meeting. CSF Venus fistulas from, of all things, uh, imitating Alzheimer's from a simple bone spur from osteoarthritis. That's of course age dependent, but the other one is not. And 
har harbors our worst fears from the uh, pandemic, there has been, there have been, I should say, anecdotal cases of CSF leaks nasally from turbinate damage from the uh, testing for COVID. Great, oh. our, our biggest fear. So nothing um, pub possible for publication yet, all anecdotal, but really important for us to help our uh, family practice uh, colleagues because uh, they they look at many Alzheimer's patients as, as toys. And this is completely a, a completely reversible confusion by a blood patch. So just just two things for us to all know about. I see. I think what Chloe was saying in this day and age, where they swab the noses of <clears throat> patients for COVID and some of the older patients, um, they no, hit yeah. the it's, and it's cause not age, not age dependent. It's any age. Oh, any age and caused a leak. So just be aware of that because then they could have some mental status changes that could be attributed to Alzheimer's when in fact it was a CSF leak. Is that right, Chloe? Yes, and the bone okay. spurs in the osteoarthritis patients to press the pass on our neurosurgery. Okay. Great, thank, thank you for sharing that with us, Chloe. We'll be aware of that possible complication from nasal swabbing. Um, Amani, thanks so much. Dr. Goldberg, thanks so much. We're going to move on now to uh, Dr. Bill Mueller. Now, Bill was in a meeting. I'm not sure if he's done yet. So we gave him some time so that he can hopefully be here for the live Q&A. Uh, so <clears throat> without further ado, we're going to go to Bill's talk uh, here. And I've asked Bill to talk on identifying unusual posterior segment tumors. So hello again, uh, Bill Mueller back for part two, this time talking about uh, unusual entities and the differential diagnosis of interocular tumors. Uh, similar to my earlier presentation, I have no financial disclosures. And in this presentation, I want to thank Carol Shields for use of several select CT images helping to document the appearance of some of these conditions that we're gonna be talking about. We see a vast array of conditions that resemble tumors, in some cases are tumors, but we try to get a pinpoint diagnosis. We use history taking, indirect ophthalmoscopy, echography, OST imaging to try to be as specific as possible. Occasionally, as with lymphomas, we obtain tissue, in this case, more commonly via a fine needle aspiration biopsy for diagnostic and prognostic purposes and occasionally for genetic analysis as well. Different diagnosis is really quite vast, ranging from certain tumor conditions like hemangiomas, metastases, osteomas, melanocytomas, other processes that are more inflammatory in nature, whether it's uh, uvula effusion, nodular posterior scleritis, um, inflammatory granulomas, other pigmented lesions like chirpy, hypertrophy, uh, peripheral exudative hemorrhage carotinopathy, and things like idiopathic uh, sclerocardial calcification, and finally, uh, vascular conditions like visual proliferative tumors, cavernous, capillary hemangiomas, combined hematomas, etc. All these things can make for a challenging diagnostic situation. Gold standard that'll be melanoma. Uh, pretty much a very quite straightforward diagnosis. We can be uh, accurate in about 99.7% of our diagnoses with a combination of indirect ophthalmoscopy combined with echography reflectivity, spontaneous vascular activity, typical appearance of a melanoma. Distinguishing the melanoma from anemus can be challenging. It's mainly based on size, and we look for features that might be re predictive of growth. OST helps us here, documenting subretinal fluid, coital shadowing, compression of the coital capillaris, possible pigmentary uh, RP detachment, and even a gentle rolling round contour. Uh, the collaborative ocular melanoma study along with Carol Shields pointed out conditions that we look for or features that we look for to determine if a lesion may have a greater chance of growth, overall thickness greater than two millimeters, presence of subretinal fluid, the patient has symptomatic visual impairment, presence of orange pigmentation, yeah, or yeah, the factors for a greater chance of growth. If all five of these are present, then there's I'm about a forty percent chance yeah, of time frame that this lesion may grow or change into a melanoma. We also have pigmented lesions involving the optic nerve, melanocytoma of the optic nerve. Uh, this is more jet black in appearance, tends to be quite flat, fibrillated borders, rarely change. Much more equal frequency in terms of both whites and blacks in contrast to most melanomas are in Caucasian patients. The angiogram will block. Echography usually not performed because it's minimal thickness. Oftentimes there is a contiguous nevus. You see here four examples of optic nerve melanocytomas which have not changed for years occupying a portion of the nerve, oftentimes with a contiguous nevus, very safely monitored with just observation alone. 
<clears throat> Mac generation really comes into a differential diagnostic entity of concern, but sometimes you have a case like this where there's hemorrhage. It may look like a melanoma, though echography shows heterogeneity, medium high reflectivity, angiogram of block fluorescence. It's pretty easy to tell this is a hemorrhage and not a cancerous condition. Current metastases occur oftentimes bilaterally in about a third of cases, um, multifocal in nature, almost always post your pole. Oftentimes they have suffering a fluid out of proportion to the size of the lesion. Rarely exceed three millimeters in thickness, and for the most part, there's a history of breast and or lung cancer. But when there's no systemic history, this can be a challenging diagnosis. It may require a biopsy or certainly a very thorough systemic assessment. Here's a patient that was found to have breast cancer, was treated with radiation, and did very well. Curly meangiomas occur in one of two forms, either focal or diffuse. When the lesions are focal, it's a pretty easy diagnosis. A reddish orange lesion occupying a portion or adjacent to the optic nerve. Echography has high reflectivity. Most lesions are dome shaped, smooth margins, no uh, shadowing of the chorio capillaris. In contrast, those that have a more diffuse pattern oftentimes have a history of Serge Weber syndrome. Reddish color compared to the fellow eye, which appears more orange. Echographically, there is oftentimes diffuse thickening in the choroid. Once again, the combination of the history with the features makes this a quite simple diagnosis as well. Choroidiosteomas occur generally in young females, bilateral in roughly 20%, contain calcium. Echography shows lamellae, bone tubules, calcium, sponge-like material, as you see here on the OCT at the bottom right. Young, young lady here, five years old at presentation, over a 10-year time frame. More calcified pigment modeling, but still 20-25 vision. Echographic features compatible with that of an osteoma, and the patient did well over the 10-year follow-up. Other lesions can contain calcium as well, idiopathic scleral calcification, but this is more along the vascular arcades, more multifocal calcium salts, maybe associated renal diseases, Gittleman and or Bartner syndrome, or hyperparathyroidism. Echography shows shadowing, and OCT will show either a rolling appearance like you see on the top or a mountaintop configuration as you see on the bottom. Uh, so once again, these calcific spots are away from the optic nerve, generally along the arcades with quite diagnostic OCT appearances. There's also this process called solitary idiopathic choroiditis. This doesn't really have calcium, but a little area of depigmentation, kind of a rolling appearance on OCT, oftentimes in the posterior pole region, and once again, different than an osteoma or different from idiopathic sclerochordial calcification benign, safely observed. Nodular posterior sclerosis is an intriguing diagnosis. Uh, oftentimes the patient has some degree of systemic inflammatory disease, some degree of ocular inflammation, but it may be fairly subtle. We will see a positive T-sign on echography where there's thickening of the uh, choroid sclera, a little fluid in between a so-called positive T-sign. Corticosteroids are the therapy of choice. These patients melt, these lesions melt away very nicely and the patients do well with long-term follow-up. Ventilal vascular vascular obliterative tumors uh, generally occur inferotemporally in the eye, secondary to parsimitis, retinitis pigmentosa, or other vascular conditions. More common in females, almost always occur inferotemporally. Pathogenesis not known, but in general, the combination of anti-vegetative therapy, occasionally focal laser, these patients do well. Systemic evaluation is always warranted, but for the most part, these are isolated and do not really, are not associated with other known systemic concerns other than the associated with conditions such as retinitis pigmentosa. Curdle attachments, a pretty easy diagnosis. Uh, most times following ocular surgery or trauma, maybe associated hypotony. Echography shows a fluid-filled space. There may be some hemorrhage, of course, as well. The curdles, of course, may become appositional, may contain hemorrhage. But in general, if there's not too much hemorrhage, these will glow with translumination, making the diagnosis quite simple, and for the most part, not to be confused with a cancerous type condition. Uvia effusion syndrome is an anomaly of the sclera. Middle-aged males, eyes tend to be nanothelmic, often occur in multiple quadrants, respond occasionally to corticosteroids, though sometimes require drainage, sclerostomy, sclerectomy, surgery. Uh, in this case, we used mitomycin C. This uh, went away, the patient did well has done well over the span of about a uh, five-year time span. This condition, peripheral exudative hemorrhagic retinopathy, one of the more confusing diagnoses with that of a melanoma. This occurs in the elderly, mid-periphery, oftentimes is more multifocal, spots of elevated choroid, hemorrhage. Uh, this uh, is diagnosed through clinical appearance, through echography, observation. Occasionally there's breakthrough hemorrhage, but that's pretty rare. 
These have become fibrotic. For the most part, patients do well with no threat to their general health. A lens can drop from its position, rest on the retina, can become fibrotic with time. It can be confusing when seen for the first time, but echographically, of course, it shows just a, a hollow lesion, basically, and of no significance other than just monitoring. If the lens has been lying there for a period of time and it's not inducing inflammation, it can be very safely watched. Retinal macrocysts are pretty rare of this size. This one filled up about half the eye from a retinal detachment. It was undetected. We found the tear, treated the detachment, flattened the retina. This melted away on its own. Did not require drainage per se. It just got small and went away on its own. You see it on the top, preoperatively, on the bottom after a couple weeks after the surgery. Varix the vortex ampulla, a very intriguing diagnosis. These spots can enlarge with valsalva, with change in gaze direction, with pressure on the eyelid. Uh, it's really kind of a cool thing to watch in the clinic. Echographically, you can see the changes dynamically. Once again, nothing has to be done here except just observe. Clint hermartomas can involve the RET and RPE, comprised of vascular tortuosity, pigmentary changes, epiretinal membranes, for the most part observed. Stay away from surgery here because this involves not only the uh, preretinal tissues, but also they go into the retina and deep in the retina. These are really almost impossible to remove surgically. Simulhamartoma is a very unique diagnosis, darkly pigmented, like someone has shot them through the RPE. This elevation off the edge of the fovea. There's about 10 reports in literature, all the same. These can be very safely watched. They rarely change or progress. I perked for the RPE, once again, chirpy, uh, very flat, lacunae, flattened uh, OCT for the most part, safely observed. Rarely will this transform into a um, RPE adenoma or adenocarcinoma, but that is incredibly rare. And finally, this familial adenoma to this polyposis, these little dark spots in the periphery, little halo pigmentation pointing toward the posterior pole associated with colon cancer, part of Gardner syndrome. Recognize this as different from multifocal chirpy. This has a life-threatening significance. Hemorrhage, of course, can obscure these lesions, so make sure that if you can't see in the eye, get a good echogram to make certain there's no mass beneath the hemorrhage. So to summarize, we've talked about a number of clinical entities that may resemble a posterior segment tumor. The correct diagnosis can be established in most cases with history, indirect ophthalmoscopy, echography, and with SDOST imaging. Occasionally biopsy is required. I love seeing these kind of patients. It's uh, very rewarding to be able to establish a diagnosis. But I agree sometimes these are quite challenging, so I'd be happy to address any questions you may have. And thanks once again to Dr. Lim for the opportunity to present at this conference. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Bill, for those beautiful images and sharing those uh, diagnoses with us. Uh, Bill, are you back from hey, your Jen, I got back about two minutes ago. So awesome. I, um, I heard the last couple minutes of my talk. I didn't have to address any questions. Okay. I just want to bring up one thing, though. It's, uh, I referenced about five uh, articles under those case reports. And those are five residents that have done case reports of these rare conditions. Just so, you know, once again, these are things that we'd love to see, love to try to piece together. So I want to thank the residents that uh, partook in those case reports as well. Great. Thanks, Bill. So when you see a patient who has a lesion in the eye, pigmented lesion, and, and it's not, it's definitely not a melanoma, say, and it's definitely not, you know, hemangioma. It's one of those maybe benign lesions. When will you next see them back? You're seeing them for the first time. Um, it depends what I think it might be. Um, for example, the simple hamartoma, like Andrioli kind of help, help piece that together. We realize that's not going to change probably six months, 12 months. Okay. If someone has something that, uh, might evolve into a, you know, if melanoma is in a differential diagnosis, probably two to three months and then six months and just kind of double the time frame. But it's so dependent upon what's in the differential. Right, right. Thank you. I, can I make one more quick announcement here? Sure. So the reason, the reason I was gone here, I, I, I sat on the ad hoc committee to help select the next distinguished professor at UIC and going through the list of people who had have gotten in the past Jerry Fishman. So Jerry, congratulations. Oh, that goes back yeah. to about 1993 or four, but I saw your name there and it was a feel good. So congratulations, Jerry, once again. Congratulations, Jerry. So th thank you so much, Bill. And, uh, you know, for those of you on the call, Bill and I are putting together a book uh, called um, Case Series in Medical, Case Studies in Medical Retina. So if you have unusual cases, we're looking for them. You know, we want a quick case report and a write-up differential, and I, we can send you the um, the algorithm for it. Uh, so, Jenny, I was back here, but I got to go again, so I'm not quite done, <laughs> but I broke away, so, but thank you. Okay, thanks, Bill.
All right, thanks. thanks for, okay, great. Uh, so we will move on now, if there are no further questions, uh, to our next speaker, who is my colleague and friend, Dr. Jason McEnany. So let me pull up Jason's picture here for you. So Dr. McEnany is an associate professor of ophthalmology and director of clinical psychophysics at Electrophysiology Laboratory at UIC. He joined our department about 10 years ago as a member of the research faculty, and he has several NEI grants. And one of them is looking at the mechanisms of early functional loss in diabetic eye disease. He's a great collaborator, is also working on some uh, mechanisms of visual loss in X-linked juvenile retinoschisis, as well as other hereditary uh, retinal diseases. Today, however, he will be speaking specifically on the diabetic early disease findings. Hello, my name is Jason McEnany, and I'm an associate professor of ophthalmology here at UIC. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to thank Dr. Lim, both for her help with this project, and also for giving me the opportunity to share some of our results with you today. So I'm gonna to talk to you about retinal function in early stage diabetic retinopathy. A diabetic retinopathy is the most common cause of blindness among working age adults. The disease is typically defined by changes in the retinal vasculature, but there is evidence of neural dysfunction that can precede the clinically apparent vascular changes. Our current classification systems focus exclusively on vascular abnormalities and edema. It's known that diabetes can impair the neurovascular unit, but approaches to quantify neural abnormalities have not been well established. So our group has been interested in defining early stage neural dysfunction. And we've done this using a variety of different techniques, including psychophysical measures, measures of the pupillary light reflex, and also measures of the electroretinogram or ERG. Now the ERG is a mass electrical response generated by the retina that we can obtain non-invasively in human subjects. So today I'm going to tell you about the nature and extent of flicker ERG abnormalities in diabetics who have mild or no NPDR. In this project, we recruited 20 visually normal non-diabetic controls and 40 patients who had type 2 diabetes. Half of the patients had no clinically apparent retinopathy, the other half had mild NPDR. Now some of the patient characteristics are shown in the table below. They were typically in their early 50s, and the no-DR group and the mild NPDR group had similar A1C levels. Only two patients had a history of treatment with an anti-VEGF agent. In our lab, we record the ERG using a fine fiber electrode that sits in the lower eyelid in contact with the cornea, as shown in the upper left panel. The stimulator delivered using a Gonsfeld photostimulator, as shown below that. We can record the ERG at a broad range of flicker frequencies, but today I'll just tell you about two frequencies. The first is at the International standard rate of 31.25 Hertz, as shown here, it looks something like this. And the second frequency is at a higher frequency at 62.5 Hertz, which is double the international standard and looks something like this. So this trace represents the average flicker ERG response obtained at 31.25 Hertz from our visually normal control subjects. You see that for each stimulus flash, there is a trough and a peak. And here are the results for the two diabetic groups. Diabetics with no MPDR are shown in green. Diabetics with mild MPDR are shown in red. Now, as you can see, the flicker responses were similar for all three groups. If you look carefully, however, you can see that both diabetic groups had slightly smaller peak amplitudes than the control group. In addition, the diabetic group with mild NPDR had a slight delay in time. However, there are really only small differences among these three groups. Here are the results for a flicker ERG recorded at 62.5 Hertz from the control subjects. Once again, each flash of the stimulus generates a trough and a peak. And here are the results for our two diabetic groups. Again, the diabetics with no NPDR are shown in green, Diabetics with mild MPDR are shown in red. Now you can see there are considerable differences in the ERG waveforms for the two diabetic groups compared to the controls. Both of the diabetic groups had smaller flicker ERG waveforms. We can quantify the flicker ERG response by measuring the amplitude from the trough to the peak. We could also measure the peak time. On this slide, I'm plotting 
the 31.25 Hz amplitude on the left, and the 31.25 Hz timing on the right. Each circle represents a different subject, with the control subjects shown in black, the DM no DR group in green, the DM mild DR group in red. As you can see, there are really no significant differences among these three groups. And that's also the case for timing. The timing is also very similar among the three groups. However, if you look carefully, there is a slight timing delay for the no DR and the mild DR group compared to the controls. But these differences were found to not be statistically significant by ANOVA. And here are the results obtained at 62.5 Hertz. I'm showing the amplitude on the left and the timing on the right. So now in this case, we can see that there are considerable differences among the three groups. The amplitude for the control subjects was larger than that for the no DR group or the mild DR group. In fact, there was about a three decibel difference between the control group and the no DR group, which is about a factor of two. The differences were even larger for the mild NPDR group. These differences were found to be significant by ANOVA. In contrast, there are no significant differences in timing among the three groups. So the abnormalities that we see are confined to the 62.5 Hertz amplitude. The diabetic retinopathy can be staged according to the extent of vascular abnormality and the presence or absence of diabetic macular edema. So we can think of this in terms of a two-dimensional plot, where the x-axis could re represent the retinopathy stage, ranging from no DR to proliferative DR. The y-axis could represent diabetic macular edema. So here I'm showing our 40 diabetic subjects plotted on, on this scale. So 20 of the subjects fall here at the intersection of the X and Y axes. These patients had no clinically apparent retinopathy and no diabetic macular edema. 18 of the subjects fall here. These subjects had mild NPDR and no macular edema. And the final two subjects fall here. These patients had mild NPDR and mild macular edema. So as you can see, this is not a particularly useful way of plotting the subjects because they all tend to fall into one of three groups. So here I'm showing another way of classifying these subjects. As before, I'm plotting the extent of macular edema on the y-axis, retinopathy stage on the x-axis, but now I've added a third axis. This axis represents the extent of neural dysfunction as measured from our Flickr ERGs. So now you can see that within this no DR group, shown in green, there's considerable variation in the level of neural dysfunction. Likewise, within the mild NPDR group, there's substantial variation in the level of neural dysfunction as well. We could define some range, for example, two standard deviations below the mean, and we can consider these patients to be abnormal. And these are the patients that we would be concerned about because these patients have significant measurable neural dysfunction. So why might we want to do this? I think that considering neural dysfunction in the definition of diabetic retinopathy might have a couple of advantages. First, we can better subtype patients for inclusion in treatment trials of neuroprotective agents. The idea being that patients who have measurable neural dysfunction would most likely benefit from treatment with neuroprotective agents. In fact, there are recent trials of neuroprotective agents in early stage diabetic retinopathy. Uh, we can also use these measures of Flickr ERG, or measures of neural dysfunction more generally, as an outcome for future clinical trials. Second, we may be able to predict the progression of NPDR based on neural abnormalities. So can we use the high-frequency Flickr ERG to predict the progression of NPDR? All the data that I've shown you so far were obtained about three years ago. And since then, we've gone back through the records of the subjects that we've tested to see if any of them had returned for routine follow-up care. So as a reminder, we had tested 40 subjects with diabetes. We found that 27 of them had come back for routine follow-up care. Of those 27, 11 had an abnormal flicker ERG, about 40% of them. We can subdivide those 27 patients into those who had progressed versus who those who have remained stable. We found that seven of the 27 progressed in NPDR stage. Remarkably, six of the seven had an abnormal ERG at the time of testing three years ago. The other 20 remained stable. Of these 20, 
five had an abnormal ERG as measured three years ago. Another way of looking at these data is to plot an ROC curve, and that's shown to the right. So this plot shows the sensitivity of the high frequency flicker test as a function of one minus specificity. The black curve maps out the ROC function. The area under this curve is 0.8, which is significant. The sensitivity of the test is 86%, the specificity is 75%. So this tells us that the high frequency flicker ERG does a good job of predicting which patients will go on to develop more severe NPDR versus those that will remain stable. But I should emphasize, this is a very small group of subjects, only 27 individuals. So we need to repeat this test in a much larger sample to validate it. So to conclude, we find that diabetics can have a considerable loss of flicker ERG amplitude when measured at high temporal frequencies. We also found that neural dysfunction can be useful for expanding the classification of diabetic eye disease. And this might be of interest for a couple of reasons. First, we can use neural abnormalities as a tool to select patients for inclusion in treatment trials of neuroprotective agents. So these drugs will be delivered early on in the disease process before the clinically apparent vascular changes occur. Second, we may be able to use neural abnormalities to identify which patients are most likely to progress. And this in turn might allow us to triage patients and also to tailor the timing of routine follow-up visits. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Jason. That was a great talk and really exciting research. Um, you know, while people are getting their questions together, I have uh, two quick questions for you. Have you looked at the OCT to see whether the nerve fibers were thinner on these patients? I know Tom Gardner as well as others have shown that neural dysfunction occurs early on in diabetes. That's the first question. Um, maybe we'll take that first and I'll give you the second question. Sure, so I think the typical finding is that the thinning is in a, in a ring around the fovea. So it's a relatively small area of the retina right that's abnormally thin in, those, in the patients. And that's not gonna be reflected in a full field ERG. So we have looked at ERG changes as a whole separate study that we're looking at, um, but we've not compared them directly to the full field flicker ERG because it's not it's sort of apples and oranges. I see. You know, and then the second thing would be, have you considered using this as part of the programming into the AI algorithms for DR progression? No, I had not considered that, but maybe that's something that you all can talk about. Uh, Joelle, what do you think? You're muted, Joelle. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, I think for sure we should definitely consider including those in addition in algorithm inputs. I think, uh, Jason, it could be a great uh, opportunity to explore. Yeah. Um, I just had a, a comment. I think that this is a nice example of when a basic scientist uh, collaborates with clinicians and clinically related problems. This uh, is also a good example of a well done uh, study. Uh, Jason, I'm just uh, curious, uh, have you looked at oscillatory potentials? The reason I ask is what I know you're aware of with Wachmeister uh, pointing out abnormalities with oscillatory potentials. I wonder if they have any correlations uh, with what you're finding. And although I can intuit uh, a response, well, why do you think uh, it accentuated uh, with the most uh, frequent frequency that you use? And more so than the 32. Right, so we, we've been interested in where, why this flicker deficit, deficit is occurring. And we think it's actually driven largely by photoreceptors. So the measure that we're getting from the flicker ERG is uh, generated uh, by the bipolar cell, but it's actually shaped by the cone response. And we can predict pretty well the flicker deficit based on cone ERG abnormalities. So we, we think that that's one site at which diabetes is, is working at the, at the cone photoreceptors. Now the amacrine cells generate the OPs primarily. So there's a second site that we think that diabetes is acting. So it has both inner retina effects and outer retina effects, if that makes sense. And they're not necessarily correlated. So patients can have cone photoreceptor loss with normal OPs and normal amacrine cell function or vice versa. And the second part, I'm sorry, well, why is it the flicker? Um, so we, we also see high flicker frequency deficits in other patients who have cone dysfunction like juvenile excellent retinoschisis and also in some RP patients. 
as you know, the high frequency flicker ERG can be more affected than the 30 hertz flicker. So as we continue to increase the frequency, driving the retina at higher and higher frequencies, the deficit becomes greater. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, for sharing your research with us. It's exciting, and I look forward to um, more data coming out of your lab. Thanks again, and thanks, Jerry, for the stimulating discussion. We'll move on now to our next speaker, uh, who I'm pleased to present, uh, Dr. Joelle Halleck. So Joelle is a member of our research faculty, and she is one of my friends and collaborators in the department, and I'm really happy to collaborate with her. She is an assistant professor of ophthalmology and co-executive director of the Artificial Intelligence and Ophthalmology Center. She's also the director of the Ophthalmic Data Science Laboratory at UIC Ophthalmology. She's an epidemiologist with expertise in the development of predictive and explanatory statistical modeling techniques for personalized medicine applications in ophthalmology. And so I've asked Joelle to speak to us today on AI for screening our patients. Hello, everyone. First, I would like to thank Dr. Jennifer Lim for this great symposium. My lecture today is titled AI to help you screen and manage patients. I would like to disclose that part of the work presented in this talk is funded by a Bright Focus Foundation grant. This talk will briefly discuss three main topics, AI for disease classification, segmentation, and progression predictions. I will briefly discuss these learning tasks in the context of patient screening and management. I will also go over some of our work for AMD applications, specifically our AI pipelines for progression predictions, the talk will then end with challenges and future directions for deployment. Classification learning tasks involve assigning an image to different categories by disease type or disease stage. These tasks are typically used for automated diagnosis, screening, or staging. An example is the automated detection of diabetic retinopathy and macular edema in front of photos. As you know, in 2016, the Google Group published a seminal paper in JAMA showing promising results of their deep learning algorithm in detecting diabetic retinopathy and diabetic macular edema from retinal fundus photographs. In 2018, the FDA approved the first medical device, which was developed by Dr. Abramoff and his team to use AI to detect greater than a mild level of diabetic retinopathy in adults who have diabetes. In a recent study from the Singapore Eye Research Institute, the authors developed a single modality deep learning algorithm for the detection of disease-related visual impairment with the goal of creating a referral system in vision care. Performance of the classification algorithm is shown in the figure to the left. In the internal test data set, the AUC for the detection of any disease-related visual impairment was 94.2%, and the AUC for moderate or worse disease-related visual impairment was 93.9%. Across the five external data sets, the algorithm achieved AUCs ranging between 86.6% and 93.6% for any disease-related visual impairment, and the AUCs for moderate or worse disease-related visual impairment ranged between 85.9% and 93.5%. The images on the right represent the saliency maps that highlight regions that the algorithm focuses on when predicting disease-related visual impairments. This is particularly important to improve on the interpretability of such algorithms. The first row shows the maps for cataract, the second row for diabetic retinopathy, the third highlights the areas that the algorithm looks at for age-related macular degeneration, and the last row for glaucoma. Now we move on to describing AI for disease segmentation. In computer science, image segmentation refers to the process of dividing an image into segments or outline groups of pixels that represent a meaningful entity. Automated segmentation methods became popular in retinal imaging in the early 2000s, starting with fundus photos, which, which now you can highlight features such as blood vessels, microaneurysms, drusens, exudates, the optic disc. More recently, deep learning algorithms have shown success in segmenting retinal layers of STOCT images. Success has also been shown to highlight and extract biomarkers for intra and subretinal fluid, and more recently for drusen, pigment epithelial detachment, geographic atrophy features, and photoreceptors. The figure to the right shows a custom deep learning based segmentation method developed by my collaborator, Dr. Fao, that we have been implementing in some of our studies. It provides a six layer segmentation which highlights the inner retina, outer nuclear layer, photoreceptor inner and outer segments, retinal pigment epithelial drusen, and choroid. 
The unfast projections and thickness maps generated based on these segmentations are shown also as well in the figure to the right. A second network is used that is passed on these six layers that are first achieved from the first network to highlight the se segmented regions of geographic atrophy, which is shown in yellow, peripapillary atrophy, the red outline, and the optic nerve head, the green outline. Similar to classification scenarios, now we'll describe some of the AI methods and algorithms used for disease progression. AI can be applied to predict different attributes or the future outcome of a treatment from one particular image. Um, we've used baseline imaging and patient metadata features um, to predict progression of uh, certain ophthalmic diseases. But what is more valuable is the use of longitudinal data to capture the evolution of these imaging biomarkers over time and predict progression. Examples can be applied to predicting progression from non-proliferative non diabetic retinopathy to diabetic retinopathy or in progression from dry to existed AMD to classify patients as high or low risk. This will allow for tailored management protocols for patients depending on their risk profile. This slideshow slide shows our AMD risk prediction pipeline. The ultimate goal for AMD studies is to integrate imaging biomarkers with patient metadata such as demographic, genetic, and clinical features. These data are then used to calculate risk scores for risk progression to advanced AMD, neovascular AMD, or geographic atrophy. The risk scores are then used to classify patients into low risk or high risk for progression. A big part of this pipeline, of course, is the imaging biomarker extraction methods. The figure in the bottom right displays the topographic surface and B-scan view of a segmented drusen from SDOCT. Characteristics such as the drusen area, extent, density, height, slope, and reflectivity are extracted to determine their association with progression to neovascular AMD. We recently developed a hybrid sequential prediction model called Deep Sequence, integrating radiomics engineered longitudinal imaging features that we described in the slide previously with demographic and visual factors in a recursive neural network model, all in the same platform to predict the risk of exudation within a time frame in non exudative AMD eyes. The proposed model provides scores associated with the risk of exudation in the short term, for example, within three months and long-term within 21 months, handling challenges related to variability of OCT scan characteristics and the size of the training cohort. The figure in this slide represents the architecture of our deep sequence model. We designed a many-to-many -many RNN model using two-layer, one-directional stacked stateful long-short-term memory units. It's called an LSTM model to predict AMD progression which is the first defined as the first exudation event in an eye progressing from dry to wet AMD, all within a given time frame across the sequence of clinical visits. You can see from the architecture that for each patient, the sequence of feature vector is modeled as a series where each input data observation is a real valued vector representation of the demographic, visual, and quantitative imaging features at the time of observation, for example, T, and N is the total number of observations for the patient considered to make a prediction. Continuous image featuring, imaging features are mapped to float values and categorical features are also embedded into numeric values. All the features are concatenated into one feature vector and passed into the stacked neural network. The targeted AMD progression sequence for a certain time frame of a patient is modeled to output categorical variables that represent whether a patient will have a progression event within a certain month starting from that observation Single directional stacked LSTM units are modeled to encode sequency dependency between the longitudinal visit and predict the probability of progression for each time point. This figure shows the performance of our deep sequence model, which was trained on a clinical trial dataset, the Harvard dataset, using a 10 cross fold validation scenario. The model presented excellent AUC at within three months of a given observation and good AUC results for the prediction within six months. We observed a drop of deep sequences performance for prediction of AMD progression within 12 months compared to the three months, which improved again at 18 months predi prediction. 
we, we hypothesized that the performance drop could be due to the fact that a fewer number of sequential visits were available for model training, while characteristics of the progressor and non-progressor classes were quite close, which makes optimization of the prediction decision boundary the most difficult for within the 12-month time point. However, the performance of deep sequence improves at the within 18 and 20 months time points, even with less data, since the training data set becomes more balanced, while more diverse characteristics, as can be observed between long-term progressors and non-progressors classes, are shown. The precision recall curves displayed similar results with curves well above a random guess scenario, but a performance decrease within 9 and 12 time frames. In addition to our prediction pipelines, our most recent work includes the development of a fully automated pipeline that enables probabilistic forecasting, providing uncertainty estimates around point predictions of future anti-VEGF treatment frequency. This model also highlights the most relevant imaging biomarkers for these predictions. So using STOCT data, we are able to extract with our deep learning custom-based method certain image, imaging biomarkers, which are then inputted into our probabilistic forecasting, where we, are, where we can see point predictions along a distribution to allow the physician to observe these predictions along uncertainty estimates. And as well as our, our method also shows the most relevant biomarkers that are associated with these predictions. These pipelines are very promising. We're seeing some interesting results in their performance and in automating ways of you know, either detection, progression predictions, segmentations, as well as treatment predictions. However, the main challenge is translating and deploying these models in real-world settings. Research efforts towards building the needed infrastructure for developing databases for AI applications in ophthalmology, as well as the ability to share diverse data across health system, will improve the validity and generalizability of these uh, artificial intelligence technologies. Algorithms also need to be more interpretable and explainable to ensure targeted representation and to identify potential bias in training, training data, all while protecting data safety and privacy. We also need to study how best to integrate these systems into different types of clinical workflows. The translations of AI systems can be enhanced through forging collaborations within ophthalmology between ophthalmic researchers, clinicians, and educators. Collaborations outside of ophthalmology may also be needed with IT research laboratories, healthcare systems, and technology companies for more widespread translation and deployment of machine learning and AI into ophthalmic practice. I would like to thank uh, all the leadership at the, at the Department of Ophthalmology uh, and uh, Dr. Jenny Lim again for uh, organizing such a great symposium and also the team at our uh, center, the Artificial Intelligence Ophthalmology Center, as well as the Ophthalmic Clinical Trials and Translation Center for all their help with, uh, with creating data sets for these algorithm developments, as well as all my collaborators. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel. That was great. And thanks for all the work that you're doing to help us move the field forwards in AI. It, it really is, is monumental, requiring a lot of input, I think, you know, from physicists, from mathematicians, computer scientists, and, and clinicians. Um, when do you think your deep sequence um, AI will be ready for application? It was a very, very interesting question. Uh, of course, I mean, we first developed the model, and as I mentioned, it was trained initially on a clinical trial uh, data set. Now, the, the biggest thing in moving these applications from, say, a laboratory setting where we're experimenting and doing with data that's already there to a, a clinical real-world setting is that we need to continuously teach it how data from the real world looks like. And uh, the second, there's many steps that uh, we're going to take to see how this deep sequence model performs when we feed it data from various populations, as well as from uh, different time sequence. As you know, in clinical trials, the data is very well organized. There's, it's coming at certain uh, you know, calibrated time points. Everybody comes at every month, whereas in the real world, it's very messy and everybody has a different kind of management protocol. So it's very important to teach it um, how to look at this different variety of data from different clinics. I mean, we can start here at the University of Illinois. We're very lucky because we have such a diverse kind of uh, patient population uh, to show it how 
this type of data and how it would perform there, and then continuously test it and validate it on data from several centers. So, you know, hopefully, I mean, this is one of the works we're actually working on, and we hope that in the coming uh, couple of years, if it performs really well, we're packaging this algorithm as well in a very friendly software tool, which we are also experimenting on how it performs in, in clinics. Uh, one of our collaborators, also Dr. McCumber, and you know yourself, Dr. Lim, we're also going to be working with each other where we'll give you this tool and you can drag and drop some of the images and look at the prediction and then evaluate historically how is it actually you know, doing something that you recommend. Um, again, it's, it's based as well as on how physicians and clinicians accept this tool. I mean, the input from the clinician is the most valuable and most important in this situation and any for, for deployment. Great. Thank, thanks for spearheading all of this. Well, Sherry, other- uh, I yes. wouldn't want the moment to go by without congratulating Dr. Chan and, and Dr. Halleck on having a separately designated AI Ophthalmology Center. I think you must be close to unique in the world if not, there aren't too many other places like you. So you're way ahead of the curve and congratulations. Thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. Great, thanks. And, and Joelle, what images right now are you using? Fundus, OCT, are you throwing OCTA in there? What, what exactly? So now we've seen a lot of success with the SDOCT data. And I know that uh, it's, it's very, you know, kind of not from just one uh, kind of disease for, um, AMD specifically, um, our performance models are doing really well with biomarks extracted from SDOCT. Uh, for glaucoma, for example, we're also working on some projects. There we're looking at a, a combination of more than one image modality from fundus as well as from uh, SDOCT. With regards to OCTA, we're again still, it's, it's very premature as was mentioned before, and uh, this is what everybody is facing is that hopefully it's gonna be in the future. We're currently, um, again, collaborating with Dr. Lim on looking at some of the OCTA biomarkers as well as the OCT biomarkers together to see if our algorithm kind of improves and is there at these OCTA uh, measures, biomarkers. So I think we'll we'll see how it goes, but you know, thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you had a good bio break. Uh, It's my pleasure now to continue our program. We're in the home stretch with four more talks to go. Uh, We're heading into the surgical and pediatric retina sections. So our first speaker for this section will be Dr. Larry Ulansky. Larry is one of my colleagues at UIC and, and a great friend. He is a clinical assistant professor in ophthalmology at UIC. He is also chief of ophthalmology at the Captain James Lovell Federal Healthcare Facility, a VA hospital. He has uh, done uveitis as well as oncology fellowships and has an interest in those areas. Today, I've asked Larry to speak on preferred practice pattern recommendations for PVD and retinal tears. Hello, my name is Larry Lansky, and I would like to thank Dr. Jennifer Lim and the entire retina faculty for allowing me to participate in this, the 14th annual retina symposium, improving clinical outcomes. My topic of discussion will be preferred practice recommendations for posterior vitreous detachment and retinal tears. I'd like to thank, I, I would like to first make my disclosures. I am none, I have none to disclose. I'm a full-time footer employee without any outside economic activity. And my talk will not include any non-FDA approved indications and or therapies. I would also like to thank the American Academy of Ophthalmology Preferred Practice Panel, panel which gave these recommendations in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. Everything starts first with the vitreous degeneration. Vitreous degeneration is defined as a uh, collapse of the vitreous cavity on itself, and the vit- vitreous architecture can only a certain, a t- certain degree of t- uh, instability and remodeling before vitreous detachment can occur. There's both an acute and subacute phenomenon. And this increase, this risk of retinal uh, posterior vitreous detachment increases over time with age. And as you get to age 70, approximately 63% of patients have developed a vitreous detachment. The vitreous detachment is progressive, and it's not necessarily associated with, quote, a reduction in hyaluronic acid or collagen, and it's a somewhat misnomer to call it liquefaction. Basically, what ends up happening is you get synuresis in the central vitreous core, and the cavity collapses in on itself. And this collapse, as the vitreous, uh, liquefied vitreous pierces through the posterior hyaluronic face, causes this dissection and separation anteriorly, and causes detachment of the vitreous from the internal living membrane. 
Risk factors for vitreous degeneration include trauma, myopia, intraocular surgery, and a history of uveitis. As a result, this dissection plane comes anteriorly to the area of the vitreous base where there's high adhesion of the vitreous to the retinal interface. And this traction pulls anteriorly on the posterior hyaloid face and in areas of weakness or lattice degeneration, you can get a horseshoe tear or an anterior flap as seen on the right image. So what are the symptoms of vitreous detachment? Typically it's photopsia and that's from tractional elements pulling on the retinal surface, stimulating the neuroretinal elements causing flashes of light, typically in the peripheral vision for a patient. Myodysopias, which are floaters in the vision, which can be caused by blood, vitreous condensation, or a Weiss ring. And there are several stages of development of vitreous detachment over time. I don't think too many people actually use this clinically in their uh, descriptions of vitreous detachment, either it's there or it's not. Vitreous detachment ultimately can lead to retinal tears. 8 to 22% of patients with a vitreous detachment have it present initially with a retinal tear. 2 to 5% may have a chance of developing a retinal tear within weeks. 66% of those patients with vitreous hemorrhage at their presentation will have at least one break found on depressed clinical examination. One third of patients may have more than one break. And 88% of breaks occur in the superior quadrant. So finding these breaks when you see a retinal detachment, a vitreous detachment associated with a vitreous hemorrhage is very important for treatment outcomes and for the patient to have a good successful treatment. What about asymptomatic holes? A lot of times we get calls about patients that have asymptomatic holes or percolated holes. Asymptomatic holes were followed by, uh, or percolated holes were followed by Fire and Davis, and they followed 74 eyes between a period of five and 11 years, and they had no eyes that progressed to a retinal detachment with a asymptomatic or percolated hole. And that's because the percolated perculum has torn away and the traction is relieved from the retinal surface. What about asymptomatic horseshoe tears where there is still traction and there's an elevation of the flap? 5% of patients with asymptomatic horseshoe tears end up progressing onto retinal detachment. So again, very small number as long as it's asymptomatic. What about symptomatic retinal tears? Symptomatic retinal tears indicate active traction and pulling on the retinal surface. New posterior vitreous detachment or vitreous traction associated with photopsies or flare are the symptoms that patients manifest when they have a symptomatic retinal tear. 50% of patients with untreated symptomatic retinal breaks with traction will progress on to a retinal detachment. And here you can see if with treatment, those, uh, that risk is significantly reduced to less than 5% of patients who have prompt laser developing a retinal detachment. This is a table presented by the preferred practice pattern on ways to treat and manage retinal tears. If they're, asymp if they're acute symptomatic horseshoe tears, they recommend treat promptly. If they're acute symptomatic or percolated holes, treatment may or may not be necessary if, as they are symptomatic, if they may be possibly need treatment. But if they're asymptomatic or percolated holes, treatment is rarely recommended. And if they are asymptomatic lattice degeneration without holes or even with holes, usually treatment is not required. So treatment includes cryotherapy, and you can see here the cryotherapy probe uh, causing uh, scarring and inflammation around an area of retinal break where it's applied, and also laser retinopex. And I'd like to point out to the uh, audience, uh, the, retin the uh, residents, this laser retinopexy uh, is being performed here in two. You can put perform two to three rows around the retinal break. But the most important thing actually here is the anterior horns. So this is an incomplete break. And you can see where the tractional elements is here is on the anterior edge of the flap. It's very important to laser all the way up to the aura serrata. So if that flap continues to tear up, that will tear away and uh, the retina will remain safe. But the most important things come around the anterior side. And many times residents will say, well, I treated it. And then you go look and you realize the anterior portion of the horn has not been treated. And that is actually the most difficult aspect of performing laser retina. The risk of laser retinal pexy include bleeding, pain, inflammation, epiretinal membrane formation from inflammation, medriasis due to nerve damage of the long ciliary nerves, and early onset presbyopia. And I remember a patient of mine that had multiple retinal breaks that was in their 20s, and I lasered every single break. There probably was 10 of them, and the patient was not very happy because she became presbyopic. Uh, instantly. Thankfully, over the course of uh, about two months, that resolved and the patient regenerated nerves. But that's a definite concern. Lattice degeneration is vitreoretinal thinning with overlying vitreous liquefaction and a firm vitreoretinal adhesion at the margins of thinning. So in this particular picture here, you can see laser being applied around the band of lattice degeneration. And I'm going to
point out here the most important areas in the area red and that's where you want to make sure you get laser treatment if you are going to treat lattice and if you feel it's necessary if you fail to treat in these margins here that's where the traction is and your treatment will fail treating within the lattice itself does very little to help protect the patient so what about lattice degeneration does lattice degeneration with atrophic holes need treatment 423 eyes of 276 patients were followed for 11 years 35% of these eyes had atrophic holes and lattice. 10 of the 150 eyes that were had those atrophic holes had more than 10 or more than one disc area or one disc diameter of subretinal fluid from the hole itself. And the clinical retinal detachment only developed in three patients out of the 423 eyes studied the entire cohort over time. So lattice degeneration in itself is not a high risk for retinal detachment as is subretinal fluid around areas of atrophic holes within the lattice degeneration. So patients are at low risk for retinal det detachment that have lattice degeneration. But again, if you are gonna treat, make sure you do it correctly. Treat around the entire margin, because typically it's these areas where you will develop new tears or breaks, not the actual atrophic hole within the area of lattice degeneration. So what about retinal, degeneration, uh, retinal detachment in general? The incidence of a retinal detachment in the general population is 10 to 18 per 100,000. There's uh, typically 20 to 40% of those retinal detachments may be associated with cataract surgery. 10% may have a history of previous ocular trauma. And the rate of bilateral retinal detachment is very small at 1.7%. The risk factors include myopia, lattice degeneration, cataract or intraocular surgery, EA capsulotomy, trauma or a history of retinal detachment in the other eye or a family history of retinal detachment. So what about myopia? The increase is in risk in retinal detachment is proportionally related to the axial length of the eye. Even low myopia though may have a fourfold increased risk of rheumatologist retinal detachment. Lattice degeneration as we said has a low risk of retinal detachment and is present in approximately six to eight percent of the population. Approximately 20 to 30 percent of patients with a rheumatologist retinal detachment may have associate lattice degeneration. That does not mean, though, that the lattice actually is an independent risk factor or a high risk factor for retinal detachment. And remember, laser the lattice, not the hole. Cataract surgery. What about cataract surgery? Cataract surgery does have a small risk for rheumatologist retinal detachment. The risk of rheumatologist retinal detachment immediately after cataract surgery is approximately 1 percent. This risk can increase in time and is associated with increased axial myopia, history of retinal detachment, being male, vitreous prolapse in the anterior chamber, vitreous loss during cataract surgery, or a broken capsule. Yea, capsulotomy itself may be associated with a fourfold increase of rheumatologist retinal detachment. Posterior vitreous detachment uh, formation after surgery or post cataract surgery is also a major risk factor. So a patient going in that already has a PVD is at lower risk than a patient that has not had a preoperative EVD. And this is an interesting uh, set of data from Western Australia. Between 1989 and 2001, there was 237 retinal detachment cases following 65,000 uh, fake emulsification surgeries. And you can see over time the significant decrease in uh, retinal detachment as fake emulsification became the standard of care. And if you look at the time after fake emulsification, it peaks out at approximately eight years when patients start to develop retinal detachment. This is another interesting study from Denmark that followed 202,000 eyes that had uncomplicated cataract surgery with one eye and then followed their second eye, their fellow eye, which was not operated on. They identified 465 retinal detachments in the cataract operated eyes versus 110 in the fellow non-operated eyes. And this had a 4.23 odds ratio relative risk increase of retinal detachment in those patients that had retinal or that had cataract surgery. And the risk is the highest in the first six months, but could persist up to 10 years. Now, I do find it very interesting how both graphs parallel each other over time from both operated and fellow non-operated eyes. So what about retinal detachment? If you have retinal detachment in one eye, your risk of developing a rheumatized retinal detachment in the other eye is approximately 10%. That's actually quite significant when you compare that to the general population of uh, approximately 10 to 18 per 100,000. So what patients that do have a retinal detachment, I always discuss with them the risk in the other eye and the reason to come in early for treatment. Phacic eyes in patients uh, with a pseudophagic retinal detachment in the other eye still have a 7% risk of rheumatized retinal detachment. So again, having a retinal detachment in one eye significantly does increase your risk in the other eye, whether or not you have surgery. 
So when I see patients, I counsel them and I say, if they have new floaters, significant new floaters, visual loss or reduction of visual acuity uh, or a visual field deficit, they should come in immediately for an evaluation or at least uh, call the office for uh, information about how to be seen. And the one thing that I would say is that we all get these calls from our fellow providers that say, I have a patient with a retinal hole. And I remember one weekend I had an optometrist very worried from lens crafters because she had a retinal detachment or she had a, a patient she thought could develop a retinal detachment because it may be whole. And she was texting me images from her optos. And I looked at him and said, oh, I don't really think that's something we need to see today. I'm glad to see it today if you really want to see it. And you could just hear her angst that she was having this patient. And she, from a medical legal point, she was extremely worried. So I, I would say, first off, whenever someone calls you, you say, thank you for the kindness referral, because they are calling you because they were asking for help. And what you want to understand is their motivations, their concerns, and why they want you to see that patient. And I think having a professional discussion and saying, okay, I'm glad to see this patient, you know, within a certain amount of time frame, allows you the ability to bring their anxiety levels down and to make sure that patient gets appropriate care. So I'd like to thank uh, Jenny. I'd like to thank uh, everyone for uh, watching this uh, uh, presentation today. If you have any questions or concerns, I'll be glad to answer them in our chat. Thank you very much. Um, I thank you for masking. I thank you for staying safe. And I thank you for your remote participation in this conference. Have a good day. Thanks so much, Larry, for that very pragmatic and thorough review of retinal tears, PVDs, and detachments. I am very pleased to announce our next speaker is Dr. Yannick Liederman. Yannick is one of my colleagues, great friend and great colleague here at UIC, where he is the Associate Professor of Ophthalmology and Director of the Vitroretinal Microsurgery Laboratory. He also directs the ocular imaging service here at UIC. He came to us in 2010 after completing both residency and fellowship at Mass Eye and Ear and highly recommended. He has an interest in PBR and especially in retinal detachments. So I asked Yannick to speak on management of traumatic retinal detachments. Good afternoon. I'd like to thank my partner and our service director, Dr. Jennifer Lim, for inviting me to be a part of the Retina Symposium this year. And Jenny, I'd like to thank you for inviting me this year to speak on something that all of us on the Retina Service of the Infirmary see not infrequently, and that's retinal detachment following eye trauma. Here are my disclosures. This afternoon, I'd like to review the incidents, risk factors, and treatment outcomes following retinal detachment after eye trauma. I'm going to focus on the clinical phenotype, particularly reviewing proliferative vitreoretinopathy, and then we'll end by speaking about therapeutics, primarily surgical intervention, and emerging pharmacotherapies. Dean Elliott and colleagues have shown that the incidence of ragmatogenous detachment following open globe injury is roughly 29%. And for eyes that developed a traumatic detachment, roughly a quarter detached within the first 24 hours, nearly half detached within one week, and of all detachments, nearly three quarters occurred within one month. So this should guide us in that while it's not uncommon to have relatively late detachments, it is critically important to surveil eyes following severe closed globe or certainly open globe injury, uh, particularly those eyes that have anterior media opacity or vitreous hemorrhage. Echographic surveillance is critical in detecting retinal detachment. They further showed using a multivariable regression analysis that vitreous hemorrhage was the most significant risk factor for the development of RD, uh, further a higher Birmingham eye trauma terminology zone of injury was correlated with detachment and eyes exhibiting worse visual acuity at presentation. With regard to outcomes of the 255 eyes in their cohort, 138 developed detachment Roughly 50% uh, of eyes with detachment developed recurrent RD. The risk factors were smoking. Uh, an additional independent risk factor was PVR at the time of surgery. That was probably uh, the greatest independent risk factor. And of note, Dean Elliott and colleagues shown that treatment with uh, scleral buckle combined with vitrectomy compared favorably to vitreoretinal surgery alone. 
Of note, only 8% of eyes in which detachment recurred achieved a best corrected acuity of 2200 or better in comparison with nearly half of eyes that did not redetach. So in keeping with the results of the silicone oil studies performed decades earlier, success in the first attachment is really paramount in achieving superior visual acuity outcomes. Let's review the various subtypes of advanced proliferative vitreoretinopathy using the so-called Mockamer revised classification of PVR grade C is instructive in that while we generally use it as a research tool, I find it's a very effective way to understand the pathophysiology of PVR. Type 1 is epiretinal proliferation, as manifested here by focal proliferation on the inner retinal surface, the so-called starfold. Type 2 is a more diffuse proliferation that can be either confluence of multiple starfolds or diffuse sheets on the inner retinal surface. Type 3 is subretinal PVR. Here, this is a circumferential subretinal band, or so-called closed line. And finally, types 4 and 5 are anterior PVR, generally involving the vitreous base. With regard to treatment, we'll begin with an overview of the surgical texts. The chief lesson of the silicone oil study number 11 was that success in the first surgery for PPR is paramount for obtaining better visual results. And these same findings apply nearly two and a half decades later to the previous studies that we discussed from the group in Boston. So let's begin with the overall surgical goals in PVR. First, we must resect epiretinal and subretinal proliferations that are exerting traction and inhibiting total retinal reattachment. And the next goal is to remove proliferative tissue as well as vitreous scaffolding in order to inhibit reproliferation to the greatest possible extent. With regard to the surgical strategy in severe PVR, the steps are as follows. An encircling band, as discussed previously, is placed by uh, some authors, although in many centers this has become less common, even in severe PVR with retinal detachment. Generally, removal of the crystalline lens is necessary for thorough vitrectomy and certainly to facilitate anterior dissection. Again, in the silicone oil studies, nearly 90% of crystalline lenses were moved, as well as a significant proportion of intraocular lenses. Following vitrectomy, we begin by addressing posterior epiretinal proliferation, and I find that a visualization agent such as dilute triamcinolone is very useful in this regard. Next, we address mid-peripheral and anterior membranes, and uh, these diffuse anterior contractile elements and membranes, as shown in the previous video, are a critically important factor for post-operative recurrent detachment as well as hypotony. I like to perform 360 anterior vitreous removal, shaving of the vitreous base, as well as any removal of membranes within the vitreous base at this time. These maneuvers are greatly facilitated by scleral indentation and wide angle viewing. At this time, it's most useful to assess for retinectomy, particularly an inferior 180 degree retinectomy if proliferation anteriorly cannot be adequately relaxed by delamination. If a retinectomy is performed, this provides uh, an excellent opening for resection of any subretinal bands. If not, pre-existing retinal breaks or focal retinotomies can be used. Anterior dissection of the ciliary processes is performed if there is significant proliferation in order to minimize the postoperative possibility of hypotony. Perfluorocarbon liquid is extremely useful in reattaching total retinal detachments, particularly with large breaks or inferior retinectomy. And finally, endolaser and tamponade. I think most authors generally use silicone oil uh, rather than long-acting gas in severe traumatic retinal detachments. With regard to the silicone oil studies, Retinotomy was less frequent and visual outcomes were generally worse, although it can be argued that authors used retinotomy or larger retinectomies in the most severe detachment with PVR. I think in the recent one to two decades, 
relaxing inferior retinectomy or wide inferior retinectomy as we generally perform at our center has become much more common. Stephen Schwartz and colleagues in Los Angeles published this relatively seminal work and if we look at success rates after initial retinectomy we can see that the use of silicone oil had a significantly beneficial effect on durable reattachment. In addition, anterior vitreous base dissection and lensectomy were significantly associated with successful repair. However, in the presence of wide inferior retinectomy, while there was a trend for improved outcomes with scleral buckle, no significance was shown in these studies. Let's conclude by discussing the role of pharmacotherapy in vitrectomy for PVR. So I think would be clear to us at this point is that surgical in intervention alone is not sufficient in order to achieve optimal visual outcomes or even durable reattachment in eyes with history of severe trauma, retinal detachment, and pre-existing PVR. In performing a search for clinical trials uh, in the United States, we have relative paucity of studies we can in looking at the trials, almost consider this an, an orphan disease in terms of how many agents are being assessed. And uh, these can generally be broken down into anti-proliferative medications, uh, 5-FU here, for example, and methotrexate, as well as several anti-VEGF agents, including aflibercept and bevacizumab. With regard to active trials, uh, there are relatively few. You can see there's, there's really a, a single trial in multiple centers at this time around the country. Uh, we are one of two centers in the state of Illinois and in Chicago is participating in one of these studies. And before speaking of ongoing studies, let's speak about some of the agents that have not been shown to be of benefit in the past. This is a wide variety of predominantly anti-proliferative agents as well as radiation as well. One of the first agents was oral prednisone. That study was conducted by Gary Abrams, Yasuo Tano, and Robert Makamer now four decades ago. And since then, uh, we have a relatively extensive list of agents that have not shown improved outcomes. With regard to ongoing trials, intravitreal methotrexate, 0.8% in the GUARD study is the multi-center study that uh, was shown on the previous slides that is ongoing. This is a relatively busy slide, but it shows uh, the first phase and an additional cohort of patients with uh, retinal detachment associated with PVR, as well as patients with open globe injury and the uh, timing of the injury, followed by detachment and then uh, repeated injections of methotrexate, which thus far in the early phase trials have been quite effective in preventing progression of PVR and recurrent retinal detachment. So in terms of the summary recommendations with regard to surgical tactics, it's critical that we strive for single procedure success in surgery for retinal detachment associated with PVR following trauma. Anterior vitreous base dissection and lensectomy are very important tools in achieving these goals, as well as likely the use of silicone oil tamponade and the role of wide inferior retinectomy with or without scleral buckle combined with vitrectomy have all shown to be important modalities, particularly in eyes with anterior PVR. With regard to pharmacotherapy, we don't have any agents of definitive proven benefit at this time, but we do have at least one promising agent under investigation. And really, I think most of us agree that pharmacotherapy is going to be absolutely paramount to improving visual outcome. And finally, a word on primary prevention. Given the paucity of excellent treatments, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the critical importance of safety eyewear in preventing traumatic retinal detachment in our patients, and dare I say, as well as in our own family members. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yannick, for that wonderful talk on PVR and traumatic retinal detachments. Um, you know, I'm curious, uh, Yannick, you, you mentioned that you like to remove the lens frequently when you're doing PVR, especially when there's anterior. 
I, I will say with the advent of wide angled imaging that I'm finding that I can get into that anterior ring, so to speak, and, and treat that without having to remove the lens unless you know it's absolutely really, really anterior. Are you finding the same? I mean, we're able to do relaxing retinectomies with the lens still in place. Yeah, I agree completely, Jenny. I think even anterior PVR is a, a wide spectrum, right? So in those patients where um, the vitreous base is involved, but the remainder of the pars plana and the pars plicata are uninvolved, I think particularly in pseudophagic patients, um, you know, phagic patients with oil at some point, the, they, they may need cataract surgery, but I think increasingly that's an opportunity for phagovitrectomy. But in any case, to your point, I agree completely. I think uh, you can certainly leave the lens or a, an intraocular lens. Uh, but I think something that I know you're very familiar with, uh, given our, our referral practice uh, here at the Eye and Ear Infirmary in the region, is that patients who've had multiple reoperations um, and are starting to get hypotenuse, and, and I think, frankly, no one has, has really in the OR looked in the far anterior periphery at those ciliary processes, at the zonules, when membranes start to be involved there, I think the greatest error we could make as PBR surgeons is neglecting those membranes until the ciliary processes atrophy to nothing, and then the, the eye is completely hypotenuse and there's nothing to, to be done. Um, but those are two sort of different ends of the uh, grade C type five PVR spectrum. So I, I agree with you completely. Yeah, absolutely, Yannick. And you know, it's uh, sometimes in a way we're happy when we get glaucoma post PVR surgery. You know, when you take a hypotenuse side that looks like a squash grape, you remove all those membranes, you free up the cellular body, and then the pressure zings up. And now we have to ask, um, we have to ask our glaucoma colleagues for help in in those cases. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Glaucoma ultimately after multiple surgeries and a retinal detachment is a soluble problem. A pressure of zero is absolutely insoluble. Exactly. Thank you. Are there other questions for Dr. Liederman? I have one. Uh, great talk, Yannick. Um, I haven't historically peeled ILM in PVR cases, but the last posterior kind of early grade C PVR case I had, I had trouble getting the membrane off, but then I started peeling ILM a little bit more anterior to that, and it came off very nicely in a sheet. Have you been uh, using that in your more trauma cases to try to get ILM up as well, or in those cases, you're just trying to get the retina attached initially and then kind of readdress later on if needed? Yeah, and, and do you mean posteriorly, uh, Mike, mostly within the, the arcades or posterior to the equator? Well, obviously that's easiest, but I am curious to see if you're, you're doing it any more anteriorly. I know ILM does thin out a fair amount as you get anterior, it's harder to do so. But I'm wondering if you're starting to do more of that. Yeah, so it, it's a great point, um, not intentionally. And when I say intentionally, as, as you remember from your, your time with us, uh, I'm a big fan of using uh, triamcinolone acetonide to stain, uh, you know, epiretinal proliferation and PPR, and I will often restain. And so I think in, in some of those cases, if you're really being meticulous about getting those membranes up, you're probably getting ILM some of the time. I mean, we at least understand that from some of the histopathology of, of macular surgery. Um, I, I think also, and I know you understand this, Mike, but just for our wider audience, you know, peeling the ILM to your point, really the value of it is a, is a surrogate to know that you're, you're getting all the membranes uh, up off of the retina. So I think ideally, um, particularly if you can do it efficiently, not only is there no downside, it, it theoretically would be wonderful to, to peel the ILM everywhere. I think I, I don't strive for that because again, my, my goal in terms of uh, also being efficient is just to get more of the, the cellular proliferation and certainly all of the hyloid up off the retina. But some of the time, if you're being meticulous, I'm sure you're getting you know, the ILM in a, in a patchy way uh, in some areas. So I, I think uh, to, to answer your question in, in some, I think you know, my results have been pretty good using triessence, but uh, who knows, maybe there is room for, for even a better inhibition of reproliferation of PVR on the retina by peeling the ILM. So I, I think you make a great point. I ask both of you um, what you do in the case of either an open globe injury or PVR when the crystalline lens has been removed whenever or for whatever reason, what are your criteria for inserting an IOL? Yannick, you wanna go ahead? Sure, so Dr. Goldberg, you know, the short answer I can give you is a quote from my friend, Dean Elliott, which is in an eye that has experienced significant PVR, particularly involving the posterior pole, uh, the prospects for an, an intraocular lens are a fantasy. 
Um, I, I think that that maybe is a little bit of an across the board sweeping generalization, but to your point, um, I think it is, it is relatively, uh, I would not say rare, but uncommon that eyes post open globe injury with severe detachments with PVR end up benefiting from a lens so that what, what I would do, and I'm going to, I'm going to go out on a limb because I know Jenny's uh, practice style so well, I think she and I do similar things, but I, I'd like to hear you answer. If an eye is done well with oil and I'm getting ready to take out the oil, uh, you can certainly do a refraction through oil. And if it seems like the patient would benefit from a lens, then I can combine that at the time of removal of oil. Um, you know, sometimes even the oil will come out. And then uh, once I refract that patient, again, I, I feel like I can count on two hands how often I do this during a year, but then I discover, well, you know, this, this patient seems like they would have some benefit from a lens and I'll do a procedure just with the secondary intraocular lens once the oil is out and, and I know the detachment has been repaired. But I personally, I think it, it's really optimistic at best to be preoccupied, particularly with, with you know, leaving lens capsule in patients with really bad severe anterior PVR with the hope of, of making lens placement easier. Uh, I, I think that's a, a contemporary trend that is probably not fully rooted in reality. So I have a slightly slightly different uh, approach. So I will go ahead and put in an IOL, but I will put it in scleral fixated on a post-trauma eye that is a phacic. And I will do that as long as the visual acuity is better is hand motion is better than hand motion. So if they're just count fingers, I think that's worth it because they get this peripheral vision, which actually helps uh, these patients maneuver and get around. Um, if they are even 2,400 refracted, I'll definitely put in an IOL. And sometimes you're pleasantly surprised the vision's actually better than you might expect. Um, so I will, however, if they, um, you know, I, I will not do it at the first surgery mort. I'll do it after I rehabilitate the eye. And so when I'm about to take off the oil, as you know, we can do IOL calculations, you know, through the IOL master and just put in the silicone oil correction. And so we'll go ahead and take out the oil, put in the IOL and put it in scleral fixated. Um, but again, it's got to be an eye where I know I've got that retina definitely fixed. And we have done it in eyes who have 360 retinectomy and they have gotten useful vision back. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I do agree with you, Yannick, there are some eyes that are just lost from really bad trauma, uh, but we, you know, are able to give them backhand motions, count fingers. Um, and I, I will put a plug in though. So since we have an audience here, uh, we are in the Aldira guard study and we have two patients actively enrolled. We had one screen failure. We are looking for more patients. I have injected you know, these patients with methotrexate into the oil bubble, and they do get weekly injections for a series of them. And they, you know, again, my N is small, but nationwide, we have not been having a lot. Uh, I have not noticed that there's any AE that would halt the study. So please consider sending us your PVR patients so that we can put them into the Aldire Guard. So we're all you know, excited to participate in that study. Okay. Question for, uh, quick last question for Yannick. Um, great talk, uh, Yannick, as always, I enjoy hearing uh, about these challenging surgical cases, but uh, wanted to know, uh, I guess this could, for anyone on the panel, uh, experience with the so-called medium term uh, retention of PFO as an intraocular tamponade for um, challenging traumatic retinal attachments as has been advocated by Steve Charles. Your experience or anyone else? Yeah, that, that is advocated for by a small cohort to your point, Rob. Um, and, and I think a, a perhaps even more illustrative example as well, it's not FDA approved here, uh, so-called heavy silicone oils, right? Denseron in Europe, as well as in Canada, uh, it does have approval by the regulatory authorities. Um, with regard to PFO, I can tell you that uh, I've actually not used it for a detachment, but I do use it for uh, so-called retinal autografts in, um, in macular holes that have failed previous surgery. Uh, and I tried and leave it in for two weeks. And I can tell you that um, invariably all, all the patients um, develop significant ocular hypertension over that period, uh, you know, require intensive topical corticosteroids. So I can't imagine leaving it in more than, than several weeks. A lot of people would argue that the, the PEXI should happen within a few weeks. And I know, I know Steve quite well, and he, he takes it out within several weeks as well. But the issue, Rob, and I think why more of us don't use it, is the tempo of, of recurrent PVR, as you know, is not over 12 to 14 days. Uh, 
the, the medium time to recurrence is often six to eight weeks, right? So that cellular proliferation is, is a much slower process. To Jenny's point, uh, the, the study that we're in, the, the GUARD trial has weekly injections for the first eight weeks and then every other week until week 12. And that's because, you know, Dean Elliott and colleagues found that that's the tempo that's necessary. If you stop injecting after four or five weeks, the post-operative PVR is just temporarily shifted to the right and you get it at, at 12 or 14 weeks. So I don't think it really buys us anything, right? Having that, that heavy silicone oil other than in a patient that is going to have failure of the primary surgery because you haven't occluded the break. Uh, and I would rather in a patient that, you know, an elderly patient with osteoarthritis that can't position, I'd rather put in a, a scleral buckle and use silicone oil. I think in most cases uh, with, a, with a good oil fill and, and other measures and potentially taking out the lens, uh, I think we have the tools to be able to tamponade uh, the entire retina without having to use uh, PFO. Uh, and I think that's the most reason most authors have gotten away from it. And, and frankly, many of our colleagues in Europe are not using Denseron and those other agents um, be, because the problem that we have is redetachment from PVR, not primary failure if, if we're really being judicious about our choices. I agree with Yannick. I don't use PFO as a tamponade because my goal is when I'm in the operating room is to reattach that retina, flatten the retina. So if I can't get the retina flat, I will do a relaxing retinectomy, a very low threshold for doing that. You know, obviously when it's not an eye in which a buckle would have helped. So I'll go ahead and cut, do a relaxing retinectomy, get the retina flat, put in oil or gas, and then I'm done. I, I don't feel like I have to stage it, you know, to, to put in the uh, PFO is a temporary maneuver to reattach the retina. I'm curious if anybody online uh, uses it and, and their rationale for it. I'd be curious uh, to hear your thoughts. If not, then thank you so much, Yannick. It was a great talk and great discussion. Uh, thanks, Rob, Dr. Goldberg, for uh, your comments as well. And we will move on uh, now. Thank you, James. To, thank you. And we'll move on now to our next speaker, uh, who I'm very happy uh, to announce is my chairman, Dr. Paul Chan. So let me get this open here. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Chan. He is the John H. Panton Professor of Ophthalmology and head of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences. He's doing a great job as chair, and he's actually not on the call anymore because he has to be at an executive uh, university level meeting. So he wanted me to let you all know that. Uh, Paul is also the director of the pediatric service and the ROP service, and he was previously the co-director of the retinal fellowship here at UIC. He is a world-renowned pediatric retina specialist and a specialist in pediatric retinal uh, conditions. He came to us after completing his uh, fellowship at Mass Eye and Ear and being fac uh, fellowship at uh, yep, Mass Eye and Ear and also being a faculty member at Weill Cornell Medical Center. And I'm really pleased that Paul is here. And I've asked Paul to speak to us today on the uh, Coates syndrome and other pediatric vascular lesions. Hi, uh, good afternoon. And, and thanks uh, for having me here today. I wanna to especially thank, of course, Dr. Jennifer Lim uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about uh, Coates disease. Um, and I'm also gonna discuss uh, management of other pediatric retinal vascular conditions uh, here are my financial disclosures, uh, none of which relate to the contents of this talk. And I want to thank the, the number of people who actually helped me with this, this uh, presentation um, and have provided some cases uh, to share with you today. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit, what I want to focus on is, is about management, right? And, and I think the, the evolution of management uh, throughout the years and how we treat these conditions like Coates disease fever, incontinence, and pigmenting. And then I'm going to uh, finish up with a discussion on, on retinopathy prematurity, of course, and, and, uh, and some other aggressive conditions. Um, so when we look at management in general, similar to the ROP journey, I think that we've also had a similar type of journey with other pediatric retinal diseases, you know, as we transition from cryo to laser and now to anti-VEGF. And then the question is, you know, what to do with all these treatment options um, and when do these things apply? So of course, I, I always like to start with a case. You know, here's a patient uh, here in the right eye, uh, Coates disease, significant amount of exudate centrally. Um, there's no retinal detachment, uh, but there's, there's a lot of exudation. And then you have this peripheral area here 
that clearly uh, lights up when you do the fluorescein angiogram. Um, so you can see that here's the, the, the activity and here's what's causing the problem. Um, how do you treat it? And I think historically, you know, we, we always talk about cryotherapy as an option and that's still an option. Um, I think right now, most of us, you know, will definitely laser this, but the question really is, would we also add an anti-VEGF treatment? So in this case, uh, I lasered it and the, the patient did quite well. And we see so many of these cases with this central exudation and, and how do we make that better, right? And I think that that's, that's the big question. Um, for this patient, by, by just uh, dealing with the peripheral telangiectasias, uh, the body uh, sort of healed itself and the exudation went away, but it did leave a central scar, okay? So there's a small scar in the center, you can see here, the vision improved, okay? But we oftentimes do see cases where the scar is much bigger and the vision doesn't improve. So are there other options to deal with it? Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, regarding uh, patients with a lot of exudation, uh, retinal detachments and so forth. Uh, here's a nice paper by Baker Hubbard down in Emory. And also Mike, Mike Shapiro and Michael Blair published a nice report uh, when they were here at UIC uh, discussing similar types of um, management regarding these detachments. And you know what we have to keep in mind in Coach's disease, managing these patients with laser alone is an option, right? So here, if you identify it as Coach, you rule out retinoblastoma, you see the telangiectasias and, and, and the areas that are causing the problem, you laser them, and, and I think most of us will prefer yellow or green laser uh, for these cases. Um, you can uh, promote uh, resolution of the, of the fluid and you can get a good result. Oftentimes in these cases too, we'll do peripheral um, external drainage with a vitrectomy, and then uh, you can do endolaser while you're in the OR. Okay, so looking at the exudation, I thought this was an interesting paper by uh, Victor Villegas, um, injecting brolicizumab now. you know, I think that it really just brings in the discussion around anti-VEGF treatment. All right, so here, similar to, to the case that we saw that I just presented, um, central exudation um, did peripheral laser in this case, but also injected bolecizumab. And you can see here the, the good resolution of the, of the fluid centrally. So I think that more and more, we're, we're starting to think through uh, what the places of, of anti-VEGF, of steroids, you know, combination treatments, and there's, there's a lot of discussion around, you know, what to do. Do you do, you do everything at once? Do you just stick with laser? Uh, but currently there's no specific consensus guideline around when to treat. Um, this is a nice paper by, uh, by Carol and Jerry Shields um, talking about classification, but also uh, here's their recommendations around treatment, right? And this is a couple of years ago, you know, stage one, two, laser only or, or cryotherapy, stage three, laser potential external drainage of the total retinal attachment. Um, and then when you look at adjuvant therapy, uh, saying that intravitreal uh, uh, or periocular steroids and anti-VEGF are options. And I think uh, for many people, um, there, there is this discussion around uh, doing anti-VEGF and steroid initially with the ablative therapy, right? So we have to keep this in mind, but again, there's no consensus at this time. Okay, let's move on to, to fever, um, which is another uh, interesting condition. Again, you know, anti-VEGF versus laser and so forth and so on. You can see here this nice case by Pete Campbell at, at KCI Institute, uh, the peripheral vascular retina. You can see the exudation here in both eyes. Do the fluorescein, you know, use clear changes here. What do you do? I think many of us would agree that this patient needs laser, but then again, do you do anti-VEGF treatment? Um, and when you talk about anti-VEGF treatment, uh, one of the considerations is, okay, well, do you worry about contraction, right? Then, and which patients will have good results or not? Um, again, another nice paper by Baker Harvard that's in press, um, seen here that if you have the proliferative tissue in contact with the lens and retrolental plaque, um, and you inject these patients with anti-VEGF, uh, potentially these, these patients may not do as well and can, can present with potentially worsening traction. So those are things to consider. But people have used anti-VEGFs in, in fever cases. But again, I think similar to the Coates disease discussion, uh, identifying the, the areas that are causing the issue, in this case, there's a lot of peripheral ischemia uh, and lasering that is appropriate. What about IP? Again, uh, discussion around how to treat these patients if you see it in the early stages where the retina has not completely detached. Um, laser combination treatment um, are things to think about, but again, laser 
uh, still very effective. And I think for us is, is the mainstay right now with the discussion around anti-VEGF. ROP, you know, we've, we've been through this so many times, but you know, what's, what's nice about it is that in the past 15 years, we have had a little bit more clarity. Again, still a lot more questions to, to answer, but again, we've had this evolution from cryo to laser and now to anti-VEGF. Um, and number of studies, including, um, you know, the beat ROP, but also these prospective trials ongoing, like butterfly and firefly, uh, looking at filibercept, and also the results of the rainbow study that have come out of the past uh, year or two, in addition to the five-year extension uh, for rainbow, you know, which is now ongoing. Um, so different drugs have been used, you know, it's still, again, no consensus on, on which drug is the best, and also no consensus on what the dosing is the best. And, and this is a study, this is very nice to see that this collaboration between PDIG and the DRCR network. Um, here, you know, now ROP3, uh, looking at uh, intrav intravitreal bevacizumab at 0 0.063 uh, and laser, and also ROP4. And, you know, I like this study because it brings in the discussion about what do you do with uh, posterior or aggressive disease and here you're, you're, they're looking at uh, 0.063 versus 0.25 bevacizumab. Okay, and why why does this matter? You know, because bevacizumab and, and anti-VEGF treatments are definitely a part of our our, uh, our treatment option. Um, you know, in the, in the days when we just had laser or cryotherapy, you know, these cases that I'm showing here would be very very difficult to treat. Uh, so significant MVI. Um, very aggressive posterior disease. And in, in the new ICROP, we're defining this now as aggressive ROP as opposed to just uh, aggressive posterior ROP. Here's the, uh, the left eye. Again, uh, significant plus disease and again, posterior nature and looks aggressive. Uh, had anti-VEGF. Okay, now what we're seeing here is that almost a year later, you get this peripheral vascular retina here in the, in the left eye. Uh, similar types of findings with this per persistent vascular retina, um, really best seen on the fluorescing angiogram. But again, these anti-VEGFs, um, as, as good as they work, the question is, well, what do we, how do we follow these patients and, and what's the best management for these changes that we see in the long term? Um, another condition that, that I, I want to bring up also that brings up the discussion about um, uh, uh, laser versus uh, anti-VEGF or combination treatment is this uh, sort of fever variant, I think. So Nina Barakal described Roper. Uh, we described this aggressive variant, aggressive posterior vitreal retinopathy in, in neonates. And really the difference is that, you know, this is not EPROP, this happens in bigger babies. And of course you can get this phenomena in uh, resource limited settings where there's bigger, older babies who develop aggressive disease, but this is a different issue here. And this is more, we think along the fever variant. So in summary, uh, how do we manage Coates disease and, and these other conditions, these other retinovascular conditions? Laser is definitely still uh, needed uh, as, as part of the, the, the treatment option. Um, but again, you know, what, what's the role of anti-VEGF? And I think there's more to come. I think more and more uh, we are using anti-VEGF agents um, either as primary treatment, um, but very, I think more often as, uh, as an adjunct and um, in addition to laser treatment as, as the primary. Uh, ultimately, we need to develop better guidelines um, for the treatment with anti-VEGF therapy. Um, and of course, with these agents, we need to come to some consensus uh, for follow-up for these, these pediatric retina patients, especially since you know, they're not always gonna tell you what's going on, um, but you know, follow-up for these patients is critical, especially as we know for ROP patients. Um, and ultimately, you know, it's a team approach with the families to provide better care for, the, for these children. So again, thank you, Dr. Lim. Thank you to all the guest speakers. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg, um, Dr. Sternberg, you know, and uh, it's wonderful to be here with all of you and I uh, look forward to seeing everyone in person very, very soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, Paul, for that wonderful talk. Uh, unfortunately, Paul is in a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the leadership at UIC, so he can't be on the call. Um, if anyone has any comments on pediatric retinal diseases, please feel free to speak up. I personally think it's pretty amazing that we uh, can go from cryo to laser to anti-VEGF for ROP, 
and that we have anti-VEGF and can use it in, in children as needed. Any comments or questions? Um, Dr. Goldberry, I have a question for you. Has anyone at Hopkins used anti-VEGF as an adjunct for coats or incontinentia pigmenti? Uh, not to my knowledge. Uh, I, I think the issue with anti-VEGF for tiny babies is that there's potential systemic toxicity. Absolutely. Um, Lucentis may be the safest of the agents to use, but I still worry about it. In a neonate, it needs all the VEGF they can muster for normal organogenesis, heart, lungs, liver, and so on. So I, I think it's an unsettled issue, but I worry about anti-VEGF for tiny babies. As far as incontinentia pigmenti is concerned, I followed about 50 patients for up to 20 years personally, and I have a very large number of patients who had peripheral ischemia that were not treated with anything, and they did fine. And that's even true when they have some patients, I don't know the right percentage, frankly, but some patients who have early neovascularization can persist for up to 20 years without progressive neovascularization, without development of retinal detachment. So I think you shouldn't extrapolate from ROP to incontinentia pigmentae and say just because ROP responds favorably to PRP, there's no reason to assume necessarily that you get the same favorable result with incontinentia pigmentae. It may be unnecessary, and it may actually lead to um, complications such as uh, dense scars, very dense scars with atrophy and secondary retinal detachment or pre-retinal proliferation. So I just don't know the proper course of action, but being conservative in nature, I prefer not to, not to treat IP babies or young children unless I see uh, a vitreous hemorrhage, uh, progressive tractional retinal detachment, that sort of thing. If, if it's just uh, peripheral ischemia, I'm content to follow them without intervention. If it's peripheral ischemia plus some early neovascularization, I'm content to follow them too, unless they get a, a coincident complication, such as a spontaneous vitreous hemorrhage or progressive retinal detachment. Great, thank you for sharing those pearls with us. You know, I, I feel the same way, always worried about the systemic side effects as well. And I think they were studying that in rainbow and uh, going ongoing uh, in the little babies with ROP. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, we'll move on now to our final, our last but not least uh, speaker. And our final speaker of the day is Dr. Felix Chow. Felix was one of our uh, fellows here at UIC. He is an associate professor of ophthalmology at UIC. And he previously, prior to going to medical school, was a biomedical engineer at Motorola, and then decided that he wanted to help people more directly than through engineering, went to medical school, did a fellowship at Duke, I'm sorry, did a residency at Duke, did a fellowship with us, and then we kept him on as faculty. So it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Felix, a good friend and colleague. I've asked him to speak on retinoblastoma and masquerades. And true to the life of a retina surgeon, he is on his way to another emergency in the operating room. So I don't think he'll, um, he'll be with us here today. Let me pull up his talk. I'm Felix Cho with the UIC Retina Service. This talk will discuss retinoblastoma and many of its masquerades. Case 1. This two-year-old male had leukocoria and pain in the right eye. Case 2. This two-year-old presented with leukocoria in the left eye. Case 3. This 15-month-old presented with eccentric gaze, strabismus, and leukocoria in the left eye. Case 4. This one-week-old white female had leukocoria and this lesion in the right eye. Later, she was found to have this lesion in the left eye. All of these cases were of retinoblastoma. Retinoblastoma occurs in 1 in 15,000 patients, and somatic cases are usually unilateral. Germline cases are often bilateral and may be trilateral with involvement of the pineal gland. Neuroimaging is needed to determine extent of disease, and ultrasonography will demonstrate masses of retinoblastoma 
often with posterior shadowing from calcium within the tumor. The international classification gauges the risk of globe salvager loss with systemic chemotherapy, and treatments include chemotherapy in various forms, laser, radiation, and enucleation. These patients need lifetime surveillance for risk of recurrence and secondary tumors in germline cases. The international classification of retinal blastoma ranges from groups A to E, with a very poor salvage rate of group EIs with systemic chemotherapy. Case 1 had extensive vitreous seeds in group E retinoblastoma with neovascular glaucoma and a posterior tumor. This group EI was nucleated but showed high risk features of invasion beyond the eye. The patient completed six rounds of systemic chemotherapy and has done well. Case 2 had these vitreous seeds of retinoblastoma just posterior to the lens. More diffuse vitreous seeds and hemorrhage obscured details posteriorly. This anterior tumor had irregular vasculature that disappeared within the tumor. Fluorescein angiography showed irregular and sporadic perfusion of the tumor. Ultrasound showed exudative detachment and half the eye filled with retinoblastoma. This group EI was enucleated and showed no high-risk features of invasion beyond the eye. No systemic chemotherapy was required. The patient has done well. In case 3, this patient's left eye had eccentric gazing and this leukocoria. This eye had group E retinoblastoma with a total exudative retinal detachment, subretinal seeds, and subretinal masses. Ultrasonography confirmed that about half the globe was filled with tumor and had calcium components with posterior shadowing. This eye was enucleated. This patient's right eye had group D retinoblastoma with a macular tumor and irregular vasculature. Peripheral tumors were also present with irregular vasculature. After six rounds of systemic chemotherapy and laser, the macular tumor demonstrated type 3 regression and the supranasal tumor also demonstrated type 3 regression. The infranasal tumor demonstrated type 4 regression as a flat scar. This patient with retinoblastoma group D in the right eye and group E in the left eye required six rounds of systemic chemotherapy and was found to have an RB mutation. He has currently no signs of recurrence of disease and has done well. Case 4 had group C retinoblastoma in the right eye with a macular tumor having vitreous seeds at its apex obscuring underlying vessels. The left eye later developed a group A retinoblastoma just inferior to the infratemporal vein. This patient was treated with six rounds of systemic chemotherapy and laser and had complete regression of her tumors in both eyes even at 10 years. With an RB mutation, she is also followed by the cancer survivor clinic. Case 5 is a 19-month-old African-American male with an exudative detachment in the right eye. Could this be another group E retinoblastoma? This exudative retinal detachment has a more yellow appearance to its subretinal exudates compared to the white seeds and tumors of retinoblastoma. While there is a subretinal mass, it has a more yellow appearance compared to the white of retinoblastoma, and the overlying vasculature is very distinct and clear. Ultrasonography shows the subretinal mass, but there is no hyperechoic calcium with posterior shadowing. There's also extensive subretinal exudative precipitates. Fluorescein angiography demonstrates distinctive telangiectatic vessels in some regions of non-perfusion along with hyperfluorescent aneurysms. Late frames demonstrated extensive vascular leakage. Unlike retinoblastoma, this patient was treated by external drainage and laser to the abnormal vasculature that was leaking. Case 6 shows the same disease in another uh, young African-American male, this time with a macular lesion with gliosis and subretinal exudation. Peripheral photos with scleral depression showed aneurysms and telangiectasia as well as exudation. Angiography showed aneurysms, telangiectasia, 
and areas of non-perfusion peripherally. Treatment was with laser ablation to the abnormal vasculature and areas of non-perfusion. These cases were of Coates disease. Coates is an exudative retinopathy with most cases presenting before age 10 years. It is usually unilateral and in males. The stages progress from telangiectasias only to telangiectasias with exudation, exudative detachment, and then eventually total retinal detachment, secondary glaucoma, and end-stage disease. In comparing Coates versus retinoblastoma, Coates disease often has a yellow pupil reflex and irregular lipoproteinaceous exudation for subretinal fluid with a more yellow appearance. The retinal blood vessels in Coates are also irregular in caliber with telangiectasia, aneurysms, and the vessels are often visible from the posterior pole to the periphery. In retinal blastoma, the pupil reflex is white to gray. The subretinal fluid may have distinct white masses of tumor, and the retinal blood vessels are more uniformly dilated, more tortuous, and may disappear into the tumor. The next case is a five-month-old Caucasian female with leukocoria in the right eye and a normal left eye. There was a retrolental white plaque present and prominent visible ciliary body. The diagnosis is persistent fetal vasculature. As Dr. Goldberg has taught us, this is a congenital non-hereditary malformation. It's usually unilateral with serious visual consequences, but no systemic findings. Bilateral disease points to a syndrome with more complex pathology. Anterior PFE is marked by a white vascularized fibrous membrane behind the lens, often with unilateral microphthalmus, shallow anterior chamber, long ciliary processes visible around the lens, and leukocoria at birth. These patients can develop glaucoma and cataract, which can also lead to secondary glaucoma. Of note, microphthalmus and cataract are rare in retinoblastoma. Posterior PFE involves a tractional retinal detachment that is tent-shaped or falciform and either peripheral or posterior. There also may be a hyaloid artery replaced with a thick fibrous stock. This should be distinguished from ROP fever and toxicara. In the combined form of PFE, there are both anterior and posterior forms. Here's a case of unilateral microphthalmia from persistent fetal vasculature in the left eye. Here's another example of a retrolental mass. This diagram of PFE shows the tent-shaped retinal detachment that may occur with an apex in vascular retina, an origin at the disc, and insertion toward the posterior lens. Here's a combined form of PFE with a tent-shaped retinal detachment from the nerve extending with a stalk to the posterior of the lens. These patients may need surgery to remove the lens as well as sever the stalk for maintenance of the eye. The next case involves a 14-year-old Latino male with blurred vision and this small white mass in the left eye. There were significant vitreous cells present in this eye. There was also evidence of vitreous traction to the white mass, which was thought to be a granuloma. The diagnosis of toxicoriasis was confirmed by ELISA. The patient was treated with laser, albendazole, and steroids and has done well. The next case is of a four-year-old African-American female with decreased vision in the right eye. She was full term with developmental delay and no history of trauma. There was vitreous hemorrhage and total retinal detachment. Could this also have been retinal blastoma? The left eye provided clues with attached retina but temporal dragging of the arcades. The peripheral retina was marked by avascular retina, vitreous hemorrhage, and a tear. Fluorescein of the right eye demonstrated significant peripheral non-perfusion and truncated termini of vessels with vascular leakage. The left eye demonstrated avascular peripheral retina with a neovascular infratemporal complex with bleeding. The differential quickly narrowed to FEVR or familial exudative vitreal retinopathy. The right eye was diagnosed with FEVR stage 5 with neovascularization, total retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, peripheral non perfusion, and vascular abnormalities at the vascular avascular border. 
The left eye was considered to have stage 2A with neovascularization without exudate, vitreous hemorrhage, and peripheral tears in avascular retina. The right eye was treated with scleral buccal, vitrectomy, lensectomy, laser, and oil, and the left eye was treated with peripheral laser. The right eye has managed to stay attached under oil, and the left eye has stayed attached with barrier laser. The next case involves a seven-year-old Latino female with decreased vision in the left eye with this mass of retinal tissue. Could this be retinoblastoma? In the periphery, however, was a skirt of retinal tissue and what seemed to be bare RPE. Instead of a white mass of retinoblastoma, there was crumpled white retinal tissue as well as bare RPE and a choroidal detachment peripherally. The right eye also had high myopia and peripheral lattice degeneration. Instead of retinoblastoma, this patient had a near total retinal detachment with giant retinal tear in the context of Stickler syndrome. This patient was treated by buccal vitrectomy, lensectomy, laser, and oil fill for the left eye with a maximum acuity achieved of 2070. The fellow eye was treated with barrier laser for lattice. The next case is a two-year-old Caucasian female with a history of microphthalmia in both eyes with loss of vision in the right eye since birth and with abnormal findings in the left eye. The microphthalmic right eye was found to have a chronic appearing retinal detachment with proliferative vitre retinopathy. The left eye had an iris coloboma pointing to the underlying diagnosis. On fundus exam, there were white lesions involving the retina, but these were not retinoblastoma. There was an optic nerve and an inferior chorioretinal coloboma in this left eye, and a retinal tear was seen within the interior of the inferior coloboma. Ultrasound confirmed the presence of the tear within the tissue covering the coloboma in the left eye. The next case is a one year old. The next case is a one year old Latino male with this retinal finding in the right eye. You can see the white lesion involving the infratemporal macula, but without vascularity. SDOCT through this lesion shows predominantly the inner retina involved. The patient had a hypopigmented macula on the skin or an ash leaf spot. The patient also had angiofibromas or adenoma sebaceum involving the lids. The diagnosis, of course, is astrocytic hamartoma in the context of tuberous sclerosis. For an extensive listing of pseudoretinoblastomas, Please see this article by the Shields Group. This presentation has highlighted many of the top masquerades of retinoblastoma in this article. Thanks for your attention, and many thanks to Jenny Lim and all those individuals in their links to UIC who have helped form this presentation and helped form me as a retina specialist. Thank you so much, Felix, for uh, that wonderful collection of rare cases. I'm sure Dr. Goldberg enjoyed seeing a lot of these diseases in which he has expertise on. Um, you know, I know that uh, Felix is in the operating room, so he unfortunately can't be here to field any questions. Um, but if anyone has any comments, I'll open it up. Dr. Lynn, I'd like to make a couple of observations. Please, uh, I'm Warren Hindle. Uh, can you hear me? Absolutely. Yes. All right. Then. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm probably one of the oldest guys around watching today. I'm in my uh, ninth decade. It sounds better if I just tell you I'm 85 years of age. I was one of Peter Kronfeld's last residents. I think, Dr. Goldberg, you succeeded, Dr. Kronfeld, did you not? Yes, there was an interim chairman for several years. Jay McDonald from Oak Park was uh, oh, yes. an interim part-time chairman at, right after yep. Dr. Kronfeld. Yes, Jay was there when I uh, started uh, my residency in 1965, 64, 65. Uh, th Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, uh, witness this uh, magnificent presentation. I've never been at one before. I was too old to travel uh, back to Chicago. <laughs> the, uh, 
in the previous 14 years. There's one observation I, I feel obliged to uh, bring to your attention, and I appreciate Dr. Uh, Goldberg's uh, reference to the use of uh, anti-VEGF medications in premature infants and the fact that we do not really know what the overall effect is to the developing vasculature and all of the other systems in the body. The other thing I'd like to bring to your attention also is that back in 1953, a Southern Illinois gentleman named Tadusz Shevchik produced a magnificent manuscript published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. He had spent considerable time from the time of the reporting of the disease RLF uh, in meticulous attention to detail and in meticulous cooperation with the staff in the nursery in East St. Louis, Illinois. Uh, his descriptions uh, were set aside by the uh, incrimination of oxygen. Right around the time he published his uh, major manuscript, uh, the incrimination of oxygen took place. And of course that resulted in the withholding of uh, oxygen from infants. Uh, so the first epidemic of RLF was stopped, but we ended up with losing a lot of babies that could be salvaged. And many of the survivors were severely compromised in one or more systems. So we ran into a recurrence of oxygen and a second e epidemic uh, with recurrence of uh, uh, ROP, RLF. There's been, in my opinion, a, second, a third epidemic taking place. And this has to do with the posterior disease. And I didn't realize, I didn't come across Shevchik's work until uh, 1995 or so. And I left practice in, in 2000. Uh, and recently I came across his papers and I was provoked by the fact that the disease ROPRLF is occurring in babies of immense birth weight in underdeveloped countries, in India, and, uh, South America, uh, Brazil, and so on. Uh, but there's been a concentration of attention to posterior disease and the plus disease. And all I can do is encourage all of you retina people of great interest to get to do Shevchik's 1953 manuscript and read. It's a difficult read. It's a long read. It's a very difficult read. But particularly, if you go through it and you're a student of ROP and RLF at all, you will begin to realize that the STOPROP study that was conducted in 1995 by uh, uh, Gainan and, uh, sorry, Again, uh, that the uh, the uh, actual work they were trying to duplicate was that of. So I, I I just encourage you very much to look at this because, in, in my humble opinion, uh, we're in we're in a third epidemic. And the reason we're in a third epidemic, it has very much to do with the interpretation of plus disease and that there is room for management and prevention of aggressive posterior disease. The secret may lie in all of the magnificent writing of Tadu Shevchi. I do thank you very, very much for this amazing exposition. It's it, uh, a great revelation. Thank, thank you so much, Dr. Hindle, for joining us today. It's really quite an honor to meet you. Uh, probably the oldest alum I've ever met from U of I and uh, to hear your pearls and words of wisdom. Thank you again so much. It's really been a treat to have you as well as all of our guest speakers and our guest of honor and our class speaker. I'd like now just to, uh, in closing, uh, share my last couple of slides here uh, to thank everybody who is involved in this meeting. I particularly want to thank Dr. Goldberg, Dr. Sternberg, Martin Paul, you guys are fantastic. Thank you so much for helping today. I've gotten lots of comments that you haven't seen. 
uh, really saying how much they've enjoyed the interaction uh, with the comments from Ward, with the comments from Paul and, and all of our guest faculty and our guest speakers. I couldn't have done it without you all, with our guest speakers and my own USYC faculty. Thank you all so much for sharing your knowledge with me yet again at this 14th annual Retina Symposium. I do hope that you'll join us again, uh, Dr. Goldberg. I'm, I'm not sure if we can go virtual next year, but maybe we should have a virtual component as Dr. Hindle mentioned, uh, because there are a lot of people who can't travel that might enjoy this meeting. Uh, I also wanna thank my team that helped make this meeting a reality. Stewart, Anita Horta, Lauren Kalinowski, and Lori Walker, thank you all so much. I want to thank all of you for joining us here today. I want to remind you that you should fill out your CME evaluation so you can get your CME. And I want to invite you to join us again next year, hopefully in person uh, at the Eye and Ear Infirmary. So again, thank you uh, so much. It's been a treat to see you all today. And I hope we all see each other again in the near future. I wish you stay well. I wish you good health, happiness, and it's a big hug for me to all of you. And, and thanks, for, uh, thanks for staying and joining us. Thank you all so much. Take care.